Progress. This meeting is being recorded. Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Morning. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Good Mr. morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a peppy Tuesday. All right. All right. Uh, Good morning. The City of Boston Zoning Board of Appeal hearing for July 25th, 2023 is now in session. This hearing is being conducted in accordance with the applicable provisions of the open meeting law, including the updated provisions enacted by the legislature last year. The new law allows the board to continue its practice of holding virtual hearings until March 2025. This hearing of the board is being held remotely via the Zoom webinar event platform. The hearing is also being live streamed. In order to ensure this hearing of the board is open to the public, members of the public may access this hearing through telephone and video conferencing. The information for connecting to this hearing is listed on today's hearing agenda, which is posted on the public notices page of the city's website, boston.gov. Members of the public will enter the virtual hearing as attendees, which means you will not see yourself on the screen and you will be muted throughout unless administratively unmuted when asked to comment. Board members, applicants, and their attorneys or representatives will participate in this in the hearing as panelists, and they will appear alongside the presentation materials when speaking. Panelists are strongly encouraged to keep video on while presenting to the board. As with our in-person meetings, comments and support will be followed by comments and opposition. The order of comments is as follows. Elected officials, representatives of elected officials, and members of the public. The chair may limit the number of people called upon to offer a comment and the time for commenting as time constraints require. For that reason, the board prefers to hear from members of the public who are most impacted by a project, that is those individuals who live closest to the project. If you wish to comment on an appeal, please click the raise hand button along the bottom of your screen in the Zoom webinar platform. Click it again and your hand should go down. When the host sees your hand, you will receive a request to unmute yourself. Select yes, and you should be able to talk. If you are connected to the hearing by telephone, please press star nine to raise and lower your hand. You must press star six to unmute yourself after you receive the request from the host. Those called upon to comment will be asked to state their name, address, uh, name and address first, and then can provide their comment. In the interest of time and to ensure that you have enough time to do so, please raise your hand as soon as Mr. Stembridge reads the address into the record. Do not raise your hand before the relevant address is called upon or the meeting host will not know to call on you at the appropriate time. These instructions will be repeated throughout the hearing. All right. Mr. Stembridge. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Ms. Better Barraza. Good morning, Madam Chair. Present. Good morning, Mr. Shepard. Good morning, Madam Chair, present. Good morning, Mr. Valencia. Good morning, Madam Chair, present. Good morning, Ms. Panado. Good morning, Madam Chair, present. Good morning, Mr. Collins. Good morning, Madam Chair, present. Good morning, and before I turn it over to Mr. Stembridge, just as a, uh, a reminder, we have a, we have a, a lot uh, on the agenda today, and I'm gonna ask both presenters and commenters commenter to be brief uh, so that we can uh, keep the meeting flowing. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Stembridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. First on the agenda, we have the extensions for 9.30 a.m. First is case BOA 8264. With the address of 1199 to 1203 Blue Hill Avenue. The relief was originally granted on August 28, 2018. This is the fourth, extent, fourth request for an extension, with the extension to expire, scheduled to expire on August 18, 2024. Is the applicant and or their representative present? There is a raised hand. Um, one sec. Can you raise your hand again? You're, oh, Murray. All oh, right. Go ahead. Just send a request to unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. My name is Murray Glazer, 28 Liberty Pole Road, Hingham, Mass. Uh, Glacon Contracting. I represent the owner, Mr. George Minasides. Um, in, in anticipation of a start uh, for the project, we discovered some asbestos and possibly other uh, hazardous material. We're in the process of uh, 
of um, doing an environmental study, and as soon as we complete, we uh, we uh, plan on uh, starting the project, and we're asking for for an extension for a full year. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? We have a lot on the agenda today. May I have a motion? A motion to extend to a year from today, the day today. Uh, so, the date to the extension would go until August 18th of next year. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stembridge? Yeah. Ms. Better Braza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Mr. Canado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA 117-6005 with the address of 1717 to 1719 Hyde Park Avenue. Relief was originally granted on August 18th of 2021. This is the first request for an extension with the extension to, to, to expire on August will go to August 18, 2024. Is the, is the applicant and or the representative present? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is David Lenhart, Coulson and Stores, 400 Atlantic Ave uh, in Boston. And I'm here on behalf of Ed Melniora, the proponent for this project. It's uh, a multifamily redevelopment ground floor retail, off street parking. Uh, we, we're going through additional Article 80 process, additional large project review process that relates to the, the multifamily being delivered uh, all as rentals instead of a mix of rental and home ownership. And, uh, and there are additional affordable units as well. And so as part of that process running its course, uh, we're asking for a, a one year extension. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Motion to Go for it. Thank you. Motion to approve uh, until August 18, 2024. Second. Thank you, Mr. Stepford. Yes. Ms. Betabaraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Ms. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Valencia, sorry. Ms. Venado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair, the votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move on to the board final arbiters here. Scheduled for 9 30. Uh, we have five companion cases. First is case BOA 606484, the address of 64 to 64C Allendale Street. Next, with that, we have case BOA 606486. The address being 66 to 66 C Allendale Street. With that, we have case BOA 606 487. The address being 68 to 68 E Allendale Street. Along with that, we have case BOA 606 488 with the address of 70 to 70 D Allendale Street. And the last one on that list is case BOA 606489 with the address of 72 to 72 B Allendale Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? This slide? Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark Lacasse, Lacasse Law, 75 Arlington Street in Boston, attorney for the uh, project proponent represented by Jacqueline Nunez of the Wonder Group, and also with us in the event there are questions for the architect, Beth Whitaker of Merge Architects. Uh, members of the board, this is a project concerning a two acre parcel of land, 87,000 square feet on Allendale Street in West Roxbury across from the Faulkner Hospital, originally approved by this board in December of 2016 and entered at ISD in March of 2017. 
And that was all following a very extensive Article 80 approval process of the BPDA, wherein the BPDA board twice approved this project throughout 2016, first as a 20-unit project and later as an 18-unit project, with a recommendation to this board that the zoning relief be approved, which, of course, this board did um, in 2017. Um, following the board's approval in 2017, there were two separate abutter appeals that were filed in the Superior Court. One was filed by Springhouse Senior Living, which is a direct abutter next door, and another was filed by a group of plaintiffs uh, known as the Tremblay Group, not direct abutters, but within the 300-foot uh, radius. The Springhouse Senior Living case was settled by agreement with the parties. Um, to reduce the scale of this project to three buildings and 16 units from what had been previously approved. The other case, the Tremblay case, brought by the abutters was heard and decided by the Massachusetts Superior Court, Judge Rosemary Conway, who issued a 25-page memorandum of decision in June of 2019, so two years after the appeal had been filed. Um, and Judge Conway conclusively determined that the plaintiffs lacked standing to challenge the zoning relief. In just one sentence from Judge Conley's memorandum, uh, the Wonder Group argues that plaintiffs lack standing because they have not alleged or submitted evidence of any actual or cognizable harms from the project. The court agrees. Uh, that decision was entered in the Superior Court in 2019, June of 2019. Uh, the plaintiff abutters then appealed that decision to the Massachusetts Appeals Court and that case remained pending for two years, largely as a result of the court-related closures during the COVID pandemic. Um, but in July of 2021, on the very day that the plaintiffs were required to file an appellate brief in the appeals court, they voluntarily dismissed their appeal, and the appeals court entered a dismissal uh, with prejudice on the docket and notified the Superior Court that the case had been dismissed with prejudice. So the Superior Court case was then uh, entered on the docket as final, and Judge Rosemary Connolly's 25-page decision, finding that the plaintiffs lacked standing, uh, became the law of this case. Following all that, we then went back to the BPDA and filed the Notice of Project Change, reflecting the reduced in-scale project that is consistent with the settlement with the Spring House uh, Senior Living Center, and that is 16 units in three buildings, which does not require any further zoning relief than had already been granted by this board. The Notice of Project Change was approved by the BPDA in August of 2021, and the BPDA made two findings in its uh, August of 2021 decision. It found that the proposed project is not anticipated to require any further zoning relief than that which was already granted by the ZBA in March of 2017. Should the proposed project receive approval by the BPDA board, which it did, the proponent intends to appear before the ZBA board, final arbiter, to affirm the zoning record and decision for the proposed project as reflected through the second notice of project change. The BPDA board also found that the director should issue a determination pursuant to Article 80 waiving the requirement of any further review as the notice of project change does not significantly increase the impact of the proposed project. So those were the votes taken by the BPDA board in August of 2021, again approving the smaller in scale project. Uh, BPDA design review was required both by this board's decision and by the notice of project change. So after that approval, we then engaged in an extensive uh, BPDA design review process with uh, Beth Whitaker and Michael Canizzo and his team at the BPDA, resulting in a BPDA design approval in August of 2022. Um, interestingly, uh, this board should know that the abutters also filed a Superior Court appeal of the Notice of Project Change approval to the Superior Court, and that case resulted in a dismissal of the plaintiff's claim in January 6th of 2023, most recently. So the plaintiffs have had you know, their case heard by the Superior Court twice, and on both occasions, the Superior Court has dismissed their claims. Uh, this board final arbiter was submitted to the plans examiner at ISD, 
who has determined that it is appropriate for board final arbiter and that no further zoning issues or relief are implicated by the BPDA design review plans. So in sum, what we're seeking today is simply confirmation that the prior zoning relief, which was recently extended by this board to July of 2024, as applied to the reduced in scale project of 16 units in three buildings, as shown on the BPDA design review plans, are affirmed and confirmed as part of the prior record. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Um, I do have a question, Mark. Uh, when you reduce the size, uh, was it just basically eliminating um, from the existing proposed building location? Yes. So you went from five to three, you just basically eliminated two, but the location remained? Um, the, the buildings were actually pulled even further away from the Springhouse uh, Senior Living Center, so increasing the setbacks is, is what was part of the reduction as well. But yes, redu uh, eliminating two buildings and then pulling the buildings further away from the Springhouse property boundary. But the massing and the plans did not change? That's right. Okay, great. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. A follow up. Uh, yes. When, Mark, when you reduce the size of the project, did you also reduce the number of parking spots? And how many parking units do you have at this moment? Um, Beth, what's the, what's the final count on parking spaces? Parking spaces. Uh, sorry, I have to look that one fact up. <laughs> Give me one moment. I believe yeah. it, let's say it's 27. Is Mr. Nunez with your team? Uh, Jacqueline Nunez. Yes. Sorry, she looks like she may want to answer. Oh, Jacqueline, go ahead. You can unmute and turn your camera on. Okay, hi there. Yes, we have 28 parking spots. 28, okay. Yes. And, and is that the same as before or? No, we had 41 in the uh, original approval. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Do we have anybody from the BPDA on? Just it seems like there's been a lot of oversight already. So, Mr. Hampton, are you with us? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Yeah, I can confirm to what uh, Mr. Lacas has testified to today. I mean, I really don't have anything more to add to it. Uh, it's been a pretty lengthy process, to say the least. Hearing no other, are there any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? A motion to approve. Take Thank, you. Thank you. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Bedebarraza? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Bonato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes, motion carries. Good luck. Thank, Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the final board, final office case. Case BOA 1365467 with the address of 100 Allstate Road. Is the applicant and or the representative present? Sorry, before you start, uh, the chair will recuse herself and Ms. Beta Barraza will step in. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, just in the comments, uh, Attorney Joe Hanley is looking to get updated to a panelist for this case. Madam Chair, um, apologize for the uh, technical difficulty. Thank you for elevating me. Um, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Quilty Miller, Miller, 28 State Street in Boston. I'm here with uh, Adam Sarva, who just introduced himself, who is the uh, proponent, uh, owner, developer on this case. Um, may I offer some background on this request, Madam Chair? Yes, but it, okay. please keep it brief. <laughs> of course. 
Um, so we had submitted uh, correspondence to you. Uh, the long and short of this is this is a uh, mixed use uh, development, a brand new five story building in a rectangular shaped lot in Dorchester that was approved by uh, this board at its hearing on January 10th earlier this year. Um, there was a decision that was issued by the board, a written decision in March, and that is attached as a, Exhibit A and has some highlighted sections to get to the point here. Um, so the basis of the approval of the zoning board uh, was to be able to utilize an existing curb cut off all state road as part of the site plan and the zoning that was approved. And you'll see that highlighted in pages three and four of the zoning decision. Um, the project also will seal a curb cut on the uh, narrow and um, somewhat kind of uh, challenged uh, Willow Court. And so since the approval, we had uh, a proviso for BPDA design review. Um, Exhibit B has the recommendation of the BPDA, which is pretty general. It doesn't speak to the curb cut or anything. Uh, the decision has the you know, generic BPDA design review approval. Uh, we have since worked with the urban design staff at the BPDA, uh, who has indicated an, an unwillingness to approve the uh, access on the curb cut from Allstate Road and sent an email, which you'll see in Exhibit C on June 8th, directing us to return to the ZBA for interpretation. Um, so we're sort of a little bit at an impasse here. I would say that it is uh, fairly clear if you look at um, the decision itself, and I'll just call out um, page four, project will also utilize the existing curb cut on Allstate Road for garage and vehicular parking access while closing the existing curb cut along the narrow or less trafficked Willow Court. This curb cut removal will improve pedestrian experience and connectivity to the rest of the block by removing an unsafe and dangerous condition while also upgrading and improving the sidewalk treatment along Willow Court. I will say it's part of the governing decision, uh, but it's also was also a critical part of the community outreach process uh, with McCormick Civic and uh, the abutters. So we are merely asking this board to uh, enforce the language of its decision and allow us to proceed with this uh, development as approved in writing. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Thank you. Mr. Collins, have you had an opportunity to review um, the requests and the plans? Yeah, I have. Just to clarify, Mr. Hanley, so the, yes, sir. Curb, the curb cut on Allstate Road is existing, right? Correct. Yeah, and that, and uh, Mr. Collins, that you look at the plans, that also provides direct access to the parking garage for the development, which has 10 parking spaces. Correct. So it's an existing curb cut. So yeah. what's there right now? Uh, it's a distressed land with an existing curb cut into uh, you know, property. Adam, maybe you can provide a little more color here. It's a, um, a dilapidated two-family with the curb cut both on Allstate Road and on Willow Court. So there's already two cars. If it's a two-family, there's already at least two cars coming in and out of that curb cut. So you're adding roughly eight cars are going to be coming in and out of there? Yep. Yep. And that was, again, part of the um, detailed plans approved by the board, but also in the decision itself. I'll also mention because it's rectangular in shape, if we were to go back uh, against the narrative and the decision and utilize the Willow Court um, curb cut and not seal it as was preferred, that would create additional zoning issues. It would force us uh, to go back for likely for a variance for de design maneuverability because of the lack of circulation space uh, by virtue of the shape of the site. And again, if you know this this particular neighborhood right in back, section of the neighborhood right in back of South Bay, uh, Willow Court is you know narrow, tight knit. Um, there are no vehicles that come in and out of that curb cut today. And, and that was something that was critical and that's why it was included in the board's decision. All right, thank, thank you. Ms. Barraza, I'm good. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the board? Hearing none, can I hear a motion? Uh, I'll motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yeah. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. 
Mr. Ms. Pinado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. And I vote yes, the motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you. Next on the agenda, 9.30, for 9.30, we have case DOA, uh, we have the call of the chair. That's in reference to case BOA 1432589, the address of 33, 3, 336 Pond Street. Before we move on, I'll ask if the chair um, would like to speak to them. Uh, yes, at this time, the board will hear a call of the chair. The board received an appeal for interpretation on zoning refusal a uh, letter issued on this case that uh, Mr. Stembridge just read into the record. A hearing was held on June 6, 2023, where the board heard the applicant's arguments. The purpose of the call of the chair is for the board to make its final decision on the appeal. Has everyone had a chance to review the materials that you received? And are there any questions from the board? No questions for me. Manager. No questions. Okay, hearing no questions. Well, sorry, uh, Javier, should I put a motion it? forward from here? Yeah, thank you. Yes, may I have a motion? Sure, um, I agree with the appellant's position that ISD incorrectly cited the front yard setback violation, and therefore ISD zoning refusal, refusal should be annulled. I would like to put forth a motion that ISD zoning refusal citing Article 55, Section 41.1 conformity with existing building alignment should be annulled and the ISC issues. The building permit provided that the application meets all other building codes and zoning code requirements. May I have a second? Second. second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Betterbraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. The chair also voted yeah, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move on to the hearing schedule for 9.30 a.m. First, we have case BOA. Uh, sorry, do you want to check for any deferrals or withdrawals? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at this time, since we've entered uh, the 9.30 time frame, um, are there any requests for withdrawal or deferrals for cases from the time of the uh, Yes, please, Mr. Sembridge. Five, Swift Terrace. Halfway through. Page four. Five. Thank you, folks. Uh, that is in reference to case BOA. 1435105, the address being 5 Swift Terrace. Is the, um, the applicant and or their, would the applicant and or their representative like to explain? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark Lacasse, Lacasse Law, 75 Arlington Street in Boston, attorney for the applicant. Um, this project has undergone some uh, significant changes as a result of the community review process and revised plans were submitted to ISD for uh, review and an updated refusal letter, but it is my understanding that that has not yet occurred, so we are requesting a deferral to enable ISD to complete the review of the revised plans. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, may I, may I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, if a uh, deferral date was to, to advertise and to provide notice would be September 12th. Mr. Lucas? Uh That sounds reasonable. Thank you. Uh, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to defer to uh, December 12th, 2023. Second. I think it was September. September. September? Okay, sorry. Yeah, not December. <laughs> Okay. Motion to defer to September 12, 2023. So, Cass would not be happy about December. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stembridge? Yeah, that's correct. Ms. Betterbraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. 
Thank you so much. See you then. If there are no more deferrals or requests from this time frame, then we will go to case BOA 147-8134, the address of 361 Belgrade Avenue. This is an article of BPDA Article 80 process. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes, good morning, Ms. Secretary, Madam Chair, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Good morning. Just, Miller. Just a reminder, brevity is our friend. We yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Madam Ambassador, I believe, is uploading the presentation, which I will take you through the beginning of. But first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the development team. I introduced you to myself. Jake Upton is with us from Upton and Partners. He is the developer uh, of the site under a 99-year uh, land lease. Also with me is Ben Thomas from Aero Street Architects. Uh, as the um, Secretary indicated, this is an Article 80 large um, project that was approved uh, by the BPBA board uh, earlier this year and we has been a long time coming coming to this board uh, this particular site um, was before the board in 2019 uh, for what was then proposed to be the new Roxbury Prep High School uh, which was subsequently withdrawn and uh, now we are here with much needed housing at the foot of a train station. Next slide, please. So uh, just to bring you bird's eye into the site a little further out here, uh, 361 Belgrade Ave, you'll see uh, in the arrow indicator, uh, again, right next to the MBTA's Bellevue Hill, uh, I'm sorry, Bellevue Commuter Rail Station, um, it is in the Roslindale neighborhood uh, towards uh, the intersection of West Roxbury. Next slide. Just to bring you a little closer up to the site itself, uh, you'll see uh, in the upper left, see Holy Name Rotary. And uh, as you head up uh, Bellevue, um, you go into uh, the beginning of Roslindale. It's a little over an acre, the property, which you'll see there. Um, 43,014 square feet surrounded, which is important for the zoning, surrounded on all sides by public ways or railroad infrastructure. So no direct uh, abutters uh, that are attached that aren't separated by a public way or infrastructure. Um, to the right, you'll see the existing conditions uh, for it is a non-conforming industrial structure in use in a residential and neighborhood shopping zone uh, has been utilized as a clay auto, auto uh, body, auto mechanic and uh, sales, as well as a NTB tire warehouse. Uh, and you'll see the change in grade as you go up the hill. Uh, to the lower right uh, is a view down Anna One Ave, which is one of the public ways that abuts us and leads directly to the commuter rail station. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of the project, which you'll see in the presentation, uh, again, the site, a little over an acre uh, floor area, which is being proposed is approximately 125, 636 gross square feet on a very large site. FAR uh, combined is 2.9. Uh, and we are proposing 124 new residential units of rental housing with 21 IDP units, which amounts to 17% in excess of the city's requirements at a location that has some of the uh, lowest availability of affordable housing in the city. Um, we at the mix of units, mostly twos and one bedrooms with a small portion of studios. We have 170 bike parking spaces and 83 residential parking spaces. Quickly to, um, this is a transformative development that is investing over $8 million in uh, surrounding infrastructure, widened sidewalks, pedestrian access, and new open space uh, in place of what was a surface lot at the top of uh, the West Roxbury uh, Parkway, in addition to the affordable housing uh, in excess of the city's requirements. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide in support of the zoning and uh, a unique property site 
uh, with conditions that result in a hardship. There are two contiguous parcels uh, together here and um, in two zoning districts, the overwhelming majority in the neighborhood shopping, which allows our multifamily residential and a small section in the 2F5000, which used to be a parking lot. Um, no vestige of residential uses in the site itself. Rectangular in shape, and there's a change in grade that goes up Bellevue Hill from about 18 to 23 feet. Um, and again, abutted on all sides by public ways and railroad infrastructure, and further limited by, uh, which you'll see in the next slide, a no build area of approximately uh, 1,473 uh, square feet. And we are 250 feet from the subway station. Next slide shows you, Madam Chair, how the zoning breaks down into two different zones. Again, 83% of the land areas in the neighborhood shopping. We require relief with the FAR, which is approximately three. Uh, we require relief for the height, um, which allows for 35 feet, three stories. That height is mitigated by uh, the surrounding public streets, but also the setbacks and the sections in the vast open space, as well as utilizing uh, the upgrade to bury the structure uh, into the hill, including underground parking. Um, we also need relief for the setbacks, which again is mitigated by its surrounding public ways. Uh, and uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, the small percentage of the site you'll see in the orange um, hash or purple hash in the upper left, um, that shows you the small portion of land which um, was conveyed from DCR many, many years ago uh, and has a restriction that it be maintained for open space or parking. Uh, we think open space is, is more desirable. Um, the project uh, puts the underground parking space underneath that. So we do need relief uh, in, in the 2F5000 uh, for the setbacks, but there is no structure. It's all subterranean. Uh, so it is mitigated by the fact that it's all underground and up top we are investing and in creating a vast um, public, uh, you know, open space, green space, uh, which was part of, final thing I will note, we are in the Greenbelt Protection Overlay District. And so we spent an extensive amount of processing with the BPDA uh, Mass dot, uh, I'm sorry, DCR uh, and the like. And this is a project that also went through the BCDC review for extensive landscape and design uh, input. And so with that, I'd like to hand it off to Ben Thomas to take you through the design presentation. Ben? You there, Ben? I'm here. Thanks, oh. Joe. Uh, you can go uh, just the refusal later um, yeah, for records. Is provided. Walk us through it quickly, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, we had three main drivers for this project. Uh, the first uh, was the integration of green infrastructure, really as a tool for scaling the overall massing, uh, enhancing the street presence along Belgrade, and acting as a buffer between access points on site. As Joe mentioned, the site is bordered on three sides by public streets uh, and currently houses a pretty inhospitable link wall uh, with little to no tree canopy. Uh, so for us along Belgrade and Anawan, it was uh, pretty important to use the Boston Complete Street guidelines to enhance the neighborhood really beyond our footprint. Uh, the widened sidewalk, new furnishing zone, uh, in conjunction with the renovated intersection uh, really helps to define the public way um, from the commuter station down Belgrade um, and toward the West Roxbury Parkway. Um, it also provides us an opportunity to safely locate community assets uh, like the Blue Bike Station which is labeled as number eight on the drawing you see. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide, please. Uh, at the west end of the site, as Joe mentioned, we are proposing a robust uh, green space of over 7,000 square feet. Uh, this area is fully in the 2F5000 zoning dis district and uh, provides approximately 50 feet uh, from the edge of pavement to the building footprint uh, where there's a setback. Uh, the planting plan includes upgrades to the existing greenway, uh, which we feel will really help the overall beautification of the parkway uh, and the intersection. Um, additionally, the green design uh, removes an great existing parking lot uh, that is currently accessed from Belgrade uh, near the busy intersection. Next slide, please. 
uh, you can see in this section how bringing the parking below grade uh, really allows us to uh, free up such a large amount of space, uh, which is uh, fairly uncommon in an urban environment. Um, and this also speaks to the second driver for the project, which, uh, which is really negotiating the significant slope across the site. Next slide, please. Uh, so here at this elevation down Belgrade, uh, really highlights a few of the strategies we used to scale the project uh, along the sloping grade. Uh, one was setting the majority of the building massing to the rear of the site, uh, which is beyond the minimum front yard setback, uh, and provides an opportunity for us to have a dynamic street wall, uh, which is more in line with the street conformity approach along Belgrade. Uh, we've also set the top floor back at all faces, uh, and significantly along the east side, um, of the site where we transition into the neighborhood, and that's located on the right side of this image here. Um, lastly, we've, uh, we've used the sloping grade uh, as an opportunity to provide additional commercial space. Uh, on the lower right-hand side of uh, the image, you can see that with the slope falling away, we're able to provide uh, a quarter anchor for the community. Um, <clears throat> this is at the low end of the site and really emphasizes the public nature of the renovated intersection uh, that we described earlier. Next slide, please. And this really brings us to the third driver for the project, uh, which is activating the street edge. Uh, so in, in accommodating the slope through program placement, massing setbacks, and access, uh, we're really able to provide a, a varied set of experiences along the length of Belgrade. Uh, this slide shows how uh, the depth of the street wall interface uh, really allows us to bring access to the middle of the site for a lobby entry. Uh, give green buffers and setbacks at elevated spaces like our, what we're considering our front porch, um, and continue this uh, datum of uh, one to uh, one and a half story expression along the street uh, down to the commercial corner. Next slide, please. So this view here uh, is really across Belgrade. Um, really shows how those strategies uh, may be experienced across the renovated intersection. Uh, the low brick expression abuts the public realm while the massing setbacks breaks the roof lines and scales the overall expression of the project. Next slide. Now in this view here, you can see how the commercial corner uh, is held with a single story, single story expression of brick. Um, to the left is the expanded sidewalk and furniture zone against Belgrade. And you can see the blue bike station is safely located against pedestrian traffic. Next slide. Uh, here we are to the west end of the site. We can see the new green space against the parkway uh, and how the intersection now has relief from the parking lot uh, and access that is currently there. Uh, this view also shows how the short end expression of the massing is brought forward to Belgrade and provides scale against that 50 foot setback toward West Roxbury Parkway uh, while breaking up the overall read of the massing. Next slide. And so ultimately for us, you know, we feel this project has been an, an ongoing, as Joe mentioned, uh, ongoing collaboration with the city, subcommittees, and neighborhood. And we really feel that we've been able to design a project that's dynamic, scaled, and directly contributes to the community beyond its footprint. Um, so with that, um, that takes our time. And I just want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this and uh, look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No question, uh, not a yeah. question, uh, but uh, if Mr. Miko bought the transportation is available, it makes a problem. If not, then... Uh, oh, I see. Do you have a question, Mrs. Hembridge, or a comment? No, a comment. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Miko suggested that with this project, they add two handicap parking spaces, or total six spaces, and install six electric charging stations. And that, that's the problem. Okay. Uh, I know you have a question, Ms. Bedraza. Well, I was going to ask, I was gonna ask uh, the developer or the architect if, if they see that as feasible. That would mean replacing two spaces for a handicap and then to install six charging stations. Is that it, your building is all electric, so it seems like it would add to the value of the project. 
Yeah, uh, Attorney Joe Hanley, this is, you know, Article 80 large project will still have ongoing review. We're happy to accommodate that and to continue to work through uh, the Article 80 process for certification, you know, through the transportation planners as well. Well, I, can I also just point out that uh, we already are committed to have um, all of the underground parking spaces are be able to be expandable to uh, electric and 25% of our spaces are uh, committed already to that. And we already have, um, we believe adequate handicap parking in our garage, but perhaps uh, Ben, you could walk them through the garage plan to, uh, to inform that. I mean, I don't think we, we have the, we have the project in front of us. I think we've kind of have reviewed already the plans, but I have a question in terms of the commercial space. <clears throat> I believe there's a commercial um, space available down the street and I keep seeing signs along there and I'm wondering, um, is there a market for the commercial space that you're proposing? Uh, yes, we have a, a letter of intent sign um, that is uh, still has to go under contract, so we're not, you know, ready to reveal who it is. But um, we have one group that is a local group that is looking to expand and upgrade their facilities to this location. Okay, great. Thanks. No further question. Uh, through the chair, uh, if this project was to be approved, uh, do we have a timetable on the construction and also? Have you uh, selected a general contractor for the project? Uh, we have not um, selected a general contractor. Uh, we would anticipate this going into uh, full design um, with construction uh, to begin in about a year. We've, we've uh, the developer's been working with uh, JMA on uh, pre-con services, but you know, once we get to the point, uh, should we have the opportunity to be approved here, you know, we'll be uh, e expanding uh, the search. So I just, uh, I see the uh, project manager's hand is raised from BPDA, if you want to chime in briefly. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and good morning, members of the board. My name is Quinn Valsich. I'm a senior project manager at the BPDA. Uh, this project was filed with the BPDA on September 9th, 2022, and successfully completed the Article 80 review process. This process included a BPDA sponsored public meeting, an IAG meeting, and a joint IAG and public meeting. The project was approved by the board on March 16th, 2023, and received mixed support from neighbors, IAG members, and a letter of support from District Councilor uh, Arroyo during the comment period. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. So I, uh, I appreciate to see that 21 of the units are affordable, and that is 70% of the total number of units. Now, what I see is that most of the income, um, area medium income is from 70% to 100%. So my question is, is this feasible for you to ensure that at least one or two more of the units are affordable for AMIs below 50%? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Valencia. Actually, we do have, the range is 50% of AMI. Um, we have, let me see, one. I see, I see one. Yeah, we have one at 50, we have one at 60. Um, one of the things we also have, um, you know, it, admittedly, uh, we have some two bedrooms that are at 100%, which we think is really important for uh, workforce housing. This is something that we worked really carefully uh, with uh, the IDP Mayor's Office of Housing uh, we are pleased that we're able to provide, you know, 21 units. As you may or may not know, uh, West Roxbury has some of the lowest amount of available inventory of affordable housing in anywhere in the city. We're in Roslindale, but of course you cannot restrict people by neighborhood. Um, so the opportunities here, I think, are pretty pretty special. We also have um, a good amount of of the 21 six. Um, our two bedrooms, which range, if you look at the income restricted units, uh, from about 950 square feet to upwards to 1200 square feet, which uh, we would suggest helps to address the need for family sized housing for fair affordability, uh, especially in the workforce. If I can also just mention that um, we've also committed to um, the new environmental standards uh, set by the city of passive house. We're actually exceeding those 
Um, so this is passive house, um, you know, with with uh, almost zero carbon footprint um, and sustainable best practices being implemented. Um, and so we are really um, kind of enthusiastically engaging in the mayor's uh, mission to provide um, highest standard of affordable housing qualitatively um, too. Thank you. Final question. Since this is a transit oriented development project, uh, do you are you planning to give residents or at least the IDP residents uh, T passes for them to take all the buses or the community rail? Yes, we, we've committed to giving um, T passes to all of our residents um, for the first year that they are. Uh, um, uh, located here uh, to make sure that they understand and, and use and try um, the vast uh, mass transportation. We've also committed to adding um, bus stop locations. There's uh, four buses, bus lines that converge at the site and we are working with uh, DOT, um, the Boston traffic um, and uh, the MBTA on uh, the final uh, locations of those. Um, but we're also, in, um, as a long side of that, um, expanding and, and working on um, some of the lighting and um, access issues to improve that for um, for all the residents. Uh, yeah, the Mr. Valencia, just a just note, you know, I mean, it, we're not just relying on the fact that we are, you know, 250 feet from a train station. Um, as you, you probably saw in some of the comment letters, you know, this concerns about uh, inadequate sidewalks and passage today. So this, this development is making, I think I indicated almost, you know, over $8 million in infrastructure improvements, uh, contributions to the MBTA access improvements, complete streets, sidewalks, uh, improvements to the West Roxbury Parkway and then intermodal transportation. Uh, all as part of the Article 80 process. So we're really proud that, you know, it, it checks all the bosses for the city's policy with respect to modern transit oriented housing. This is all rental, correct? Correct. So 130, 120. Um, Four. 124 are being rented. I know 21 are IDP. Yep. What's going to be the average rent? For the market rate? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it obviously would be determined by where the market is right now, but Jake, you know, do you have a range that you can provide? Um, you know, I think that this is going to be similar to the average rents that are in Forest Hills um, area, uh, but I think the range is between 1700 and 3200 depending on the size and orientation uh, and location of the units for the market rate units. Hey, just to put that in perspective, uh, you know, two bedroom unit at 70% of AMI would be around less than $1,700 a month. Um, and of course we have six of those two bedrooms. So, you know, that's a, that's a major opportunity, especially for working families. All right, may I, I'm going to intervene and ask that we open it up to public testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is Diana Bronchon from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, we defer judgment to the board. This project has completed the community process via the BPDA with the most recent community meeting in February. There was a neighborhood association in the area focused on this project during the first proposal that I have not been in contact with. We have received multiple letters of opposition and a few in support. Thank you. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Keon Stapleton from Councillor Murphy's office. Um, the applicant completed a thorough community process with support from direct abutters and neighbors. Um, the councillor sent over a letter of support, but she would also like to go on record in support. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan from City Council at large, Michael Flaherty. Um, the councillor did not support a school at this location um, because he had recognized the value of a transit oriented project. Um, there are, uh, there, he does acknowledge that there are neighbors uh, who wish that uh, this project was a little less dense. He understands their concern. He would urge the development team to continue working with the neighbors throughout the construction and address any and all concerns that arise. Um, he does, would like, he would like to go on record in support um, due to the, the fact that this, this is transit oriented um, housing uh, that is much needed in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. This is Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. Hopefully you can hear me clearly on this. Uh, it's not often that I'm personally before you in support of a project, but that is 
the importance of, to me of this project. This is a distressed industrial site that has been an indu uh, distressed industrial site for much of my life uh, here in the city, uh, growing up on the southwest side here in High Park near Rosendale. Uh, this project is entirely appropriate to the size and scale of that space, but also brings much needed affordable housing, does deal with many of the pedestrian issues there. It was noted earlier in a question that there's a commercial space or commercial spaces really uh, on Belgrade Ave that could use the density that this is bringing. Uh, this is a perfectly transit oriented space in terms of being 250 feet away from a train station, but also having several buses run through there. And I would also just note uh, that it is much appreciated that they are taking that space that abuts the West Roxbury Parkway and making that green space, uh, which is really uh, in line with the rest of what it looks like on West Roxbury Parkway, where most of what abuts West Roxbury Parkway is green space, but also enhances natural green space for, for the community in a way that can be enjoyed by all. Uh, and so this project has my full support. I supported the high school. Uh, that did not move forward, but I think that uh, where we are now with this project, this is worthy of our full support. Uh, and that's why I'm here personally to make sure to share that with you, uh, that that's how my office feels about that and how my office has moved in this project. So thank you uh, for hearing me out. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time and for your service. Thank you. Are there raised hands? Ms. Madam Ambassador. Madam Ambassador, are there other raised hands? We cannot hear you, Jessica. Hi there, can anybody hear me? Who, who is this? Hello, this is Jenny Gass from the Bellevue Hill Improvement Association in West Roxbury. Okay, are you here to speak in support or opposition? In opposition. Okay, please be brief. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, I just wanted to note that the train station that is adjacent to this project is not called the Bellevue Station, it's the Highland Station. That's just a note. Um, uh, the ZBA published a list of 12 violations that this project um, presents. Um, the FAR, uh, uh, the FAR of 1.0, which is recommended by uh, zoning, is uh, is at 2.9, which is which. Yes, ma'am. Can you give us your your specific reasons for opposition? We we know the zoning specific issues. So you don't want me to talk about the height of the building. Well, I just want to make sure we understand what your opposition is. So I, I just want to, okay, thank you. Hi, please, please continue. Okay. Um, the opposition of our neighborhood association has to do with the height of the building. And, um, you know, it's a uh, 35 foot zoning. Uh, it's, uh, it's the zoning rules are not recommendations. They're, they're actual rules. And this building will be 63 to 70 feet high. So um, we're, we're against the uh, building for this particular reason. Thank you. Jessica, are you back can you guys online? Me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Thank perfect. you. Okay. Yep, sorry about that. Lynette, you're next and we'll look at the event. If you could briefly tell us if you're in support of opposition. Sorry, I sent a request on you. you. I'll go to Evan so we can fix that. Evan, can you briefly tell us if you're in support of opposition? Tell us your name. I'm in support of this project. Okay, and what's your name and address? My name is Evan Zinner. I live at 396 Beach Street, Unit 1. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go to Matt. Hi, yep, Matt Lawler, uh, resident of Rosendale 15, Vasto Terrace. Um, here in support of the project, both on my own behalf as a member of the IAG and also as a representative block of Rosendale, we submitted a letter of support with respect to the Article 80 process, and we're doing so uh, to continue our support here before the CBA. Um, we think this is the right project in this location. It's long past time when this uh, site should be redeveloped, and we think this project is a great example of the kind of project that should be done around the city and around our neighborhood. And we think it's actually been improved quite a bit through the public process, so we appreciate everyone who has uh, participated in that process. Again, very much in support and hope that the board approves the project today. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, two more hands. Um, a couple hands are raising up as we're going. Paula? 
Hi, my name is Paula Olender. I was a member of the IAG, and I'm also a direct abutter at 345 Belgrade Avenue. I am in opposition of this project due to its massive size and the vast overreaching variances that are being requested. Um, I think that it's completely out of character in the neighborhood, and I think that there has been no legal basis to show that the variances should be granted. Um, and I would ask you to oppose or return this to community review. Thank you. I have no additional raised hands, Madam Chair, at the moment. Thanks. Okay, any additional questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve with uh, BPGA and my review. Do you have a review? <laughs> Sorry, I guess he, he wants it. Okay, can I have a second? Second. Okay, uh, Mr. Stembridge? Yeah. Ms. Bedebraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. The chair also votes yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next on the agenda, we have case BOA 148 1408, at the address of 1320 Dorchester Avenue, which is also a, an Article 80 project. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes, Mr. Stambridge, thank you. Okay, and I'm just going to remind again, we have a, lo a lot of cases today. Please uh, be brief. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I certainly will. Uh, my name is George Morancy. I'm an attorney with the business address of 350 West Broadway in South Boston. I represent Robert Ramondi Jr., the owner of the land, and Doug George, who will be developing the project with Mr. Ramondi. We're both present today. We are also joined by Mark Sullivan Hi, Joe. and Arthur Chu, the project architects. Uh, and Richard yeah. Rose, our community outreach coordinator. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, did, uh, uh, no, you it's awesome. Everyone it's... else? Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Nancy. That's okay, thank you. Uh, this project at 1320 Dorchester Avenue was conceived and designed in response to the City of Boston's Compact Living Pilot Initiative, which encourages the development of new urban living spaces where residents enjoy smaller and more affordable but well-designed dwelling units with ample storage and natural light, shared common uh, areas and nearby transportation options. The project uh, additionally responds to and is fully compliant with the city's comprehensive strategic planning initiative for this area of Dorchester, known as Plan Glover's Corner, which was commenced in late 2017 and which established specific new development guidelines to facilitate predictable and appropriate development and community benefits. The proposed project consists of a new six-story, 70-unit residential building at 1320 Dorchester Avenue. The combined lot comprises four parcels and is currently occupied by a small mixed-use building on the lot addressed as 1320 Dorchester Avenue, with the vast majority of the site being used currently for surface parking. The total lot size is approximately 19,021 square feet and is located within an NS neighborhood shopping zoning subdistrict under Article 65. The site is further located within Zone 1 under Plan Dorchester Glover's Corner. Being proposed are 70 studio apartment units, which range from 377 to 450 square feet and therefore comply with the compact living pilots unit interior guidelines in regard to square footage, function, storage, and daylight exposure. The building and the units will also have approximately three, uh, three, uh, 3,300, uh, excuse me, 3,633 square feet of shared office and lounge space, a ground floor fitness center, and a common roof lounge and roof deck. The proposed project includes only six surface parking spaces, which is in compliance with the maximum parking per unit guidelines and will also fully comply with the Compact Living Pilot's transportation demand management requirements of reduced parking, unbundled parking, on-site car share parking, 
and delivery supportive amenities. The project also includes sponsorship of a blue bikes station on Dorchester Avenue in front of the building. Uh, additionally, the site plan facilitates the long-term planning and goal of connecting the project's open space to a future neighborhood network of mid-block linear open spaces, while replacing the existing surface parking along Dorchester Avenue with active ground floor uses and new upper story apartments. With respect to the zoning, the required relief is actually not extensive. A total of four variances are required for one excessive floor area ratio. An FAR of one is allowed and approximately 2.41 is being proposed. Two, an excessive building height of approximately 70 feet with 40 feet being allowed. Three, an insufficient rear yard setback of 15 feet, which is five feet less than the 20 feet required by code. And fourth, a violation for insufficient off-street parking. This site is approximately 10 to 12 minutes walking distance from the Fields Corner Rapid Transit Station on the MBTA's red line. Again, all dimensional characteristics of the building, including building height, project density, and setbacks, as well as all off-street parking minimum and maximum requirements are fully compliant with the strict requirement of Plan Glover's Corner and the Compact Living Pilot. Finally, following Plan Glover's Corner's inclusionary housing recommendations, the project will provide a total of 11 IDP units for a total IDP percentage of 15%. All 11 of these units will be made affordable to households earning not more than 70% of area AMI, AMI and will uh, be additionally affordable owing to the lower maximum rental rate for compact IDP studio units under the compact living pilot, which is currently set at $1,130 per month. With that, Madam Chair, I'll pause and take any questions that members may have. Thank you, Mr. Maranci. Are there questions from the board? Uh, yes, through the chair. Yes. Um, my question for the development team is, if this project was to be approved, uh, what's the timetable on construction? And also, my next question would be, have you uh, selected a general contractor for this project? Yes, Mr. Shepard. The uh, timetable for a uh, project would be uh, probably beginning construction uh, January uh, of the new year, January 2024, uh, with completion sometime in July 2025. Uh, my clients have not yet selected a, a general contractor. This project has been uh, uh, in progress for quite a long time. Uh, looking forward to getting it approved today and then uh, taking up that issue with the next stage, uh, provided this, that this were to be approved by the board. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I only have a question for the BPDA um, plan reviewer in regards to comments on the um, penthouse. There's two of them and it, you know, it's a six story, but with having two, it looks like it's seven, sto it's seven stories. If they can comment on that and their position because it's, it'll be kind of the first of this kind in this context. Is Mr. Harvey the project manager for this? I saw him in the chat. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. So I believe that it is covered in the overall height, but I can work with uh, George Moranchi and the proponent to try to diminish it as much as possible. Okay, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just to continue with the BPDA review process, just to understand that, that it would be setting a precedent of future penthouse units. No, understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Madam Chair, quick question. Similar yes. to a previous project, uh, this project is providing 50% ADP units. And I just want to ask the proponent if there is any reason why your project cannot provide more units, like a higher ADP percentage or lower AMIs, since most of the projects that we are seeing recently are, are offering more than 15, 18, 20% uh, IDP units. So is this possible for your project to reconsider and increase the number of affordable units or the IDP units that you are providing? 
the, the percentage that was settled upon Mr. Valencia is higher than is currently required. Um, we are required to comply with IDP policy. We are exceeding IDP policy. Also, as a compact living pilot, a lot of the building, a lot of the built constructed space is actually common amenity space as a requirement of CLP. So there are therefore fewer units for sale uh, at market rate than would normally be in a non-CLP project. Also, as part of the entire community benefits project uh, process through the, uh, the BPA's Article 80 project, again, aside from settling on a higher uh, uh, then required IDP percentage of 13%. There are also additional amenities that don't show up. They do show up in the BBDA's board memo. Uh, things that typically aren't required, for example, of a small project, such as sponsorship of a blue bike station, which there will be one in front. And the other thing, as I said, is that as compact living pilot uh, IDP units, these are actually lower maximum rental rates than let's say standard IDP units. So we're looking at uh, IDP um, uh, unit rents here at a, a maximum currently of $1,120, uh, which I think is a really good rate for you know someone to be able to live in this really thriving section of the Fields Corner neighborhood in Dorchester. And, and even the market rate units are going to be um, because of what the market is here in this type of a building, probably only a few hundred dollars more than that. So they would almost be in alignment with non-IDP um, um, rental rates, you know, I'm sorry, for non-compact uh, non living rental rates for the IDP units. So we're looking at IDP units at about 1120, as I say, and market rate units of somewhere in the area of 1500 to 1750 per month. Thank you. Any other questions about zoning relief from the board? Okay, hearing none, let's go to public testimony. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, call anyone with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, the Mayor's Office likes to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, as you heard from uh, Steve Harvey, who was the project manager, uh, this project went through an extensive BPA process during uh, 2021 and 2022, with multiple public meetings. Uh, speaking with the Fields Corner Civic Association, we understand that they will not be taking a position on this, but also be deferring to the board as well. Um, but there was conversations throughout about um, affordability with the units um, and the size of the project. Um, we have no letters of opposition that I'm aware of presently. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Joe McEachran, City Councilor Frank Baker's office. would like to go on record in support of the project today. Any other city councilors? If not, I'll go to public testimony. Karen, are you looking to give testimony here? Yes, sir. Okay, can you give your name and address for the record and briefly tell us if you're in support or opposition? Opposition. My name is Karen O'Neill. I'm the proprietor of the property at 1310-1318 Dorchester Avenue. My family's owned this property since 1963. We're very active in the community and I'd like to speak in regards to the appeal of the project at 1320 Dorchester Avenue. To start, I'd like to state I'm all for business, but not one's going to affect mine negatively. I've been to the butters meeting. I've also met privately. I was promised the plans would be revised and my concerns would be addressed. I reached out to Mr. George himself a few times. To date, I've heard nothing back. Neighborhood concerns and mine are the setbacks. My personal concern as the main abutter is the size of the setback. The parking, 70 units with only six spots in that congested area, the parking is unbearable now. A Friday night Uber Eats will need more than that amount of spaces. The Dorchester House is using that lot now for parking. Not sure exactly how many cars, my guess would be 20. I don't know where they're going to go now. Um, the height of the project, 70 feet, would tower over the existing buildings in that area, compromising the three decades historical look of the buildings there now. Uh, the proposed electrical and storage needs, can they be met? The roof, deck, the lounge, the mechanicals, all of the, uh, the bike storage, all of that should, should probably be on the opposite side of the building since it's commercial and everything closes at 3 o'clock over there. It wouldn't affect anybody else in the area. There are 10 residential properties on my, you know, on my property. As far as I know, the Glover Park Please wrap up. Please wrap up. Uh, 
Are there any other raised hands? Okay, I have no additional raised hands. Thank you. Okay, would you like to address any of that? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, George Morancy. I uh, just point out that in terms of setbacks, uh, except for a five foot rear setback violation, we're in, in compliance of all setback requirements. Uh, this building, a uh, previous speaker who testified, is to the left. Uh, since the inception of the project, uh, aside from things like a, a reduction in building height, a reduction in number of units, but specifically uh, uh, as an accommodation to that to the building on the left at 1310, uh, side uh, decks and balconies uh, were removed. They're projecting balconies. Uh, windows were realigned, some windows were eliminated, the size setback um, has been uh, increased. Again, all concerns of how the mixed use building to the left could be impacted. So, um, you know, uh, every effort was made and there is no side yard setback violation. And in terms of the amenity space, the rooftop amenity space in particular, uh, uh, amenity space is a requirement under the compact living pilot and it is really practically necessary for small units such as this to have an area where residents can actually have some usable open space any final questions from the board with that may i have a motion madam chair i'll put for a motion to approve with 11 idp units and other community benefits as outlined on the bpda board memorandum May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have case BOA 148646. The address of 42 East Street is the applicant and or their representative present. Yes. Can you identify yourself and put your address into the record? Hi, my name is Bonnie Tan with JCVT Architect. Uh, address is 585 Washington Street, Quincy, Mass. I represent the client uh, owner of the property, um, Moy Tran. Um, we are proposing a three-unit, three-story townhouse at the property of 42 East Street, um, sitting on a 7,120-something square feet lot, uh, seeking for FAR variance, uh, number of story uh, dimensional setback. We have provide um, more than what is required for parking spaces. We have. Um, each unit will have an indoor two-car garage on the ground level with three additional visitor parking space in the rear. Um, first floor will be for uh, open living space. Second, the top floor is uh, two to three bedroom unit. Um, the first unit one and unit two are about 1,200 square feet each unit with a 2,000 square feet living space on the third unit. These are for rental. Um, the owner is looking to keep unit number three to herself and her family with the rental of unit one and two. Um, each, uh, the, each unit will have its um, own garage and parking. Um, the outdoor is for, they have each, um, and the rear will be for outdoor space um, to be used for each, uh, all the units there. Um, I don't have the owner here with me, but um, they are for, from what I heard, is for market rental. Can you speak to a set, setback? Uh, how much setbacks do you have in the front and, and sides? The front yard setback I have is, is a foot. So the left yard I have is um, the worst case is in the rear, which is 3.5. The rear we have close to 60 feet in the rear. The okay. right side we have plenty for it because it's a two way part, uh, driveway. And what's required in the front yard? 
Right, your require is 15. Okay. We push the mark into the rear. Okay, are there questions from the board? Yeah, I'm trying to understand um, the, the garage, the, it says proposed front elevation, um, but I see that there's, oop, right there. Uh, is that on the street, those garages? Because, because I thought that the garage, that's, that there's that's parking the at the rear. That's on the driveway side, on so, the right side. <clears throat> that's really the right side. Is it, is, are those garage doors, um, facing where there is an aisle access to the three parking space? Um, the bottom one is the one facing the three parking space. The garage door is facing the rear yard. I mean, uh, sorry, the right yard. So just to clarify, this is a side view, not the front That's view. That's a side view, the garage, yes. So there's no entrance on the on the front facing the street there's on. no entrance correct okay right so i think what you're calling <clears throat> front is really just a side yard yes yes okay so it's just mislabeled yeah okay why so many visitor spaces this is a lot of parking we don't typically see so much parking and and have you considered some open space as opposed to visitor parking uh, we can convert it back to open space if it's necessary. Um, the owner felt that he, she's giving each one a visitor parking space, so just in case each one of them have a guest over the same time. So there's parking, so no need to park on the street to take up any neighbor's parking on the street. Because we went to um, a couple of uh, neighborhood meeting and all of them complain about parking on that street. So that's why we provide extra visitor parking space so um, no one on this property will park on the street. And how many, oh sorry, can I just ask how many cuts you're proposing and then I'll turn to you. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How many curb cuts are you proposing for all these just parking one. spaces? Just one. one. Okay. Just one for the driveway. Would that be the existing curb cut or no? Um, yeah, that is the existing curb cut. So um, if, uh, question, if you remove the, the parking for visitors, you will be able to increase the setback on the front because at this moment you only have one foot, right? So if you, um, if you change, the, remove the parking in the back, can you pull back your building to increase the setback on the front of the, the site? Uh, well, the, because the lot is wider in the front and narrow in the rear, if we push it, um, the last unit will have a very tight turning radius. But still, the visitor parking will have the same problem. The visitor parking space doesn't need as uh, deep as uh, it's necessary, but we, if we prefer to push it a little bit further back to eliminate the visitor parking space, we can certainly do that and have people park on the driveway. Also, you, you're almost replicating the building to the right that's existing to your property where it's a long yes. building and the front is through the aisle. But yes. in that case, all the parking is, is outside of the, of the units. Correct. Except that their setback looks a lot, their front yard setback looks a lot deeper. Much bigger, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I do like um, Mr. Valencia's uh, comment that uh, you know, if you set back just enough, so it's working with the adjacent property kind of modal alignment, um, and you remove the, the additional three proposed parking, you then allow for open space to the residents. Sure, we can do that. We can eliminate the three parking spaces uh, outside and giving a 15 feet front yard setback. 
Mr. Hampton, do you want to just weigh in on, on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, we pretty much agree with all the discussion that's uh, taken place between the board members. Uh, typically on the street, you know, you'd probably want a triple decker. I mean, that's what most of them are. Uh, but, you know, mimicking the house to the right is fine. We, we want to increase that front yard setback. Even the triple deckers are set back a little bit. Um, and we think that, you know, more open space, uh, you know, nine parking spaces on this site is pretty excessive. Uh, but I, I would agree with the, the comments made by the board uh, to push this building back so that we have uh, more of a front yard setback. And uh, if we could increase the usable open space, I'd be, uh, I'd agree with that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to public testimony. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Ashley Gomes from the Mayor's Office in Neighborhood Service. Um, some background on the community process. The office held members meeting last July, July 11th. Members in that meeting applicant did reach out to Meeting House Hill Civic Association. Uh, no significant concerns or letters of opposition that I'm aware of this time. With that, we depart. Ooh. Any other raised hands? I have no raised hands at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Hearing the discussion, may I have a motion? Ma Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with um, to provide three provisos. Um, one, to work with BPDA to increase the front yard setback. Two, to eliminate the three on site. Uh, parking spaces to allow for more open usable space and three to work with BPDA design review to uh, pay special attention to the East Street facade which is really the front um, of the of the of the property to work more with its neighboring um, residential uh, neighbor in terms of its context we have a second second, second. Mr. Stumbridge? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Next, <clears throat> Next we have case BOA 1041034. The address of 177 Harvard Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes. Stuart Can you Schreier. introduce yourself? Thank you. Stuart Schreier representing the Bethel Tabernacle Pentecostal Church. Um, this is regarding 177 Harvard Street in Dorchester, which is part of the Greater Mattapan Zoning District. It's a 3F5000 property. The proposal is to change the use from an adult education with offices to an assembly, place of worship, food pantry, and two dwelling units above. So I'll describe what's proposed for this building. First of all, the building was built in 1900 as a two family. It was used by St. Leo Roman Catholic Church as a parish house. Later, it was used by the Haitian Community Center for a number of years. The building has been underutilized for some time. Uh, the Pentecostal Church purchased the building in 2006. In 2011, they came back with a proposal which was approved by this board for some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So what the proposal is, it's an existing building. The only exterior changes are adding a ramp on the left side of the building for access to the basement and the rear porches are going to be enlarged so the building itself on the exterior will remain on the same footprint and stay where it is the proposal is to change the first floor into a community room uh, there's going to be a kitchen a dining room for use by the parish so you'll see uh, on the right hand side is a community room on the left hand side is a kitchen a dining room and a living room looks somewhat like an apartment it's going to stay looking like that 
and it's going to be used by the parish for meetings and meals and whatever they're going to use it for. Uh, pertinent to that, they want to use the basement, if we can go back one slide. So actually, uh, that that's the existing. If you would go to uh, 16, I think it is, is the proposal, you're the existing. If you could move A7. A7, there we, there we go. So this is the proposal for the basement. What the parish is proposing is a food pantry. It's desperately needed in the neighborhood. Um, obviously, there are people that just aren't in a fortunate position and they need help. And this parish chooses to help those people. If you look, the entry will be from the front of the building on a ramp down to the basement. They'll have it set up for tables where people can pick and choose what kind of food they need. To the right rear, there's going to be a refrigerator room and storage. That, that room that you see on the right in the rear is a, uh, uh, it's going to contain refrigerators and freezers to keep the food. There'll be never more than 10 people in this working and 10 people that could be customers. So um, it's, the outside area of the building is 1,260 square feet. There'll be a little less than that. There'll be about 1,100 square feet of usable space inside. And they do have room for the mechanicals for upstairs and uh, a bathroom. So this is what is the important part of the proposal. The second floor will be residential for people from the parish that are going to be living in there. Um, ministry students that come to visit. This is a four bedroom unit. Again, it's just about 1,200 square feet. The third floor will be used also by the parish for the church administrator. This is a two bedroom unit. It's a smaller unit, maybe about 750 square feet. These are all existing. So let me tell you why this should be considered by the board. Yet it's a 3F5000 but there's no other buildings on this side of the street. This entire area from Esmond Street through to Bicknell Street along Harvard is owned by the Pentecostal Church. The church has a church building, a parish house, and other buildings located here. They have additional parking. The total campus, if we were to do this as a campus, is 57,640 square feet on Esmond, Harvard, and Bicknell. The church building, the administrative building, and the parking areas are all there along with some recreation areas. The church has more than adequate parking. Because the church is going to be operating the food pantry, there should not be any problem with parking in the area. Um, the building was, was uh, sold to the church from the Catholic Charitable Bureau of the Archdiocese of Boston in 2006. In 2011, they came to this board because the prior listed use of this property was adult education. They wanted to church, change it to a place of assembly uh, and, and residential. The board approved the pro project back uh, in 2011, BZC 30980. I know that's not binding on this board, but we submitted 100 and 25 letters of support from the neighborhood, from immediate abutters and people that need to use the food pantry. This food pantry is very important to the neighborhood. And okay, we let's, let's pause and see if the, the board has any questions. Are there any questions from the board? I was just questioning the, the four bedroom unrelated adults, is, is that meant to be more like an SRO kind of arrangement? No, it, it's gonna be used by the parish for ministry students. So they won't be tenants per se. Usually when ministry students are traveling, they might be going from parish to parish. The church will control who's in there and uh, it's gonna be utilized by the church. The church will be- oh, Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, can we have public testimony? 
Um, good morning, then, Madam Chair. The board actually went to the member mayor's office of local services, um, office of good hold of the mother's meeting May 4th, with attendance in that meeting. Um, a lot of people in favor of this project. They were also involved with the neighborhood civic, um, Talbot Harbor Triangle, which received support as well. With that, we would like to support at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Ayim Dilmuiwa with the Office of City Councilor Brian Worrell. In regards to 177 Harvard Street, um, the Abutting Civic Harvard Blue Circle gave their support. And with no letters of opposition, to our awareness, the council would like to go on record and support this project. Madam Chair, I have no raised hands. Thank you. Thank you. With that, may I have a motion? Well, I'll I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Mr. Ms. Bedabraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panato. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Next, we have case of Bob um, Field. Chair, um, since we're past the 11 o'clock uh, hour, I would ask if there are <clears throat> any requests for withdrawals or deferral from the 11 o'clock there. Yes, Mr. Stembridge, I have one. 43-45 Stanton Street. So that would be case BOA 144-3137. With the address of 43 to 45 Stanton Street, um, would you identify yourself and invite them? Yes, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark Lacasse, Lacasse Law, 75 Arlington Street in Boston, attorney for the project proponent at 43 45 Stanton Street, which is the uh, former convent of the St. Matthew's Parish Complex, which has been closed for some time. And um, while my client is not developing any other part of this closed parish campus, including the much larger church building, nevertheless, um, we've had a request from community groups to uh, continue our meeting with them regarding this particular proposal as it relates to the larger other component parts of the St. Matthew's Parish Complex. And we've agreed to, to do that and have further meetings with the community. So on that basis, we are uh, requesting a deferral today. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, Chair, Chair. Yep. Madam Chair, this is Todd here. Uh, yes. A potential deferral day to Attorney Lacasses, would September 26th or October 17th be more appropriate for you? Um, I think we'd like to go with 926 and, and keep, keep the process moving. Okay. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Motion to approve the deferral for this case to September 26. May I have a second? Take Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Bedabraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panato. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank See you. Right. Thank you. Any Mr. Secretary, yes. 222 Bowen Street, please. So that would be case BOA 148-1099 with the address of being said, 222 Bowen Street. Would you identify yourself and give us an explanation, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, Attorney Ryan Spitz with Adams and Maranci, business address of 168 8th Street, first floor, South Boston. Uh, we're seeking a deferral today based upon the new process that, that just passed the BPDA board a few weeks ago uh, regarding rolling recommendations. Um, since we've received the recommendation of the BPDA uh, to increase our front yard setback uh, to be a sufficient five foot width rather than a modal setback, we're asking for a short deferral on this as we have uh, recently revised the plans. Plans have been submitted to both ISD as well as the BPDA for further review. We're just waiting to hear back. So um, I'm going to pass it over to you um, for a deferral. Javier? Uh, we could do September 12th for this one. If, 
lands need to be stamped. Great, that will work. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Motion to defer until September 12th. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. If there are no, there are no other requests, then we we'll move on. Uh, the next case will be King DOA 1475908 with the address of 17 Watson Street with the applicant and or their representative is present. They let us know. Yes, I'm here. Uh, it's Marcus Springer from Over Under Architects, 46 Waltham Street, Boston, Mass. Okay. Uh, so yep. this project is uh, an extension into the rear yard in terms of a, a new roof deck over an existing sunroom. Uh, so we're just converting that roof uh, into a deck with access off of the master bedroom with railings. So in this drawing here, the upper plan shows the existing sunroom uh, as a roof. And if I go to the next slide, you can see it in the elevations. Sorry, the next, and keep going. So these elevations here on the left side is the west elevation. So you can see on the third floor, that is the uh, existing roof area. The middle elevation is the south elevation and the proposed roof deck is to go on top of that roof where those four windows are uh, and then if you go to the next slide please and we can keep going uh, keep going these are demolition plans uh, right here uh, sorry um, yeah go back a couple um, one more here, no, uh, sorry, sorry, um, and where is the plan? Keep, keep going. Here, sorry, here it is. Okay, this upper plan shows the new roof deck with access off of the new primary bedroom, changing a, a window into a doorway. And then if you go to the elevations, you can see how that looks. Keep going um, through the slides right here. So again, on the left-hand side is the west elevation is as seen from Public Alley 708. So the, the new railings are seen on the third level. And in the middle, again, the south elevation, the railings are seen uh, on there. So we are seeking relief for this new roof deck. And are there questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it to public testimony. Hi, um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Kim Kershirley from Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. We had an abutters meeting uh, for this proposal in November of 22, where there was support from the abutters. And at this time, I'd like to defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have no raised hands. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Uh, seems pretty straightforward. I'll make a motion. <laughs> Uh, may I have a second? I, I so. just want to make a proviso that I, I believe, is this the one that's subject to Parks and Rec's uh, review? Yes. Um, and, and uh, sorry, potentially subject to GCOD? Um, we have support from the trustees of the reservation. They have sent in a letter to ISD in support of our project. The GCOD uh, was approved on an earlier uh, project on this house in September of 2010. There was a, a large addition into the rear yard at that time. And it, okay. the, the infiltration system was, was uh, uh, put in at that time. Okay, thank you. So then, um, sorry, motion to approve. Um, it's yeah. motion to approve. But that, was that any for reason? It sounds like they've already got parts. Yeah, of I second it. God, okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Better Braza? Yes. 
Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Member of the Board. Deferring on the next case, so we will go on to case BOA 147-6698. With the address of 964 Bennington Street, is the applicant and or their representative present? I am on for this case. Can you raise your hand? Okay, I see you okay, here. Here, go ahead. Send a request to unmute you. Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? This is Diana, owner of the property 964 Bennington Street, Ms. Boston. Uh, yes, uh, I want to make the basement part of the first floor. Uh, now, there is a one bedroom and one bathroom. Uh, yes, uh, I want to make part of the basement to the first floor. No any job outside the building. Um, yeah, I'm planning to move in the future over there. So can you speak more to what you plan, what you propose for the basement? What kind of use? Uh, not just for family. Just I want to uh, add the playroom and um, yeah, move with my daughter and my granddaughter. So yes, bed, I want to make... Bedroom and playroom? Yeah, one bed, there is now one bedroom and one bathroom. Um, I want to put the playroom and the mechanical, mechanic, mechanic room. Okay, so can you, you confirm, is there currently already a use of the basement? Is there some use of the basement that you're expanding or, or is this a brand new use? No, now is I have the bedroom and bathroom. Uh, but I just I want to send it to the first floor. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions from the board? So, uh, Madam Chair, it's, um, we have BPDA feedback, and perhaps Jeff Hampton wants to, wants to uh, expand on this. But the feedback that we received from BPDA is that the project um, sits below the base flow level. It's on the flood hazard district and coastal flood resiliency overlay. So living units are not allowed in the basement. Yeah, to uh, reiterate what Ms. Betta Barraza said, we can't support this with the living space in a flood zone. Okay, other questions either from Ms. Betta Barraza or the board? No, just, uh, so this part of the basement, uh, because I would like to, you know, connect to the first floor. That's what's more easy for us. Okay, are there other questions from the board? This is only for uh, oh. Ms. Aponte. Are you proposing just renovation to the basement and also to the first floor or just the basement? No, just uh, the basement. So okay, just to connect so you understand, to the... you understand that your project has a flood hazard um, a coastal flood resiliency kind of overlay uh, that is subject to flooding. So it's it's just not allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I, I don't plan to so to live in downstairs, just, you know, the mechanical room and just the playroom, you know? So are you planning to keep the bedroom on in the basement level? Yeah, there is now one bedroom and one bathroom. So when I blow, I just release them. And that's it. So, but I guess I want to connect the first floor to the basements. I mean, what I'm hearing is there's already an existing bedroom in the basement, just FYI. Um, right. No, just. Uh, well, we don't know if. Uh, did you receive permit for that or did you? Purchase the home with that use already existing. No, I purchased I purchased the house, the house, yeah, with that. Okay. Thing. Right. Yeah, but okay. I but I use it. The the time they in the first floor, they use like a storage, you know. Okay, so uh, Mr. Hampton, what would you recommend in this situation? 
<laughs> it's so not fair. <laughs> well, but that's why you're here. I know. I, I, I feel awful. I do. I feel sympathetic to the cause. But there's just no way we can support the extension of living space in a flood zone. It's just not something that we're supportive of. Okay, great. Thanks, Mr. Hamm. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, can I have public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time, the Mayor's Office has deferred to the judgment of this board. Some back information on the community process. Uh, we had the proponent circulate a flyer to abutters within 300 feet. Uh, we did not receive any concerns from neighbors or abutters. Uh, at this time, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other raised hands? I don't have no additional raised hands. With that, may I have a motion? Uh, motion to deny. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Vedabraza? No. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Pinado? Yes. Mr. Collins? No. Uh, chair votes yes, the motion carries. Okay. With that, we'll move on to the hearing schedule for 11 a.m. The first being case BOA 1455410 with the address of 2 Wilkins Place. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Hi, hey, Patrick Michaud, are you on or your representative? Can you raise your hand? Okay, I see a uh, raised hand. Go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. I sent a request to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. You can hear me? Yes. Thank you. You Thank you. yourself, please. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hello. My name is Patrick Michaud, and I own uh, two Wilkins Place and four Wilkins Place. I'm seeking uh, relief by, by the board to build a 1,515 square foot single family home that is similar in size and design to many of the homes on the street and in the neighborhood. There are um, there are several zoning violations, uh, including lot area insufficiency and front and year, rear yard insufficiency. Um, these circumstances aren't peculiar to the land itself, but uh, are, are peculiar to the land itself, but not the neighborhood. Um, at least six of the homes in the immediate area have similar lot sizes. Um, I, you know, I understand that some of the abutters' concerns over construction, mainly over construction traffic. I, where I own the adjacent home, I agreed to have any construction vehicles during the uh, rough permit stage to park at both two and four Wilkins Place to eliminate any traffic concerns. Um, I also plan to live in the single family home, the new one that will be built. Um, I've also offered to install water holding tanks in each of the abutters uh, on Wilkins Place after some neighbors expressed some concerns about potential water uh, being created by any potential construction. Uh, and I've offered to repave Wilkins Place uh, after uh, the construction is concluded. And uh, finally, um, I submitted a letter of support with, I believe, roughly 63 signatures from residents uh, in, uh, in Rosendale. Uh, one of the abutters uh, at 138 Poplar Street, who uh, is property of Butts to Wilkins Place, has also signed that uh, letter of support. Um, I will make one note that one of the persons that signed, and his name is um, Jeff Metric on the page two of the uh, letter of support. Uh, he. I didn't, I didn't realize until after he signed that he, he works in Rosendale, but he didn't realize that he actually lives in Sharon, Sharon Mass, so that shouldn't be included in any of the uh, signatures. And uh, with that, I just uh, seek relief from the, from the board. Can you just confirm what's, what's on that parcel now? It's just a vacant uh, lot. There is, there is a driveway that's being used by Fort Wilkins, but that would, be, um, that would obviously be removed. And there'd be a park, uh, there'd be a um, driveway for both four and two Wilkins uh, on the left side of both both homes. Got it. Oh, and, and one last thing, uh, there was some concerns by one abutter at one of the hearings, uh, one of the meetings um, about removal of trees. There is no 
uh, intention to remove any perimeter trees uh, from the lot. Uh, there are there are some there is some overgrowth on the existing lot, um, you know, in the kind of the middle of the, the lot, and that will get removed. But any perimeter trees uh, will not get removed. Uh, there is probably a good you know, six to 10 uh, trees that line the perimeter of the, um, of the property. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Uh, do you have a landscape plan for this? Uh, it's not uh, on the plans, uh, but certainly there, there will be landscaping done, um, you know, in front of the property and on the side of the property as well. Um, but uh, there is none in the plans, no. Thank you. Okay. Other questions from the board? Hearing none, can I have public testimony? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is Diana Bronchuk from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, we defer judgment to the board. We held a highly attended community meeting in late April where, where Mr. Mashad addressed concerns of drainage problems by putting in a holding tank on the property. Patrick Mashad also mentioned that he would replace any damage done to the street and that construction vehicles will park at Fort Wilkins Place that Mr. Mashad owns. He did present at the West Village Neighborhood Association meeting in late May. That also drew a lot, lot of attendance of the direct abutters asking, expressing similar concerns. We have received multiple letters of oppositions from direct abutters and state officials. We've also received a few, letter, few letters in support, as well as the mentioned le petition list that Mr. Rashad had submitted. Thank you. Thank you. We have a raised hand here. Rose, um, one second. Are you looking to give testimony here? I see someone in the chat, Miriam, who's also asking to give testimony. Second. Okay, uh, see your hand raises well, Mary. I'll go to you and you can go back to Rose and Julie. Rose, um, Mary, go ahead. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you. I'm Dr. Miriam Kamarami and I live at 144 Poplar Street. Um, my house is catty corner to the proposed um, construction and I'm speaking in favor of the construction. Um, my position is uh, really grounded in the climate crisis, which is the most threatening and compelling issue of our time. And I believe that infill housing, such as the proposed structure, has numerous advantages, um, including because of the location of the, the dwelling, the people who live in this house would be able to walk rather than drive to neighborhood stores and uh, community businesses to do their shopping and could also walk to public transportation more easily than most homes in the Commonwealth. Um, as uh, Mr. Misha noted, no forests or wetlands would have to be cleared to create room for this new housing, and residents would have a lot shorter commute to work than folks who live in the suburbs and commute to the city. I'll note that city planners across the country are trying to promote this type of building in order to meet climate goals, and many cities are relaxing building codes and even abolishing zoning in order to allow for infill housing to be built. The other just short point I want to make is that, you know, we have a severe shortage of affordable housing in Boston that contributes to homelessness, gentrification, and lessening of racial and socioeconomic diversity in our neighborhoods. And the main way to address this is to build more housing in every neighborhood, which will make it more accessible for a wider variety of people. Thank, well, thank you, Miriam. Okay. Um, thank Rose you. and Julie, are you? Yes, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, my name is Julie Patterson. My mother, Rose Mencos, is the abutter and 32 Sycamore. And uh, I appreciate the concessions that were already outlined, um, uh, mainly around the water and uh, the repaving of the road. However, um, uh, the parking still remains an issue. Um, I understand that he said that we could, or the construction will have parking. and. Um, uh, on the properties he does own, but even in just visiting his own property, he's parked far from those places. So that wasn't necessarily a solution. Um, the space that he's speaking about is very tiny. Um, we're concerned about how tiny that space is, and he's in another home. As far as I understand, this home is not an affordable home. This home is 
uh, this community is quickly gentrified and have ge has gentrified. My mother has lived there for well over 50 years and is one of the remaining property owners since its gentrification. This is just adding to that burden um, and it's crowding and overcrowded space. And lastly, during construction, even the slightest construction, there are mice that invade my mother's home year over year. Construction next door of this magnitude invites not only rodents and pests, but rats that are already in the homes of our neighbors because of construction. Thank you. Jessica? Yep, uh, Rebecca, go ahead, and then Nia. Hi, this is Rebecca, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll try to be very short. I know time is very limited. Um, we've submitted, submitted written testimony, which hopefully you guys have. Um, so four major concerns, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, several neighbors. Um, one is that the lot size is, is simply too small. This is not a minor um, you know, violation. There are five major violations which you've seen. Um, so it's not the plot being you know, short a foot or two in one direction. It's simply an un, you know, buildable lot. And I think there are good reasons that the city has zoning codes with space requirements. And you know, the appellant has not put forth any um, demonstrated hardship or compelling reason why he you know, deserves a variance and shouldn't just simply follow the city's zoning rules. Second major concern is that uh, Wilkins Place is very narrow, dead end street. It's basically like an alleyway. Um, frequently cars, delivery trucks, anything that comes down the street, um, you know, gets stuck. It can't turn around. Um, just a plumber or delivery truck will block, will block the street. I won't be able to get out of my driveway. I'll have to go search for whose house they're servicing, you know, go find them, knock on their car door and ask them to move so I can simply drive my child to a doctor's appointment or get my kid to school on time. And so, um, you know, we've talked with the appellant several times in several different meetings. This is just, um, we're never going to come to agreement on this i just many of us simply do not believe that all of the trucks and different um vendors that it take to build a house over a year can just park on his properties and never block the street i just simply you know if the house could come down from heaven built that'd be one thing but we just simply do not believe that all of the vendors and the trucks okay. thank you park on his property this is not possible thank you, thank you. and then Nina? Hi, Nia. You looking to give testimony? You're unmuted. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I am also a resident of Wilkins Place. I have the same concerns as my neighbors who are opposing this project. The street is, the lot is too small. The street is too narrow. It's a private way. The residents are responsible for the maintenance and repair of the street. Um, he will not be taking down just a few trees. He will be removing a great deal of tree canopy. And I believe the mayor has a new initiative to have trees on private homes to help address issues of uh, climate change. Um, I also have questions about for Wilkins Place and the parking. I think he said he's going to remove it. Um, I don't think that can happen. And at all the pu public meetings we've had and discussions with the developer, he's told us he's selling this at market rate. He has never told us that he would be living at this property. Um, so the, the, the city assessment map also uh, notes that this is an unbuildable lot. There is no parking on Wilkins Place at all. There is no parking on Sycamore Street. And it's a tow zone, basically, because emergency vehicles cannot get down our street. It's very, very difficult. Thanks. Thank you. I have no additional raising hands. OK, would you like to briefly respond to those before we vote, Mr. Michaud? Or maybe he can be specific about construction vehicles. Uh, how um, would he manage that on a narrow street? Yes, yeah. hello. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, I Just to correct one thing, um, I definitely will be selling for Wilkins, uh, but the plan is to move into two Wilkins. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as construction vehicles, there will be two driveways, you know, spots that will be available for construction vehicles. Uh, there, I don't anticipate more than two or three vehicles at any one time, uh, so I don't anticipate any problems with construction vehicles. I understand generally the noise from construction is not something people um, like, but, uh, but I also anticipate that the construction would be done within six months, uh, as I don't see it being a year-long process. It's a, a three-bedroom, single-family home. 
Will they be using your your space um, where you currently reside? Because a two parking space is only eleven foot wide. That you're the, the parking spaces. Yeah. I would I would leave four. I would leave four Wilkins and two Wil well four four Wilkins vacant, and have the parking that is would be available at four Wilkins available for use by the construction vehicle. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank no, you. No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with a proviso that the applicant use permeable, permeable materials for the driveway. And and the, the, I actually, I, I don't think it needs PPDA review. I, I think it's a very straightforward uh, design Got project. It. Got it. And I have a second. So, Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Benabraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is, I, 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 uh, I already said the outcome. Um, Madam Excuse Chair, we'll move it. If you don't mind, uh, we'll go to the rediscussions for schedule for 1130 and ask if there are any requests for <laughs> withdrawals or deferrals from that time frame. Can you please raise your hand if you're given, looking to defer your hearing? With that, then we will return uh, and we will defer on the next case in, in the 11 o'clock time frame and then move on to case BOA 1473828 with the address of 114 to 122 Harvard Street. Is the applicant and or the representative present? Madam Chair, I need to recuse myself for this case and for 18 and 24 Standish. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, Madam Chair. My name is Miriam G. I am the architect and co-developer for the project at 114, 122 Harvard Street, and also the next BOA up on the agenda at 18 to 24 Standish Street. And um, I'm also here with Travis Lee. Travis, would you like to introduce yourself and get us started? Hello, Madam Chair and board. Thank you. Uh, and my please name is be brief as a reminder. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, my name is Travis Lee, and I am a co-developer, and my company is Teeley Development. We are also joined by Jacob Taylor, our legal counsel from Klein Hornig. My, uh, my company, Teeley Development, uh, is a Dorchester-based firm that exclusively develops uh, multifamily housing and small business space in Dorchester. 100% of the housing that we develop is income restricted in some form or fashion. We're here today to talk about two parcels over, overall, two projects overall, but uh, we're going to focus this particular conversation on 114, 122 Harvard Street. A couple of years ago, the city of Boston put out an RFP for two vacant lots uh, in Dorchester, one at the corner of Harvard Street and Standish, and one other vacant lot just a half block down Standish. These properties uh, are both vacant. The property uh, that we're talking about right now, 114, 122 Harvard Street, is a currently a vacant property immediately abutting the MBTA, Talbot Ave, train station. We have over the years held a robust community process that my partner Miriam will tell you more about in just a second during which this process the community asked that we proceed with home ownership as opposed to rentals so we, we come to this meeting today with a total of 22 units of home ownership housing split between these two properties these two projects the 100 uh, percent of the 22 units will be income restricted at 80 percent 90 percent and 100 percent of the area's median income the 114 Harvard Street project includes 16 home ownership units with about 1,250 square feet of ground floor retail space. It has one, two, and three bedroom units, eight, parkings, uh, eight parking spaces off street, as well as an outside courtyard for owners, condominium owners to sit and relax. 
there are 16 indoor secured bike spaces within the building. And, uh, uh, and so I'd love to pass it over to my counsel, Jacob, to run through some of the zoning violations that we are here for. Thank you. Can you move to the next slide, please? Is your attorney present? Jacob, are you, are you here? Uh, looks like he is here, but he is not a panelist. So, um, I'll make him a panelist right now as you're talking. Um, Jacob, can you just uh, accept the panelist designation when it pops up? There you go. Okay, he can just unmute himself. Thank you. Hey, is Jacob on? Jacob, are you able to unmute yourself? Go ahead and reiterate yes, a couple of I am here. Uh, Sorry. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Are, are folks able to hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. Um, so as Travis, Travis indicated, uh, 114 to 122 Harvard um, is uh, a corner lot on the corner of Harvard and Standard Street. Uh, and the lot also abuts the commuter rail tracks on the other side. Uh, the proposed lot uh, for this project is 17,600 square feet. Uh, they're proposing to build a three-story affordable home ownership development with 16 workforce units and approximately 12, uh, 1,250 square feet of commercial or retail space on the ground floor uh, with eight parking spaces. Um, the project is going through small project review with the BPDA together with the uh, 18 to 24 Standish project. Uh, and this is in a 3F5000 zone and we're requesting relief uh, under Article 60, Section 37 with respect to off-street parking, Article 60, Section 40 with respect to parking location, Article 60, 41.2 with respect to traffic visibility across the corner, uh, Article 60, Section 8 with respect to multi multifamily residential use, um, and we're also respect, uh, requesting dimensional variances under Article 60, Section 9 with respect to front and rear yard, usable open space, uh, lot area per dwelling unit, and FAR. Um, and I will, uh, if there's no questions at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Miriam G to uh, provide more detail on the design of the project. Thank you, Jacob. Yep, go ahead. Um, can you advance to the next slides, please? So all of this design, as you can see in the site plan, into the next slide, please, has been incorporated in a long and comprehensive uh, design process that we've been working through with the Mayor's Office of Housing, the BPDA, our landscape architects, our civil engineers, and um, members of the Talbot Harbor Triangle. Uh, so a couple of things that we'd like to mention here is that we are also very focused on this as a net zero energy, uh, green building, high performance project. So not only will these be income restricted for 80, 90, and 100% area median income of affordable home ownership units. They're also going to be the top notch, most high performance uh, passive house style construction for the homeowners, saving them a lot on energy. And also we focused a lot on green infrastructure. There are existing invasive species trees located along Standish Street, kind of uh, right at the corner of the building and where it meets uh, the parking. And after we discovered that these invasive species are growing into an existing retaining wall, a couple of arborists, including our landscape architect, advised us to take them down. Um, so we've been working with uh, Speak for the Trees and Cynthia Francis to come up with a larger urban tree canopy campaign for the entire THT neighborhood area, where we're working with Speak for the Trees to get private um, homeowners to accept plantings of um, private trees for free and to learn about how to maintain their trees in their front and rear yards, and then also working with um, 311 to create a neighborhood petition to plant more street trees just beyond what's what's happening on these two lots. Um, it is really hot in this area and these three trees that are on the lot right now um, are some of the only shade that are kind of being provided in the area so we wanted to kind of overcompensate for taking them down. There's quite a lot of canopy at the rear of the property as a buffer against the MBTA rail, rail lines. And we've worked with our landscape architect to provide some great um, street freight, uh, streetscape frontage and then also private home ownership, um, raised beds, plantings, and a courtyard in this scheme. Can you advance to the next slide, please? 
So here is an image of some of the raised uh, planting ideas, and there are also outdoor balconies for the units. Next slide, please. We're also using permeable paving in, um, in the design of the parking area to reduce uh, stormwater management concerns. Um, there's also going to be a white roof and a solar array covering 75% or more of the rooftop. Um, this is going to be a low carbon design with organic materials and super energy efficient heating and air conditioning and fresh air exchange. Um, I will say about our community process, we held a really successful meeting in April and um, it was with the BPDA and Cynthia and I flyer the neighborhood and we didn't have any opposition from any of the abettors who came out. Um, and then furthermore, we've been, uh, we've received eight different uh, letters of support, including from Talbot Harbor Triangle, uh, Dorchester United Neighborhood Association, as well as Erie Ellington Brinsley Neighborhood Partnership, Boston Farms Community Land Trust, and, and additionally five or six other Dorchester residents. Um, it is steps to the Talbot Ave commuter rail station and again, there is a uh, bike parking inside of the building and on the outside of the building front. And we think it's also a great opportunity to include a 1200 square foot commercial retail space. We've got a really robust community process for choosing our retail tenants. We may work with partners such as Union Capital Boston or Boston Ujima Project to um, find a local or minority or woman owned company to uh, occupy the space when the time comes. You advance to, to the next PDF, actually, which is called Colored Elevations with Bays. We've also met with uh, Council Worrell's office. So the, the initial submission here, we've advanced the elevation of the design. So actually, I'll need to get to another file, which is called, which was submitted. Um, and the file is called Harvard Elevations Bays Color. So these are the revised elevations great thank you very much so this um in working with feedback that we heard from neighbors and also from council world's office um, along harvard street you'll see kind of like the area above the commercial space so there's a kind of like black course and storefront at the commercial ground level retail which can be activated with the canopy and has nice street trees and benches above that area we have this uh, red horizontal siding with some nice um, mullioned windows casement windows uh, and these bays indicating where the living spaces are on the different units and then it also turns the corner we have a more traditional horizontal and board and batten siding and then also porches that are very reflective of the triple deckers in the neighborhood we kept this as a three-story walk-up building to be respectful to the context of the neighborhood. And we think that the design is really great um, and will offer homeowners a chance to live in a great building that also looks like the existing context in the neighborhood. Okay, do you wanna take questions? Yes, we're ready for questions. Then. Thank you. Can you, can you see if um, Cynthia Francis is in the audience? who you're asking the madam ambassador can take a look are there any questions from the board no just i think it's terrific to be a uh, affordable home ownership project we don't see those too often um and uh the fact that they're uh net zero is also terrific so i applaud the development i know it went through an extensive article 80 process thank you uh, question, question to you, Madam Chair. Um, this yes, and this oh, one and the next one are both compared, are actually companion cases. Should I be? Yes. This, the next one into the record so that we just take a vote on both of them at the same time? Yes. With that being said, uh, this 142, 114 to 122 Harvard Street is a companion case to. Case BOA 1473831 with the address of 18 to 24 Stanford. And the applicants have spoken uh, on that. Um, we, have a, we have a few comments, questions uh, from BTD and uh, the Mayor's Commission on disability that I'd like to ask the applicant. Okay, go ahead. From B from the Boston Transportation Department, they suggest that uh, the installation of a handicapped parking space, is that something that uh, 
Um, yes, we do have handicap parking spaces available in the site plan. Okay. Um, from the architectural access specialist, uh, their comment is the building has only for um, 114 Harvard. The building has only one accessible residential entrance and it is through the parking lot. At least one of the sidewalk entrances should be made accessible and they would need to seek a variant with the mayor um, access uh, mayor's commission to person the facility if they do not plan to make all the entrances accessible. Any comments to that? Yes, there are in fact two accessible entrances, one off of Harvard Street that leads into the main residential lobby, which comes in um, on a small ramp off grade, and then also the ramp from the larger grade change down to the parking. Okay. Um, thank you, Matt. Thank you for your responses, and, and thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other yeah. questions from the board? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, also, I agree with Ms. Pinado. This is really good to see 22 uh, affordable or income restricted home ownership opportunities. So thank you for that. And the question is, for the 22 units, you have eight parking spaces. So if you can quickly tell us what is the plan to allocate those eight parking spaces for the 22 units. Um, I'll go ahead and clarify the 22 units is across both sites. Okay. At this site at 114 Harvard Street, we have 16 units. And so we have eight um, parking spaces available. So there are two options that we could take with the condominium association. You can go to first come first serve or often what we do on projects like this is we'll, we can offer a lottery where you can enter into the lottery every year and then we kind of exchange so if you've won the lottery the previous year before so that people can have a different chance at when they get access to the parking spaces and have them reserved for themselves for the year. So is the parking free of cost or residents will have to pay for the parking? The parking is free of cost. Okay, thank you. And Giovanni, one other thing, the six unit building that is down Standish, the second part of this overall project has three parking spaces of its own. So there's a total of 11 parking spaces for a total of 22 condominium units. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I take public testimony? Um, morning again, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, Ashley Gomes again from the Neighbors Office of Neighborhood Services. Um, again, the BPDA held a meeting for both of these projects back in April. Um, great attendance of um, support from the community, also support from the Neighborhood um, Civic Association Travel Hub of Triangle. With that, we defer to the board. Thank you. I'm going to ask the other public officials not to be repetitive <laughs> if you're supporting or in opposition, but I'm going to start with Mr. Ross since you're the PM. Thank you, I won't be, uh, I won't take too long where BPDA is in support. Um, just like Ashley said, um, there was well attendance at the public meeting and um, the general civic associations were in support of this all affordable project. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, as Ashley said, THT gave the support. Additionally, West of Washington Coalition gave the support and with that, the council would like to go on record in support of this project. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, City Council, Roger Michael Flaherty, Council Bill Record Support. No raised hands at the moment. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I would like to put forward a motion to approve the project. Madam Chair, thank you, Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Barbaraza. Oh, she recused herself, my bad. Uh, Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll be moving ahead um, to case BOA 1446767 with the address of 340 West 2nd Street is the applicant and or the representative president. Yes, Mr. Stembridge, thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is George Moranzi. I'm an attorney with a business address of 350 West Broadway, South Boston. 
Uh, Madam Chair, members, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible about this, uh, but I will start to summarize uh, in that everything I'm about to describe is completely as built, uh, and it's been built for a number of years, uh, but there was uh, some, uh, I won't say mix ups, but um, a lot of paperwork was not exactly properly uh, categorized and filed. It was during the time of the pandemic. Uh, when this building uh, completed construction and uh, was issued its final certificate of occupancy. The project was approved in March of 2014 for 29 units with 43 garage parking spaces. There was then litigation with an abutting condo association, uh, which was settled in 2016. Uh, my client at the time, uh, who got the building approved, sold the project to another client of mine, uh, Ryan Connolly, who subsequently completed construction and received the building certificate of occupancy in 2020. Uh, in 2018, uh, while construction was ongoing, Mr. Connolly sought to increase the amount of parking in the garage from 43 to 51 spaces by introducing some additional vehicle stackers. Uh, a board final arbiter hearing was conducted in January of 2018. Shortly before that hearing, my client added an additional stacker system to the plan to bring the parking spaces up to 70. Uh, this was before the era when updated plans had to be first submitted to ISD before they could be reviewed by the ZBA. Uh, the Board of Appeal, acting in its board final auditor capacity, improved the increase in parking to 70 spaces on January 30th of 2018. Um, after approval, uh, the BPDA raised objections to the amount of parking uh, and the additional stacker systems and revised the parking down to 54 spaces. Uh, exceeding the 43 originally approved by the board, but less than the 70 approved the board final auditor. One of the things that we're seeking to do today is to confirm for ISD, clarify the paperwork, since this was again done as board final auditor prior to the pandemic, that the number of parking spaces in the garage is 54. That is an existing condition as built. Additionally, uh, during construction, the workers built two rooftop penthouses or head houses for the building's two common stairways leading to and from the roof, which is an occupied roof. This still exceeds, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, at, at the time when these two penthouses were built, uh, again, this was construction essentially around the time of the pandemic when building inspectors were not visiting buildings. Uh, because of the state building codes requirements for a common stairway leading from the ground uh, level to the roof, discharging into a penthouse for all buildings of four or more stories with an occupied roof, and the same for all buildings containing roof-mounted elevator equipment. Uh, the workers uh, completed those two common stairways leading to the roof and erected two penthouses instead of one. Um, as I said, the field inspections at this time were not really being uh, conducted. Uh, this wasn't noted until my architect filed plans at the request of ISD to uh, show the garage parking layout to confirm that 54 number of parking spaces for the uh, certificate of occupancy. At that time, my uh, client's architect called out that second rooftop penthouse, which again has been, been built for the past three or four years. Um, ISD then uh, set, issued the uh, current refusal letter on the amended application. Uh, and what we're then therefore thinking to do is to sort of clean up the paperwork and to reflect the addition of the second common headhouse in the correct number of parking spaces. So uh, there's no reduction actually in the number of parking spaces. Again, it's a housekeeping matter. And uh, the existing penthouse, uh, the new penthouse is shown on the plan isn't proposed, uh, that was built uh, at the time that, uh, that the building was uh, underwent construction, received final inspections, and certificate of occupancy uh, about three years ago. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll pause and, and take any questions. Okay, are there questions from the board? Madam Chair, I do have a question. The, the first um, penthouse that was uh, approved by the prior ZBA board, Yes, that, that, that's correct. Uh, Ms. So, uh, it, so at the end, it's, it's not really clearing up paperwork. It's, it's, um, it's allowing you to continue 
with having a second penthouse that was not prior, priorly approved. Uh, that's correct, and by, by clearing up the paperwork, I don't mean to suggest that, 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 to try to minimize this, but what I am suggesting is that the building actually underwent final inspection, certificate of occupancy, uh, so it wasn't noted at the time. Again, the assumption was because these were two internal common stairways leading to an occupied roof with building uh, mechanicals, elevator mechanicals, um, like the, the, the workers uh, did erect that additional cost. Right, but typically your, typically your architect is on site um, through the construction process. I, I agree, and I again, I'm not trying to make excuses, but it was, uh, you know, it was essentially during uh, during COVID. I mean, this went to the board, board final arbiter in January of 18, but construction didn't start and was ongoing, you know, into 2020. And as soon as you know the architect was asked by ISD to submit the amend application for the parking, he included the penthouse. At that time, the new plans examiner called out the penthouse and, and that's why um, my client was asked to revise the plans as you can see the new penthouse is clouded and to clarify that it is in fact a new penthouse. It is built and it has been built and it's been there uh, again for at this point approximately three years. And it's centrally located, you know, fairly centrally located in the building, not visible from the street. And uh, we, uh, of course, uh, a lot of the mayor's office speech community process, but uh, the neighborhood was quiet describing the process. There was only one neighbor uh, who uh, did have a concern and it had to do with the parking rather than the penthouse. So I admit uh, less than ideal that an additional common uh, headhouse was constructed, but it wasn't done so uh, to intentionally subvert the code or the, or the zoning board appeal or the BBDA. I, I, I would, thank you. I, I think I would just encourage the owner to ensure that the architect is engaged throughout the construction administration process so this doesn't happen again. It's understood, and, okay. and again, Thank not you. making any excuses, but the architect is retired, uh, it's Niall Stuckman, and uh, Niall, believe it or not, was actually retired at the time that this building went into construction. Niall retired about the same time. So again, not an excuse, but a mitigating factor. And Niles has actually still been working on this and volunteered to log into this hearing today from, uh, from retirement, but I, I advised him that uh, not to do that. All right, thanks for the explanation. Good call. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Last year, we have uh, comments from the transportation department. I think Mr. Benico is, uh, he's not here, right? Do you want to read it? Yes, he is uh, recommending for the proponent to that handicapped spaces should be uh, four and to install four electric charging stations. Mr. Marinci? Uh, again, uh, it's not new construction. The building's built. The parking spaces in the garage are all accounted for, unfortunately. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, can I have public testimony? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. 340 West 2nd Street was approved by the board in 2014. To make the community aware of this new amendment, we had the proponent flyer every address within 300 feet. Two residents then had questions with the, which the proponent answered. We are aware of no other concerns. At this time, we'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam of the Chair, members of the board, Anna Calderon from Council President Flynn's office. The councilor would like to go on record in support as we have heard no concerns from our voters on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, City Council Vice Michael Flaherty, knowing of no uh, known opposition, the council is on record in support. Thank you. Hi, Camille, you're looking at this one? Hi, yes, uh, my name is Camille Platt. I'm the project manager with the BPDA for 340 West 2nd Street. Um, as George had mentioned, in July of 2017, they filed a small project change to change uh, the programming of the project, um, and the BPDA board saw and approved this change in August of 2017. So speaking in support. Thank you. Thank you. No additional words, stands. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval. Second. I have a second. Thank you. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Betterbraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Uh, Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? 
Yes. Chair also votes yes, motion carries. Thank you. So we're gonna take a break after the next uh, the next one, Mr. Stumbridge. Sounds good. Uh, and with that, we'll, for the last case of this time frame, which is BOA 1456430, with the address of 119 Addison Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Richard Linz with the business address of 245 Sumner Street, East Boston, on behalf of the petitioner, DCM Realty, LLC. Um, if we could advance this, uh, Madam Ambassador, to slide five, that's probably a good place to start. Um, by way of very brief history uh, for this project, Madam Chair, um, this project was built uh, and approved under the prior zoning that uh, allowed for executive suites to exist in the city of Boston as a matter of right. Uh, I believe based upon my analysis, I could be wrong, but this may be the last actual building built as of right uh, for executive suites, which I believe this board understands permits short-term rentals uh, for, uh, for a property that is zoned appropriately uh, for executive suites. Uh, there are a total of nine units. It was built completely as of right, both dimensionally uh, and with respect to parking. Uh, this is in the uh, McCullen Highway EDA, which stands for Economic Development Area. Uh, ironically, even though the surrounding context of this neighborhood uh, does permit uh, does contain residential homes, uh, residential uses are currently forbidden uh, in the EDA. Uh, our proposal here today, uh, in recognition certainly of the city's uh, policy and shift to move away from uh, short-term rental and executive suites and provide opportunities for home ownership, uh, we could change the legal occupancy of this building from nine executive suites to nine residential units, uh, permitting the owner uh, to then create nine home ownership opportunities. Uh, this was before the prior board uh, back in 2021. Uh, the board at the time had denied that uh, request. Uh, however, we believe that in the interest of uh, creating additional home ownership opportunities, uh, and since that last time the board denied this, uh, we've also agreed to voluntarily include one uh, unit restricted IDP. There is no requirement currently for this building uh, to include any IDP units, so we would be doing that on a voluntary basis for one of the units. The only relief that is necessary, we are not proposing any work with respect to this building, it is an existing structure. Uh, the only relief that would be required uh, would be use uh, to allow for multifamily residential. Uh, there are no other dimensional uh, issues with respect to the property. Uh, we do propose a total of 10 parking spaces, which would be existing on site. Um, and uh, for, for all intents and purposes, everything else uh, remains the same with respect to this building, other than the fact that people will actually be able to own a residential unit in this building versus this uh, remaining as transient uh, short-term rental housing uh, only. So I believe this uh, certainly represents the direction in which the city wants to go with respect to short-term rentals uh, and certainly allows for uh, nine additional uh, residential homeownership opportunities in the community. Uh, we can slide down to uh, slide six, which just shows the typical floor plan. Uh, it's a mix of one and two bedroom units. Uh, actually, slide seven, I apologize. Um, it shows a uh, slide eight. I'm sorry, one more. Yeah, it's a mix of one and two bedroom units. Uh, this building does is serviced by an elevator, so uh, it does allow for uh, persons uh, with accessibility requirements to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, occupy a unit. Uh, we do have a ground level only parking, uh, as well as the uh, building amenities that we located in the garage space. Uh, I'll pause there and answer any questions. As I mentioned, uh, this does not involve any work to the building itself. It's merely a change of the legal use and occupancy from uh, short-term rental executive suites to residential for home ownership. Thank you, Mr. Lins. Any questions from the board? So has the housing agreement been executed for the IDP unit? Uh, not at this time through the chair. Um, that would be done prior to the issuance of the building permit, my understanding is, and I believe the BPDA's recommendation reflects that as well. And that's typically how we handle it uh, with voluntary IDP. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Hearing none, let's go to public testimony. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time the Mayor's Office like to defer to the judgment of this board. Some back, background information on the community process. 
our office hosts an abutters meeting on April 13th of this year. Uh, two abutters were in attendance who expressed uh, opposition to the proposal. Um, they felt mistrustful of, of what they feel was um, always an attempt to go from executive suites to, um, to residential units. Um, we didn't hear further comments from that. Um, we also know that the applicant was in touch with the local civic association as well. That information will defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Sebastian Parra from Councilor Coletta's office. And 119, 121 Addison Street project was built as of right executive suites. And, and then attorney Lynn's presented to Harvard Neighborhood Association and presenting for the change from executive suites um, to residential units. And this uh, was voted on uh, with three in favor, 33 in opposition. And because of this and because of the community uh, voicing out their opposition, the council would like to oppose this project as well. Thank you. Thanks. ES, are you looking to give testimony? See your hand is raised. No, I'm sorry. I'm just going on for the one o'clock. I can't lower my hand. Thank oh, you. No worries. I have no additional raised hands, Madam Chair. May I respond briefly, Madam Chair, to the um, yes, sir. Council. Yeah. So again, a um, couple of issues here. Um, this uh, area, this neighborhood, is predominantly residential. Um, ironically, residential use is the only use that is forbidden in this district. Um, there is a long history behind this site. Uh, my client did acquire it with the intent to develop it. Uh, at the time, there was opposition to any type of residential development. Uh, he did uh, proceed with, as suggested, uh, with what he was permitted to do as a matter of right at that time. Uh, and again, that was prior to the Zoning Commission and the city's shift in policy with respect to executive suites. Uh, there is an ongoing planning process in East Boston currently. I believe this neighborhood will actually be rezoned to multifamily residential in the future. Um, and I believe the BPDA's recommendation with respect to the change of occupancy uh, confirms that this is consistent with planning Boston's objectives and goals. I'm kind of surprised uh, to hear opposition from um, uh, certainly the counselor where we're offering an IDP unit voluntarily based upon uh, the proposal to change this to residential housing. Uh, certainly the need for affordable units in the, in the city of Boston um, you know, it's important. Uh, my client recognized that, and we certainly recognize the importance of being able to create homeownership opportunity and willing to offer one of those as IDP when we're not required to do so. Thank you. With that, may I have a motion? Um, I'll, 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 I'll put forward a motion to approve with a proviso that a, the housing agreement be finalized prior to the issuance of a building permit and. And that's yeah. it. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Sandridge? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Barbarazzo? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Uh, let's take a two minute break. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Mr. Stembridge? Present. Ms. Bedabraza? Present. Mr. Shepard? Present. Mr. Valencia? Present. Ms. Panado? Present. Mr. Collins? Present. Okay, floor is yours, Mr. Stembridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we'll proceed to the recommendation scheduled for 1130. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, I'm just gonna interrupt really quick. Yes. Just to remind the board that we did receive a request uh, to be heard to, for the full board in regards to the subcommittee case for the address of 12 Amherst Street. Um, as this is a subcommittee recommendation, the board may vote to approve this recommendation or make a new vote to defer it to a later date. Um, at this time, I'll pass it over to Secretary Stembridge. Thank you. Uh, that case being case BOA 143 1753 with the address of 12 Amherst Street is the one that Javier. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, bear with me out here. Uh, going back to the beginning of the recommendation, uh, this first one being for case BOA 1. I'll read the subcommittee's um, decision and then we'll vote on the media. Uh, case BOA 1019280 with the address of 10 to 12 Ben Bentham Road, the, um, the the proposal was approved uh, with the proviso at one parking space. Oh. Uh, give me one second, Madam Chair. Here. Right there. Uh, here. Uh, there you go. I apologize, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to apologize. Mm -hmm. I apologize. <laughs> um, okay. Starting from the right. Point this time, case BOA 146901, the address of 44 Brook Street. Proposal was approved. Case BOA 1416327, the address of 964 Saratoga Street was approved. Case BOA 14808, with the address of 500 Boylston Street was approved. Case BOA 1480839, the address being 2 Park Plaza, was approved. Case BOA 1447530, with the address of 1250 Boylston Street, was approved. Case BOA 146752 with the address of 10 St. Margaret Street was approved with BPDA design review. Case BOA 1399573 with the address of 16 Holborn Street was approved with no building code, with no building code really. Case BOA 139 9546 with the address of 45 Winthrop Street. The case was deferred until August 8th. Case BOA 146100, the address of 86 Grampian Way was approved with BPDA design review. Case BOA 1019280, at the address of 10 to 12 Benton Road, was approved with provided for one parking space only. Case BOA 1436951, at the address of 10 to 10A Watt Hill Street, was approved. Case BOA 147. 2867 at the address of 210 Rosendale Avenue was approved. Case BOA 147 1763 
the address of 247 Borough Street, was of prison. Case VOA 1440414 at 89 Borough Street Avenue, was of prison. Case VOA 1431753 with the address of 12 Amber Street, originally was denied. As Javier mentioned, this was the one that um, they, they requested of, of hearing by the full board. Um, with that, with that, we'll just move on right now to case DOA 1433. Three, four, three. The address of 141 Oldberg Avenue was approved with the Friday of the Board of Review Design Committee. Of the three discussions at 5 p.m. at 5 p.m. subcommittee here, case BOA 141246 with the address of 36 G Street was denied without prejudice. Case BOA 145701, the address is 33 to 35 Shaw Street, was approved with no building code. And that brings, that brings us to the end. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Can I have a motion? Or more than one? I'm sure I would like to put forward a motion to approve all the recommendations from the subcommittee. Second. OK. Mr. Stambridge? Yes. Ms. Barraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Valencia? Mr. Yes. Valencia? <laughs> yes. Ms. Mott? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. So. <laughs> Javier, do you suggest this case and then the uh, 1 p.m.? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, time permitting, I suggest one or two cases. Uh, that we would have to skip to the 1 p.m. The case after this is Article 80, so I'm going to say this case, and then unless you think, unless we cannot start before 1 p.m. I yes, I agree, Madam Chair. Oh, okay, thank you. With that, we move on to the discussion for 11:30. We have case BOA 139386 with the address of 75 Maywood Street, um, which we received a note that um, they were requesting a referral uh, if the applicant is present and speak to that, uh, the applicant who is a representative. Um, because for the dates we'll have for it at this point are uh, September 26th or, or October 17th. Um, but again, the applicant is, is present to speak to that. Is the applicant for 75 Maywood on? There is a raised hand here, one second. Okay. Is that, Thank you. Is this Samsung S7? Sending a request on you. Hello, how are you doing? Good afternoon. Yes, I'm uh, the applicant for 75 Maywood Street. Okay, can you could you identify yourself and your address and please let us know what you're seeking relief for? My name is Clayton Weston. I'm uh, uh, I live at 17 Savage Street in Roxbury. Uh, I'm seeking uh, a deferral as I'm still waiting for the updated refusal letter. This is for 75 Maywood. Correct. Okay, uh, with that, may I have a motion? Motion to approve the deferral. Uh, can I have a second? Second. second. Mr. Stembridge? Uh, yes. Ms. Barraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. 
Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Do you have a date, Javier? Yes, uh, September 26th. Okay. Well, in that case, next case. Thank you. Next case is a BOA 1319563. The address being 1 to 3 Elmwood Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mark Lacasse, Lacasse Law 75 Arlington Street in Boston, attorney for the uh, proponent, and with me as well is Minku Kang, our project manager from Westwork, and Katie Faulkner, the architect, also from Westwork. Um, today is before you a project which has been approved by the BPDA under Article 80, Small Project Review, following a 30-month community review process. Uh, next slide. Uh, the project program highlights are that it's a 40 rental unit building, one of which will be occupied by the Webster family, the proponents of the project. Um, previously, it had been 47 units, but through the community review process was reduced to 40 units. Um, it has been approved by the BPDA board pursuant to the compact unit living policy. There are 22 studios and 10 one bedroom units that are um, consistent with the compact unit living policy. And then there are eight standard size two bedroom units. On the ground floor, there's a commercial retail space. And because the building is um, proposed under the compact unit policy, there are additional tenant amenities, including uh, ample bike storage, co-working area, a gym, flexible rooms, and a common roof deck. Um, the community benefits package under the Article 80 approval includes seven IDP units, which is 18% of the total proposed, uh, numerous public realm improvements, including a sidewalk expansion, new trees, landscape plan, bike parking, street furniture, and improved accessibility. There's a strong sustainability commitment that uh, the architect can tell you more about, but the building is designed to passive house standards, including low carbon materials such as cross laminated timber. There's a blue bike share contribution and other contributions to community groups. Next slide, please. Project proponents are pictured here. Um, Scott Webster and his two sons, Joe and Sean, have resided at this property for many generations. Um, and are going to retain ownership of the property and are going to live in the building as well. Um, the picture on the lower left is showing the existing property, um, the red house with the storefront uh, location in the front, and in the background you can see the Islamic Cultural Center, um, and in terms of the next slide please, the planning context and the programming um, elements. I'll turn it over to Min Ku Kang and Katie Faulkner uh, to walk you through the balance of the presentation. Thank you. Um, hello, Madam Chair and the members of the board. My name is Min Ku Kang. I'm the development manager representing Mr. Scott Webster with an office address at 103 Terrace Street, uh, Mission Hill, MA 02120. I'm happy to uh, give a quick overview of the project context. Uh, to start with, the project was transit-oriented development. The project site is within three minutes of walking distance from the Roxbury Crossing Orange Line T station and other bus stops that uh, connects people to the Boston downtown more than 10 minutes. Next slide, please. There is currently a three-story building that contains a single-family home and a corner restaurant where the Scott family has resided for over 30 years. Next slide, please. Um, we believe it is an appropriate location to add density. The site is within the community uh, college zoning subdistrict. We are neighbors with the Roxbury Community College and the mosque um, that has building heights of 60 feet, 89 feet, and 130 feet. Uh, with other five, six, and seven story buildings in the neighborhood that's highlighted in this map, we believe our proposed 69 feet building fits well within the neighborhood context. Next slide, please. Uh, given that the site is also on the bottom of Fort Hill, we believe the added density of our site uh, will have less impact on the residential side of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. 
Our site is right behind Route 28 and also next to uh, the map on next street. Uh, next slide, please. Our site is the only ad residential address on Elmwood Street. Next slide, please. And it is surrounded by abundant open space. As you can see, um, as you can see on the side on the side panel on your net, on your left. Sorry, um, all the areas marked in green are landscapes with grass and trees. Next slide, please. And also right in front of the site, uh, there is a public plaza um, in the Rossford Community College campus, which again um, helps adding to the idea of more density to the site. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the community benefits, uh, we would like to activate this area by investing in improving the sidewalk. There were updates last year um, that added uh, accessible ramps, as you can see uh, with, from photos on the slide. Next slide, please. We would like to take this work further uh, by extending the sidewalk width and adding more green space with 46 new trees, a seating area that will work well with our post corner commercial space, and also improving the safety and accessibility by reorienting the crosswalks uh, and the streets. Uh, this design has been reviewed and confirmed by EPDA, and it is further subject to be improved uh, throughout the uh, building permit process. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, I will pass it to Katie Fowler, who is our architect, to walk us through the building design. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. We're very excited to be doing this project with the Webster family. Uh, this project is a seven-story building, as you know. Uh, the, um, of the many improvements here are ground floor amenities, and we think that that will actually calm a somewhat very busy corner. This is at the kind of edge of the uh, Highland Park neighborhood where it comes down against Roxbury Community College. And so by putting um, some neighborhood amenities cafe as well as shared space for the residents. We're hoping to uh, increase the pedestrian activity here. And we certainly will be doing that with the added green space. You can see this is a tight and busy site and among the relief that is being thought here is the the rear yard uh, 20 foot setback, we don't have that. Uh, again, this site is not a densely, thickly settled residential site, but it actually is on the edge of this community college zone. So if there is an appropriate place to increase this kind of density and height, we believe that, that this would be the place. Uh, next, floor, next slide, please. This is the basement floor. This is some of the amenities that Mark referred to. There is a bike room, there's a gym for the residents, there's some shared and flexible space, and then there is a possible lower level for that corner cafe uh, if that works out for the tenant. Next slide, please. One of the things that we're most excited about this is that this latest for mass timber construction. We received a design grant to help us work through some of the details on this. Uh, so in addition to being built to passive house standards, it is also slated to be type four construction uh, mass timber. So we're really pleased about that. It is a mix of units. We have compact studio units with Murphy beds. We also have one bedrooms and we also have two bedrooms. We've done a number of energy models and solar studies to try to make mitigate against the heat gain, so it's a very sustainably designed building, not only in the materials and the systems, but also in the building's form. Floors two through seven essentially have this identical footprint. Next slide, please. But one of the things that's extremely exciting about this is it's rental housing and it's owner occupied, which is a really the best of both worlds for the Websters to be developing their own property after having lived here for decades. And then staying in the property is something that we're very proud to be a part of. They will occupy a two story, two bedroom unit on floors six and seven. Next slide, please. Keep going, that's the upper level. And then finally, this is the roof deck, and uh, it's also the Shiva mechanical space. There is reserved for solar panels. The, the building will be designed as solar ready, and should budget allow, it will be outfitted with, with solar panels. Next slide, please. Oh, we went through a historic review process and made some redesigns in the early spring, among them looking at the massing of the context buildings, setting a stronger base and a more defined top, so for sort of a or bottom middle top. Again, uh, we think this is very in keeping with this edge neighborhood that is both at the foothills of a beautiful residential neighborhood that uh, has a 
variety of 19th, 20th, and 21st century housing, as well as, again, being located on the very busy commercial strip of Columbus. It is a walking distance to both the Roxbury Crossing T-Stop and the Nubian Square uh, bus depot. So uh, we think it, it is also appropriately masked for, for both of those types of commercial and residential districts. Next. Again, very slight modifications, but again, looking at the material and trying to draw from some of the examples, making the windows appear more double hung so that they would fit in more with some of the housing, but keeping the aspect or the, the ratio that um, matches the Roxbury Community College District, as well as using the masonry materials so that we can tie into both the historic as well as the, the new, newer buildings of the college. Next. Again, we talked earlier about the massing and the sun studies and why it is modeled the way that it is, so I won't bring you through here. Uh, some views from the neighborhood. And then the final slide, which is the next slide, is to just return to one that Minku mentioned earlier, which is that we understand that there is a densely, thickly settled historic neighborhood just up the hill. We occupy what we think of as a transit edge district. Uh, it's very walkable. It does not have parking. That is another relief that we're asking for. It is extremely convenient to a number of amenities in terms of grocery, transit, and green space. And again, we're extremely thrilled to be, have, be part of the project. Thank you so much for your time. Are there questions from the board? Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to turn it over to public testimony. Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Keisha Santana with the Mayor's Office and Neighborhood Services. Um, this project went through the BPA community engagement process, um, but our office was reached out to by the Highland Park Neighborhood Coalition along with the Roxbury Neighborhood Council, where they submitted a letter of opposition with signatures from the voters stating that this project was Senate President. Um, they feel it's not matched the neighborhood due to the size of the units and the rent prices. Um, they feel this will open a door and attract student housing and want development in the area to focus on the current residents of Roxbury. The John L.A. Square Neighborhood Association is in support of this project due to the Webster's family involvement community and wants to support local black development. And at this point, we would like to defer the judgment to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ross from BPDA. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair um, and members of the board. The BPDA held two public meetings for this project in April of 2022 and January 2023. Both were well attended, advertised in the local newspaper. The proponent also met with uh, the Roxbury Neighborhood Council um, on October 27th of 2022 and the Highland Park Neighborhood Co Coalition. Both were in opposition of the project. The project did receive support from John Elliott Square Neighborhood Association, um, several abutters on Roxbury Street. Um, the project also received support from um, City Councilor Julia Mejia. And um, furthermore, the project had an advisory body um, meeting with the Highland Park neighbor, uh, Highland Park Conservation District, excuse me. Um, the project did uh, receive lots of opposition from um, the Highland Park neighborhood and some of the um, community members in that neighborhood. Um, but the BPA does support um, the project. Thank you. So I'm sorry, Mr. Ross, can you elaborate on why the BPA supports it? Why it approved it? So yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I believe it fits the overall kind of context of the neighborhood as Minkush um, showed, um, as well as its um, close proximity to transit. Um, it is a transit-oriented development. Um, it provides well-needed housing. They are um, well above the um, IDP um, commitment at 13%. They're at 18%. Um, this is also a minority-owned um, development, um, and they will be staying in the, the development once it's built. Um, so that um, speaks to the case of equity here uh, as well. Um, and yeah, those are some of the, the reasons why the BPDA is in support of the project, as well as its des design and um, its uh, commitments to sustainability as it is also passive house development. Thank you. Yeah. In regards to the community process, uh, Mr. Ross, would you say that the BPDA was able to mitigate some of the concerns or was there like 
What, what was the overall kind of community feedback consensus? Yeah, the, in, I'd say I, or or an opposition or in between. Op, I'd say um, in between. Um, there were definitely a lot of very vocal voices that were in, are in opposition, um, but um, for the, the developer tried their best to um, work with the community um, and listen to their concerns. Um, the community just never came around. Some of the community members never came around um, on that support, although the project did develop um, some from their um, kind of comments. That's why I went from 47 units to 40 because um, during one of the first public meetings there was an issue about density so the project proponent tried to um, lower um, the amount of units they had. Um, there was a concern about um, the unit sizes and it being a quasi-dorm so the proponent added um, two bedroom units in the project. Um, so there were several things that the proponent tried to do to work with um, the community and some of their concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Councilor Rowe's office. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Jordan here from Councilor Ricardo Royal's office. Do you think our record in opposition of this? Thank you. Okay, yeah, Jessica. Okay, any other official office? Councilor Fernandez? No. Okay, I'll go to public testimony. I'll start with um, Visit Nubian Square, which is asked there's a few folks that are have their raised hands, have been, sorry, their hands raised. So if you can briefly give us your name and address and tell us if you're in support or opposition um, and, and try not to read off a, yeah, a letter, it would be extremely helpful so that we can uh, hear all the voices here. Visit Nubian Square. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning to Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Mohammed. I'm calling in on support of the uh, One Elmwood Street, uh, the Scott and the Webster family have been in support of the Roxbury community development, uh, as well as our community mentorship and, and really preservation of our, of, our community, uh, of our local community. They've also supported our farmer's market, which has recently been uh, launched in Newton Square. And they've really been an, an institution and, and also supporters of things that are really happening in our local community. And we are definitely in support of the One Elm Street project, as well as the Islamic community of Boston. We are also in support of this project, and we look forward to seeing the development and seeing the future of it grow. And okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Fernandez, one second. Everyone's hand here. Okay. Oh, you're muted. Go ahead, Councilor. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, members of the board. I um, have received a lot, uh, my office has received a lot of opposition and uh, letters of support on this uh, project, but it's, uh, it's come up to maybe about 41 letters of support on this project and about an overwhelming over 300 signatures of opposition on this project. Highland Park is in, is in opposition. Um, the developers have reported that Reclaim Roxbury at one point was in support, but I have never received a letter from them. I also received a letter from the developers state claiming that it's a letter from the um, commercial tenant, um, but the commercial tenant then contacted me and said that they had not complied with um, the agreements within the letter. Um, it sounds like a good project if maybe if it was if it was less dense the project is way too dense and violates um zoning code and they have not proven um that they actually absolutely need to be able to override this so i, I am going on record in opposition and uh also stating that um the garrison trotter neighborhood has uh, sent me letters in opposition the roxbury um neighborhood council has sent me a let letters in opposition uh, Roxbury Path Forward send me letters in opposition. So just overwhelming um, letters stating that this is way too dense and it needs to return to community um, community process for further, um, I guess, conversations uh, as to how to uh, get to some sort of common ground on this project. Unfortunately, um, I will not be able to support this. Thank you. Um, Rodney, Big Elton. Hello, uh, my name is Rodney Singleton. I live at 44 Sear Street in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I am coming out in opposition to this. Um, the, the proponent has not demonstrated it, sorry, not demonstrated at all that it, it is, uh, um, needs the, the, the variance uh, 
uh, to actually have this much density. So in other words, they, you know, usually it, 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 uh, you make the point that um, it needs to be dense and there's some kind of hardship. They haven't demonstrated this at all. And shame on the BRA for, for sort of green lighting this in a way that it just causes more gentrification in the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, this is it Nubian Square. Do we hear from you? Do we hear from you called on. You called on them already. Uh, um, yeah, I spoke about it. Okay, Holly Shepherd and then Ina Fox. If you can briefly let us know. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Holly. This is Holly Shepherd of 45 Hawthorne Street. I'm speaking as the chair of the Highland Park Neighborhood Coalition, which um, was against this project opposing it uh, with a vote 27 to 3. Um, while the neighborhood is in support of the Webster's building on their property, which is typically would be zoned for two or three units, they have proposed an outrageous number of units from the community's perspective with excessive occupation to lot size ratio. Additionally, residents felt that approving such a project would set a de facto student housing precedent. Uh, precedent. <laughs> okay, Ina Fox and then Black Market Nubian. Yes, hi, this is Ina Fox. I live at Romar Terrace in the Highland Park neighborhood. And actually, the other speakers before me, I'm opposed to this, have pretty much covered the points. Mm -hmm. um, I must say that even though it's right near, it is near a busy corner, that corner where the building would be Elmer, Elmwood Street and Roxbury Street is actually still a quiet residential. That building, I believe, would change that. There's also, even though it is transit oriented, there is no guarantee that people would not have cars and that would be another issue and um yeah and i respect the the webster family i just wish they would come back to the to the discussion table thank you black market nubian hi this is kai and chris grant um and we are longtime Roxbury residents we founded john Elliott square neighborhood association 12 years ago um which is actually the closest a budding neighborhood association. Um, it used to be the center of Roxbury at one point. Um, John Elliott Square Neighborhood Association, uh, it, it dissolved in, in 2023 in January, but we have data that's important to this meeting because we took several votes in April of 2022 and our residents found that the direct abutters didn't have any objection to building the projects um, and that the residents could be young black urban professionals not just students parking which is an issue ongoing in highland park nothing new um, it, it's really null and void because of the station roxbury crossing um, and they're giving business opportunities, the Webster family, um, at the base of their project, in addition to which their owners that would reside and manage the property and give opportunity to black families that reside here in Roxbury to either downsize and buy a condo, or again, give a young black professional the chance to live in Roxbury. Um, I think that the design is efficient it's built for sustainability and we have to consider the fact that highland park neighborhood coalition was in support of this at the very beginning of the community process 30 months ago and all of a sudden there were some difficult communication uh you know just issues that kind of you know i guess snowballed but here we are today and uh, as a long time John Elliott Square neighborhood yes, resident, yes. I think it's important that we address the issue of the wealth gap and give the Websters an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, actually, I'm going to keep going there. Uh, How many more raised hands do you have? Two, one, two. Well, it's nine. <laughs> um, we'll do three. I think we were getting a, a sense of. Uh, feedback so yeah let's do three more and and, and we'll go from there okay 21 kennelworth i know you probably need director but i just sent a request on you can you briefly tell us the answer for our opposition 
Yes, yeah, Skyler Red, 21 Kenilworth Street of the Highland Park neighborhood. I am writing this, or I'm looking to voice concern and opposition to this project. Um, it's seven stories, the 40 unit dormitory type building. Um, we'll go from 531 square feet to 34,000 square feet. I think that if it's approved, it will set a new standard for development, um, allowing these large scale buildings to. Uh, to just run rampant across uh, Roxbury. I think the current uh, floor to area ratio is uh, is a two, could increase to 6.26, and the allowable height was, is, used, is uh, I believe it's 45 feet, and that would go to 69.7 feet. Um, Please add more uh, information. Excuse me? Please add new information. How do I do that? Say something different than what previous folks have said as to why you oppose. Okay. Um, I just think that these projects have the potential to create a new student central to this corner of Highland Park and push out more rock programs. All right, thank you. KP. My name is Kate Phelps. I'm a co-secretary of the Highland Park Neighborhood Coalition. And my new information is that this concept of a community process has been really abused. The John Elliott Square Neighborhood Association is now defunct. Even when it was active, they had a vote of nine in favor and four against, hardly a huge sway of the neighborhood. We've had over, <clears throat> uh, oh, I don't have the exact count of our petition, but it's well over 200. And our first meeting with the family who own this property, we were absolutely in support of them building black wealth on their land. We still are. We're asking that they not do it at the expense of the whole community by opening us all up to pro-development profits. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more, all right. the last one. Okay, Joel Diaz. Hey, thank you, thank you for the time. Um, so, my name is Joel Diaz. I am a long-standing member of Roxbury and um, I'm a young professional. Uh, I'm black and Hispanic, and I would love to see this in our neighborhood. Um, I feel like this, uh, <laughs> this is just a chance for growth for the black community. Um, it'll open up a lot of opportunities for uh, people in the area to, uh, you know, um, what is it called? Uh, just, 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 just it's it just it's gonna have the opportunity for people to like uh, do community events there. I know the family is very big in, into community. I just really like to see this as a black professional Thank incident. Thank you. Okay, why, why don't we give the applicants a, a brief opportunity to rebut? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I would just like to um, offer the opportunity to Mr. Scott Webster, who is the proponent and the owner, to just speak very briefly and, and summarize rebuttal and to be the voice of his own project. Scott? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, yeah, I just very quickly, I want to summarize that my family and I, both my two sons and I, uh, are developing this property. Uh, we are fourth generation uh, folks in Roxbury, and I, and I know all of my neighbors. Uh, I think that uh, the most important thing that, uh, that I think the disconnect here is that uh, in our location in the college uh, sub district, uh, we have to come before you for zoning relief for anything at all. If I wanted to change my stare, uh, I would have to do that. Um, so, so that's important to understand. But also, uh, we're in an area at the bottom of the hill, uh, at really at Roxbury Crossing. We're not in the center of Highland Park. We're at the very edge of it. Uh, and what surrounds us is really significant buildings with a great deal of density. And so it fits perfectly there. Uh, you know, folks are concerned about density, but we have all apartments around us there. You know, we don't have two family, you know, and three family houses or single family houses uh, around here. We are transportation sensitive and we're building it to passive standards. Um, and, you know, uh, we think that, uh, 
you know, we understand the fear of, of something new, um, but we're providing much needed housing and, and I should point out affordable housing because these are smaller units, the rent's gonna be smaller compared to other places and we're gonna be marketing to, to either older people who are looking to downsize or younger people who are looking to stay. So, and we're gonna live in the building. So uh, with all of that, uh, we think uh, when it's all said and done, it will be a positive thing for the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any, any other final questions from the board? Yes, Madam Chair, I have a question um, for Mr. Weber. Uh, Webster, Webster. Um, is it is it home ownerships or rental? The rentals. It's rental. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm. You know, we've heard from some of the community members in terms of supporting um, a black developer, um, bringing wealth um, to your family. Um, what What about? Um, you know, have you thought about potentially home ownership, um, uh, or you know, can you just speak on some of the fear that your community members have in terms of being um, displaced with potential increase in rent? And can you also talk about what you're thinking in terms of your your rent, uh, your performance for and for your average unit in terms of monthly rent? Sure, uh, I'll refer to uh, Minko, who is our uh, development manager who has uh, all of the numbers. Uh, but I do want to talk to, uh, we decided to do rental because of, you know, conversations with neighbors about, you know, I, I've got a big house and I want something smaller or young professionals as uh, one of the uh, participants mentioned that want smaller places and and affordable places, not only in terms of the rent, but also in terms of, of utilities. Uh, we're projecting uh, based upon the passive house standards, you know, around $35 uh, per month for a utility, which is heat and air conditioning. Um, and folks can walk out the, uh, out the building and across the street, the street to the T. Um, so we, we think that that works uh, and, you know, we're looking for, for more affordable housing. This is a little outside the box uh, because the units are a little smaller, but uh, it works. Uh, and, you know, we think that that... So affordability that is, to, is to have a decrease in utility bills for potential renters. Can you provide just um, comparison of like, yes. you know, that it is affordable rent um, that your project is promising? Uh, I can add to that. So 80% of our 40 units, so seven units, will be uh, affordable. They are IDP units. So we have increased the affordable rates from 13 to 18%. Um, the, the affordable rents, because some of them are compact living, it will be much even lower than the rest of the same size affordable rents out there. Um, the rest is market rate units. We have uh, 33 market rate units, among which there is a mix of two bedroom, one bedroom, and studio units. And also, um, because of the compact living standard by line, we were able to manage to have the rents uh, under underwritten lower than the new developments. Um, new rental apartments on the Trayma Street side, which is about 10 minutes walk away from our from our building. Um, so we are benefiting from uh, the compact living guideline by providing smaller but much efficient units with with um, advanced smart beds, um, and that will that with also a lot of uh, amenity spaces within the building that will um, ensure livability. Um, so. To your point, our rents are generally much lower than what you see on the same area. Can you and then please we also give have the Fed? I think we want a number. Yes. Some number. Just, like, yeah, like market yeah, sure. rate so, for so, 600. So the yeah. So the market rate now currently on, uh, on the studio side, the, the, the rates that we see now are on, are on 2,600 to 2,800 per unit on the Trayma Street side. The numbers that we're using now are 2,400 per unit on the studio, and those are market rate units for us. I can, I can do more. I mean, for one bedroom okay, minutes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And if I could just expound upon uh, Ms. Bedebrados' question about uh, rental versus ownership. In part, it has to do with the uh, financing partners here. This is not traditional, you know, bank financing. 
Um, the financing is coming from a number of different sources, the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund, the Massachusetts Housing Investment Corporation, and the Conservation Law Foundation. So a lot of their requirements are, are contrary to condo ownership development, um, and that, that has a significant impact on this project's financing. Could I, could I just ask, the, the proponents that they would be living there, the maximum unit sizes you've mentioned are two bedrooms, so you're living in two bedroom units? Yes, we're living in a two bedroom unit. Like separately, or you mean all together? Uh, no, well my wife and I, uh, my two sons, who uh, one lives with me now, one doesn't. Okay. Uh, and they, will, they will not be living, no, no, this is our chance to, to, to shed our kids. Got it. Okay. So, just wanted to understand it. It seemed like a lot of people for two bedroom units. Um, any other final questions from the board? Okay. With that, may I have a motion? I need a motion. Should I will make a motion. This is a transitory development that is uh, providing much needed housing to the city. And with that, I will make a motion to uh, approve the project. Okay, may I have a second? I assume with BPTA design review. With BPTA design review. Is that a second? I'll second. Okay. okay. Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Better Barraza. I'm voting yes because I want to support more passive house construction um, to bring black to bring to bring wealth to black developers. And I think it outweighs some of the community concerns that has been raised. I do see a, a public benefit. Okay, thank you. Mr. Shepard. I second that opinion right there, so yes. Okay, Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. The motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Javier. Uh, since it's 115, I recommend to hear the court remand case out of order and call that into the record. Uh, yes, sir. So court remand, Mr. Stembridge. Court remand, get for 1 p.m. Yep. Is case number DOA 1177912, the address of 82 to 84 Boston Street Court. Okay. The 82 to 84 Boston Street um or ask the applicant the applicant and their representative of the president are uh, available and we, and i will mention madam chair that we have received um support and opportunity for this project well. thank you yes mr secretary madam chair members of the board attorney ryan spitz with adams and Maranti. business address of 168 8th street first floor south boston um, as many of you board members know, this is, has come before uh, this board multiple times, uh, and we're here again uh, presenting. Um, Madam Chair, I'm going to be as brief as possible, but I know some of the board members have not seen this presentation, so I'd like to just go forward uh, through a, a full presentation, but again, I'll be as brief as possible. Please. Um, with me today is Peter McClaria from Media Partners. He's the operator of the billboard, and there are also a few other board members of the Polish Club joining us today. This is a proposal is for a conditional use permit to construct a 14 foot by 48 foot single face digital billboard freestanding pylon to the rear of the property of 82 through 84 Boston Street overlooking Interstate 93, which is owned by the Polish American Citizens Club, a nonprofit organization. We understand and respect the city's position on billboards, but this is a very unique proposal that would also allow to assist in the city's vision of decluttering billboard signs in our residential neighborhoods by committing to remove existing billboard locations from residential neighborhoods in consideration of adding one digital face billboard overlooking Interstate 93. 
a location where billboards should be and not within our neighborhoods. The locations being identified today for removal are the Strand Theater, 543 Columbia Road, and another location on 43 Preble Street. This will remove four faces from our residential neighborhoods. Strand Theater, just a little bit of background, Strand Theater was permitted back in 1918, which had two permits for two sides at approximately 12 feet by 24 feet. And now it currently lies that there is one big sign at 20 feet by 50 feet located on that property. Uh, the Preble Street location, a little bit more history on that, that dates back to 1945, which actually has two signs, both one on the front and in the rear of the property. Um, one thing that I do like to acknowledge, there are legal documents in place uh, here with the owners in the, in, of, of the real estate here, uh, just allowing the terms of these billboards to actually be removed. However, we cannot reveal those terms because those are confidential. Uh, further, what we would like to add is a request for a proviso that a permit shall not issue until the commitments of those locations of those billboards have been taken down. The use is forbidden, which would require the board, the board to grant a conditional use permit. If approved by this board, the proponent would also have to further engage the Conservation Commitment Commission for further review on air right open space, as well as seek the state for approval of outdoor advertising. By way of history, this address is the home of the Polish Club, a nonprofit organization that has been in existence for over 81 years and has been a vital part to this Dorchester community that is referred to as the Polish Triangle. Again, the billboard is located in the rear of the property, overlooking Interstate 93. To the right of the property, there are a couple of abutting parcels on what is known as Rawson Street that are the only residential neighbors to have any sighting of the bill billboard, which is minimal. Uh, the view from their properties would only be the side of the sign and not a head-on view. Given this, the operator has decided to use a new light blocking technology that eliminates any light illumination coming from the billboard to where these properties align. The operator further agrees to add a proviso stating that if this light blocking technology does not function as it's supposed to and as expressed to the neighbors of Rawson Street, then the sign will come down. Further, there will be new plantings added to the rear of the property to further assist the neighbors with air pollution caused by the highway. Lastly, we understand the BPDA's recommendation, and if approved, the operator will comply with all conditional requirements under Article 11, Section 6, but would like to amend the hours of non-operation from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. to 7 a.m. to prevent any distraction during those dark morning hours. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pause for any questions or comments from the board. Thank you, Mr. Spitz. Uh, just to confirm, uh, the three billboards that you're referring to that this would uh, replace, uh, ha um, what's the progress on that? I know at the time you uh, previously some were, you know, already uh, finalized and some were not. Yeah, so all these boards, there, there is actually a written agreement okay. uh, between the operators and the landowners. Uh, but again, we cannot disclose uh, those of actual course. agreements because of the confidentiality terms within those. But those are, and again, that's the reason why we would request in a proviso that unless those three locations are fully taken down, then no permit shall issue for this, for this proposal. Understood. And that was a self-imposed uh, sort of uh, requirement? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, other questions from the board? Well, can we hear from the BPDA and what their recommendation is? That's sort of crucial to our decision making. Mr. Hampton? Are you there, Mr. Hampton? Okay, I'm not sure if he's there and I don't have- Sorry about that, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board, Jeff Hampton, BPDA. Uh, our recommendation for this is denial. Electronic billboards are forbidden outside of those three designated areas in the city where they're conditional uses. Uh, we feel that the, uh, because it is a forbidden use and the location is, an, is inappropriate, uh, we are on the record uh, being against this proposal. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could just respond to uh, Mr. Hampton as well. So uh, again, we, we do appreciate the concerns um, of the BPDA, their recommendation. Uh, we honestly believe that the, the, the reason behind what the BPDA adapted these was to remove these from our neighborhoods. For, this is a location that's going to be overlooking 93, that's not going to be factored into the neighborhood. Uh, with the, you know, the, 
the motto here is that we're going to be removing three locations that are actually within our neighborhoods in the city of Boston. So again, you know, we can respect that, uh, but uh, we we firmly believe that this is a location overlooking 93 where billboards should be placed. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Can you just confirm that the billboard is um, away 660 feet from the highway? Or if not, how close in proximity is it? Correct. And Peter McCleary is, is here with us today that can probably give us a little bit more clarification on those distances as well. Um, Peter, uh, I don't and know. The, the sign itself is going to be um, up against the, the, the wall of the Polish um, Citizens Club. Um, I would say that it's probably 30 or 40 feet from the highway. The 660 feet um question i believe is that the um the federal and state um outdoor advertising rules govern everything from the right of way out to 660 feet so this is this is governed by all the rules and regulations federally and uh, and with the state of massachusetts so right now it it is um it's violating um that correct no, sir. No, ma'am. No. It's not violating the federal highway 660 feet buffer zone. Uh, the, the, the 660 feet is actually um, where all the regulations for the state and the federal agreements come into play. If you're beyond 660 feet, there is no regulation. So there, it, these are, this meets every single regulation of the state and federal um, CMR. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's within all of their guidelines. Great, and Ms. And Ms. Better Peraza, we'll still, if, if it's approved here by this board, we'll still also have to seek state approval for outdoor advertising as well. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that uh, as, a, as a zoning board, we do rely upon the recommendation of the BPDA with regard to this type of signage, that, that it's a federal highway kind of safety rules and regulations. And, um, you know, I, I feel like we, we are really are sort of, it's important that we rely upon the experts who have looked at this carefully and the recommendation of the BPDA. Well, I, I mean, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, um, for the applicant to really outline, you know, why, you know, what special conditions or hardship do you have that you're seeking a variance um, and what's depriving you from reasonable use of that land? You know, that to me, that's more so than, um, than the BPTA's kind of recommendation. Uh, I think we have to. Really well, it's, a, it's, it's forbidden. It's a forbidden use. Correct. Correct. So yeah, it's, I think, it's, it's, I mean, I think I would say as to BPD's recommendation, they generally oppose digital billboards. I mean, billboards in general. So they, they only have certain zones that are, that are allowed. So I wouldn't say this is a, a better or worse recommendation than any other that's a denial. So I, I think let's let's get Ms. Bedebraza's question answered as well. Okay. I can, I can try to address that also. As far as the safety concerns are, are um, that one portion of your, your question or statement, uh, the state conducted probably a four year study on the safety of digital billboards before adopting regulations to govern them. And any, um, any digital billboard that is constructed or permitted um, by the State Office of Outdoor Advertising has a one year trial period where they look at um, traffic uh, crash data from the year prior and traffic, traffic da uh, data from the year of uh, the year after the operation of the billboard. If they find a significant increase, they will have the board remove themselves. I have not seen that yet because on the list of distractions for drivers, digital billboards are actually way down, much below eating cell phones, putting your makeup on, um, and just general distractions of, of, of other sorts of pe talking to people in your car. Um, the other, the, the, the hardship is that there is really no property 
that the Polish uh, club owns, uh, the street um, that is shown, um, that it looks like it's it, it, they park some cars in. It's actually a street that's owned by the city of Boston. It goes nowhere. And the Polish club has been maintaining it now for years. But there can be no outside seating. They have no room in the back. It's a small triangular shaped piece of property. If you put back up the, the survey of the property, there's really, they're so limited in, in what they can do. Um, they, they, you know, they, uh, that little road there is not, is not land that is owned by the uh, Polish American Citizens Club. And even half of the sidewalk is owned by the city of Boston. So they're trying to raise revenue, guaranteed revenue that will act as an annuity for the next 20, 30 years by doing this because you see the small triangle piece in the back that it can't be used for anything. It's, it's, it, it's, 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 there's really no access to it even. Um, Can I actually ask two follow-up questions? One is sure. um, just in terms of the impact on its um, abutters, so it doesn't have an as really effect on the neighboring properties. One is um, I saw that there's windows behind the billboards. Um, is that going to affect the internal use um, of that space because now you're blocking windows? And then the other is, do you have the support of 31? Rolson Street, um, which I see might be the most that might be impacted by the billboard. We have the support of um, 31 Rawson Street. We have the support of two other Rawson, Rawson Street neighbors. Um, uh, we don't have, to our knowledge, we've engaged with Rawson Street and everybody is supportive of this project. As far as the windows are concerned, um, those are windows that are either in the basement of the Polish home, which is not something I'd want to look at either, but um, it's, it's their decision as to this was going to be the most beneficial place to put this. And with the technology that we have on this that can't be changed, it's a manufactured technology, the light will only emanate in certain areas and no one from Rawson Street or any other street, Boston Street, we'll be able to see this sign. Let's see the light from the sign. Uh, but we do have written agreements actually from from some of the neighbors, some of the Rawson Street neighbors who are in support of this and hopefully they will speak today also. Okay, and then you just said for the record, you would remove three signs. Um, you're open to removing three existing signs. Yes, uh, that's, okay, part of this, the, that's part of this whole process. They're, not, we they're, with they're, it. they're doing it, right? Just to be clear, you're doing well, that. They don't, they don't own the signs. Oh, there, there are other owners yeah, we, of these we, signs, we, we have, as I recall. Yeah, but we have agreements with the property owners. These signs are, they're, they're expired leases. So the land was leased by other billboard companies over the years for 60, 70, 80 years but we have agreements to compensate the landlords and you'll hear from, from one of them today, the other one is, is not around to be able to speak, and who's um, agreed to have the Strand uh, billboard sign removed, which is something that from my past of listening to, you know, uh, neighborhood groups and, and, and people who are interested in, in trying to get billboards removed, this was one of the key signs they said that we're spending all of this money to renovate the Strand Theater, and yet right next to it, you know, you have a 1,000 square foot sign, and it, that's lit in an old-fashioned way. That there's tons of light trespass, and in meeting with some of the councilors um, in these areas, uh, I also said this is going to be the way that you can try to eliminate signage in the actual, you know, residential neighborhoods. Is you know, trade it off, trade one, and take down three. This is actually four signs because they've just put two signs together and we have some historical signs that show it and they wrapped it to make one sign. So we're putting up one and taking down four. So, one, so, so quick question on those existing signs. So the, the, you have agreements with the landowners to, to take down both the sign and the infrastructure for those signs. Are, are these signs sort of on top of buildings, on the ground? 
What have they agreed to take down the infrastructure so no sign could get put up again? The, the sign will be taken down to the ground, or in the case of the Strand Theater, it'll be taken down to the roof, we'll replace the roof, and it'll be as if there's no sign there at all. And then the other Preble Street sign, it's made with two I-beam structures that they haven't made billboards out of since probably the 1950s. So those will be removed and the ground will be restored to exactly as if there was absolutely zero sign there before. Great, thanks, Pete. One thing that I just I just want to leave the board with also too. This is a this is a great proposal to to kill two birds with one stone here. One, uh, we have an organization that's been in existence for over 81 years that is in complete disarray and about to close its doors. This will allow them to continue continue to serve this neighborhood and serve this Polish community that's been a vital part again of this Dua Chester Polish Triangle. While at the same time, we're going to be removing these locations and decluttering billboards from our residential neighborhoods, which again I think that was the whole intent of the BPDA in the city of Boston's vision on uh, billboards so okay yeah. we'll, t we'll take one more question from the board I just want to be mindful we're not we're not quite halfway through our agenda yet and more of a statement to... Sherry than a question yes. but guys I think you've done a great job with getting these billboards out of making your proposal so that we get the billboards out of the neighborhoods um, and put them in a place that they belong on the highway so I just want to commend you guys for doing that commend the uh, American Polish Club for doing that as well. I think that billboards belong on main strips, not in people's neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, with that, let me open it up to public testimony. And, I, and I'm mindful, Mr. Spitz, if you want to make sure, I know last time, you know, because there are a lot of raised hands and we cannot distinguish them, uh, please, please guide us. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time the Mayor's Office has deferred to the judgment of this board. Uh, as you previously heard, uh, there uh, has been civic associations, uh, the McCormick Civic Association and Andrew Square Civic Association have expressed support for this proposal, uh, citing as an opportunity to ensure that the social club stays in the neighborhood. Uh, we've also heard from some abutters that also have raised concerns about uh, light pollution um, as well as just uh, the visual of it in general. Um, with that, we'll defer to the board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, City Council at large, Michael Flaherty. Due to the fact that this proposal will eliminate three billboards in um, various neighborhoods uh, throughout the city, as well as the fact that it would it will serve to support the Polish American Club for years to come, conflict to government and support. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Caitlin Stapleton from Council Murphy's office. Um, the applicant completed a thorough community process with support from the letters and civic associations. Um, so because of this, the council would like to go on record in support. Thank you. Okay. Elected official office, I'll turn it to the raised hands. If you're on to speak in favor or opposition, please raise your hand. I'll start with Vargas and then go to Peter. Can you briefly, um, can you give your name and address and briefly tell us if you're in support or opposition? Hi, uh, my name is Vargas da Silveira. I'm actually the owner of uh, the assign at the Strand Theater. I am definitely in support of it. Uh, we've gone through some community process myself. Uh, the Main Street, uh, uh, Upham's Corner Main Street group has, supports it. Uh, Councilor Tanya uh, Fernandez Anderson supports it. Uh, the uh, Senator Liz Miranda supports it, and everyone that I know in Upham Scorner supports it. It's an eyesore in the community. We would love to have that uh, removed out of there. And I am, I do have a contract with the uh, owners that are putting the sign over the highway. So I would strongly urge that the board supports it. And uh, okay. thank you. Thank you. Peter? Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Dizek. I am the treasurer of the Polish American, Polish American Citizens Club. Uh, thank you for the chance to let me speak. Um, I just want to quickly talk about, and it's kind of mentioned, so I'll be very quick. You know, we view this as a kind of uh, course altering uh, opportunity for the Polish club. We've had other opportunities in the past to work with sign companies, and we always said no because it wasn't, we felt the right fit for the neighborhood. Uh, but this proposal, the thoughtfulness that Peter and his team have put into it, the way that it won't impact the neighbors gave us comfort to move forward. And on the flip side of it, the, you know, essentially the annuity that this will be for the club will allow us to make 
make all sorts of improvements and changes that ensure the club can exist for another 80 plus years and offer the neighborhood the kind of cultural content and programming that we always want to do and we try to do and we take care of the park there we take care of the street we do polish for us we do these events we uh, host some neighborhood pool teams and domino teams but it'll give us the opportunity to kind of really build on that work and take it to the next level it, but I, I can't express how kind of uh course altering it would be for the club. So thank you so much. I hope you approve us today. Thank you. ES, are you looking to give testimony here? I think she was on earlier and was having issues with a raised hand. Um, I don't see any additional ways. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, ES, are you looking to give testimony? I sent a request on you. I'm sorry, I can't get my hand to go down. I'm okay, on because she's here for another. She's here for another case. Uh, okay, just want to make sure I have no addition. Can we hear from an abutter? Um, no addition. Uh, okay, Patty. I don't think Jessica can tell. Yeah, uh, Patty, I see your hand is raised. Are you a direct abutter? We're going to get testimony here. I see your hand is raised. Yes, my hand is raised, but we're not a, a direct abutter. Are you with the Civic Association? Yes, with the Andrews Square Civic Association. Okay. Do you, okay. Do you want to briefly speak? Yes, I will. The Polish, Polish Club is a 75-year-old cultural institution at the heart of the Polish Triangle. And in addition to promoting their ancestral culture, you can often find neighbors from all walks of life gathering to share experiences and community. This billboard will afford the club the opportunity to update and maintain their tired and beloved building, perhaps preserving its existence. And we at Andrew Square Civic Association are thrilled to see the billboards removed due to this proposal and hope that you will support support it thank you um linda zablocki is with me if you can just say a couple of words hi everybody on the board uh thank you very much for listening to this um i'm going to make a remark about the vpda that the colonists of forbidden you ship being on the civic committee i have seen many land pieces of land that are unbuildable lots that were allowed so where do we where do we draw the line here but um my personal thing is if you're really not in favor of it, give it the media trial I mean, you go into the club, you can see all walks of life in there. People are playing pool, people are playing darts, and people are playing dominoes. And they're of all different ethnicities. So this is not just a Polish, you know, a Polish club. This is open to everybody. They have also donated the hall upstairs when you need to do a fundraiser. They're very good with the community. And right now they're in hard times. And I think that all of that comes down from 2020 when we allowed all the big box stores to be open, but we shut everything else down. We're looking to keep this in our neighborhood. I feel that it is something that is beneficial to everybody all around. And I'm hoping that the board will approve this. And taking those three signs down, even the one that's right up the street from me on Preble Street, will be glorious because they advertise things like fast food, alcohol, and it's all in low-income areas. Let's build up those areas and take those. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Any final questions for the applicant? May I have a motion? Uh, bear with me, Chair. Chair yes, sir. So, um, three signs one in Upper Corner um, in Dorchester, one on Preble Street in South Boston. Where's the other sign? There's two on Preble Street. There's two on Preble, okay. That's, that's right. Yeah, but the other, the other one is actually on 543 Columbia Road. Right. Okay. And we, we also do have, of the two most affected neighbors, they have that couldn't be available to speak today we do have letters of support from both of them that have been given to the board great yes peter that's a that's a good point they've also personally appeared at the previous hearings as well but today unfortunately uh due to work obligations they couldn't so they submitted most recently another letter uh issuing that support okay understood okay did that address your question, Mr. Stenbridge? Yes. Yeah, okay, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion. Um, I feel that the applicant um, showed evidence of why they were seeking a variance in terms of uh, hardship that the American Polish Club was is experiencing to maintain and be able to deliver their services to their community. Um, I understand that uh, zoning only regulates billboards on very specific neighborhoods, but I think um, what was presented in front of us was a lot of community support for um, for the billboard 
and uh, I believe a conditional use, per use permit is warranted given that um, the billboard would not adversely affect the neighborhood um, and that the technology would not uh, or would mitigate or minimize nuisance that's um, created by visual the visual um, uh, lighting from the billboard. So with that, I would like to put a motion of approval with the condition that the applicant removes three billboards as already specified in those locate in the locations uh, from neighborhoods. Um, I think that was the only condition. Okay. And then it has BPDA design review. All right, may I have a second? Second. Mr. Sembridge? Yeah. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Bonato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good Great, luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair, I don't know if I said yes, but just for the record, I also uh, would say yes to my own motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not call you? I apologize if I did not. Okay. Please make sure that's in the record. Next case. Um, next, before we go there, Madam Chair. Um, yes. I'll ask if there are from the one o'clock hearing, will there be any withdrawals, request for withdrawals of the code? And I'm just going to remind folks that we are we have still a lot more on our plate, so please be brief. Thank you. Benji, are you looking to get testimony, Benji? Now? I'm sorry, not testimony. You're looking to defer. <laughs> yeah, I see your hand is raised. Oh no, I, I'm a panelist for the next project. Sorry. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. I'll make you Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stembridge. Moving on, uh, the next case is BOA 144-3969 with the address of 4, 404 West 2nd Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Yes, Mr. Stembridge, thank you. Uh, my name is George Morancy. I'm an attorney with a business address of 350 West Broadway in South Austin. I represent uh, Victoria Banos and uh, her family, the owner of Unit 3 of the 404 West uh, Second Street condominium. Uh, Madam Chair, members, as a refresher, this um, matter was uh, given a full hearing on June 6th. Uh, it was deferred uh, because the, the, the board was uh, seeking a, a BBDA recommendation. Uh, the, uh, for the benefit of members who were not sitting on June 6th, I don't think this is an identically composed board. Uh, my client's unit is the top floor unit, and she's seeking today approval for a, a private roof deck, which would be a pertinent to her unit, which is owner-occupied. The size of the deck would be approximately 190 square feet. Access would be provided by means of a new spiral stairway, uh, which would be added to an existing rear balcony. So there would be neither a, a headhouse nor a hatch. Uh, again, that access would come from an existing rear porch up a spiral staircase and accessing the roof deck. There are two violations cited, roof structure restrictions under section 6829 and insufficient rear yard setback. Section 6829 of uh, Article 58, uh, this is an MFR, uh, multi-only residential zoning subdistrict, makes access to a roof deck by means of a stairway headhouse zoning violation requiring a conditional use permit, uh, whereas uh, access by means of a dimensionally compliant hatch uh, would be compliant to the terms of Section 29. The intent, as I mentioned on June 6th, is to discourage the construction of rooftop headhouses to access the deck in favor of a hatch. A hatch can be no more than 30 inches in height above the uh, roof line. This is a different scenario, a third scenario, whereby neither a headhouse nor a hatch is being proposed, but again, rather this spiral staircase from that existing rear porch, which can be seen here on the side elevation. So this does not add another roof structure to the deck, but takes advantage of that existing uh, deck access in the rear. 
Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the rear yard setback violation is exceptionally minimal. The required rear yard setback distance here is 15 feet. Um, the only reason why this is even cited is because there is, as uh, I say, already a rear porch, which is in a required rear setback area, is because uh, one, just the very edge of the deck and the spiral staircase itself is also within that setback area, but no more so than the existing uh, rear decks or rear porches. And um, I, I, I believe Mr. Hanson is, is likely still here, but after June 6th, I did confer with him and confirm that the BPDA's recommendation, which I'm sure he'll speak to, was approval with design review. With that, I'll pause and, and take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm gonna ask for public testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board of Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS hosted a butters meeting for 404 West 2nd on April 26, 2023. Around half a dozen of butters attended the meeting. Three stated that they opposed the project mainly due to fear of future noise and want to butter vocalize their support at the meeting. Additionally, we have received 16 letters in support and five in opposition, including one from the St. Vincent's Neighborhood Association. At this time, we'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you. I'm Mara Nadeshia, members of the board, and Akal Leron from Council President Flink's office. The council would like to go on record in opposition due to feedback from neighbors, the St. Vincent's Neighborhood Association, and his long standing policy of opposing conflicts in residential neighborhoods of South Boston. During the pandemic, Council President Flink and Councilor Flaherty opposed a siding scale. So, a siding scale of fines for large parties that were causing quality of life issues of all hours of the night for our seniors, persons with disabilities, young families, and neighbors. Council President Flynn worked with Boston Police 66 to answer many of these problems properly. Calls from concerned neighbors in the summer and found roof decks too often to be the source of the issue. As a result, he joins his neighbors and civic groups in South Boston and remains opposed to adding to the existing quality of life issues in the neighborhood and asks that the board take these concerns from the community seriously. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sauf from City Council of Boston, Michael Flaherty, I can some sentiments of Council President Flynn's office as well as Article 68 violations constitute our right officers. And Madam Chair, I have no raised hands at the moment. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion to approve the project. May I have a second? Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Mr. Stenberg? Yes. Ms. Better Barraza? No. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have case VOA 1475285, the address of 304 Parish Street. Is the applicant and or the representative present? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, again, Richard Lynn's uh, business address of 245 Sumner Street, East Boss. I'm here on behalf of the petitioner, Trapilo Development. Um, I can probably jump right into slide two. I know time is tight and we're late on the agenda, so I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, Madam Chair, this board may remember, this was uh, likely the first case the newly constituted board heard back in January. Um, we, are, we were proposing a four-story, three-unit residential dwelling uh, on the existing lot and demolishing the existing garage. Uh, the board uh, at that time had raised a uh, concern over the height of our building uh, and indicated that uh, the preference based upon the surrounding neighborhood context was to see something not at four stories. Uh, if we can jump down to slide, I believe it's uh, four or five. Let's jump further down. Next slide, please. One more slide. One more slide. So uh, since that uh, hearing, we had gone back uh, and redesigned this project. The building uh, we're looking at is the gray with the white bump out in front. Uh, we are proposing to uh, modify, we modified our original proposal from four stories to three. 
Um, this will allow for the redevelopment of this site with a three-family uh, unit, a uh, three-family building, uh, three residential units, which is allowed use in the district. So uh, this being a 3F2000 district, a three-family is permitted. There really uh, is no further change other than what we originally proposed other than the height. We do still incorporate a roof deck. We don't require uh, a head house to access that, so we will be accessing the roof deck uh, from an internal hatch and exclusive to unit three. Um, the unit sizes range from about 810 to about a little over 820 square feet each. They're all proposed as one bedrooms, but we could simply reorient, reorient, reorient some of these to allow for either a one plus or potentially a two bedroom. Uh, we do believe that as a one bedroom, this does uh, provide some more affordable opportunity, not necessarily affordable housing, but affordable opportunity uh, for smaller units for uh, people who are looking for home ownership. This is intended for as three residential condo units. Um, and uh, in addition to the proposed uh, project, we will be closing up the driveway that presently exists in front of the site, uh, which will add additional on-street parking. I know we did uh, have a chance to also review this with the BPD. I'm not sure Mr. Hampton is here. I believe last time the BPD's recommendation was denial without prejudice based upon the height. I believe that that uh, recommendation has now been revised to uh, recommend approval with design and develop. Mr. Hampton speak to that. I also believe we did have some people uh, speak in favor of this. I know as we got later in the day, I did lose a few of them, but I know there are 14 letters of support, including the Civic Association on file uh, with the Board of Appeal. I will pause there for a moment and see if the board has any specific questions and address anything on the plans. Thank you. All right, any questions from the board? No, but I really do appreciate the internal hatch access to the roof deck that will eliminate the noise. And I do want to just confirm uh, for, for board members reading the BPD uh, recommendations, that's the recommendation from the original proposal in uh, December. So they do not have, unless uh, Mr. Hampton has a new recommendation, it's not included. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Jeff Hampton, BPDA. I, I'd like to uh, you know, confirm what Attorney Linz had said. Uh, that original recommendation, I believe, was from January. They took our recommendations to heart, and this is a good example of uh, a case um, taking our recommendation uh, that we would have originally denied and revamped the plan. So uh, we'd like to go on the record for uh, approval with design review on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time, the Mayor's Office would like to defer to the judgment of this board. Some background information on the community process. ONS hosted an abutters meeting on March 31st. Uh, no abutters were in attendance. The applicant then went on to meet with the Maverick Central Neighborhood Association, where the association voted to support. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board at this time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. And Sebastian Brown from Councilor Coletta's office. Based on the community process and the vote in support from our Central and Community Association, and Neighborhood Association, the Council would like to go in support of this project as well. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, okay. members of the board, Paul Sullivan, City Council Black Member Friday, comes with very much support. I'll open it up to public testimony, Mark, and then Ed. Can you briefly tell us if you're in support or opposition? And state your name and address. Hi, good. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Sharafa, and I am in support of this project. Thanks. Ed? Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, my name is Ed Duvall. I'm a former member of the Zoning Board of Appeal. I hope you're all doing well. I am also in a butter at 61 Brook Street, which is just around the corner, about 100 yards from this project. Uh, I am in full support. Uh, it provides much needed housing and what's been a very underserved use is just a standalone uh, garage. It is in close proximity to the airport MBTA station. Uh, it's in walking distance and I believe it is a very appropriate use uh, for the location and for the neighborhood. And uh, I ask that you look favorably upon it. Thank you. Okay. All right, do you join? Uh, yes. No. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, uh, my name is Ron Giorgioni. Um, I am the owner of 308 Paris Street, East Boston, um, Unit 2. Um, I'm also the, the treasurer for the Condo Association. Uh, the reason I am against this 
um, construction is if you expand the width of this building, it will be directly impeding my access to my backyard. I will not be able to escape safely if there is an emergency because that's the only access into the rear of my building, as well as it will be doing the same to the residents at 306 Barrow Street. Um, besides that, I appreciate the low and the height variance. That's very considerate. But like I said, um, I feel like it's a health code violation or a health and safety violation, as well as the master deed um, has it written in that my backyard needs to be accessible through that passageway. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And like I said, I would very much um, prove, appreciate your denial of this uh, due to my safety concerns. Madam Chair, um, respond briefly uh, with respect to that issue. Can we just finish the public testimony and then, yes, please, after that. I have no additional raised hands, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Lynch. Yes, apologies. Um, thank you. So uh, with respect to access, uh, the current conditions, um, I, I'm not aware of any easement rights, et cetera. With that said, however, I would point out to the board that we do set our uh, building back three feet from the property line, uh, which is sufficient access. Certainly we have no issue uh, if there's emergency access needed from the rear of this property to get out to the public way. Uh, I don't believe where we have any issue by way of necessity uh, for that emergency access. So our building is designed to allow for our own access to the back of our building. I don't believe there's any specific issue uh, safety-wise with respect to access to their building as well. Even though there may not be any title rights for that, uh, we, don't, we don't foresee any problem with um, allowing emergency access if that one will occur. Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I'm going to uh, approve with BPDA design review. May I have a second? second. Thank you. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. Now, Mr. Wong. Now move on to 1 p.m. hearing. First being case VOA 1482725, with the address of 247 to 251 Hancock Street, which is a BPDA Article 80 project. Is the applicant and or their representative present? And I'm going to again ask for brevity. We have three Article 80s in a row, so please. Be mindful, thank you. Understood, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Johanna Schneider. I'm with the law firm of Hemingway and Byron, 75 State Street, and I'm counsel for the applicant, Arx Urban. I'm joined today by Benjamin Mall from Arx and also by Ruthie Coleman from Rody Architects. We are here today seeking zoning relief for a 47 unit residential apartment building at 247 Hancock Street in Dorchester. The site is an approximately 16,500 16, square foot parcel that currently houses a car wash. It is right across the street from the site of the new dot block development. It is also adjacent to another multifamily building at 233 Hancock Street, which is also owned by the applicant. As you can see from the site context photos, if you want to roll to slide four, please. Due to the existing car wash use that currently occupies the site, there is a significant curb cut. It's about 76 feet long on the site. And this car wash does contribute to a significant amount of vehicular traffic on Hancock Street. The project proposes to replace this car wash and the curb cut with a new residential building. The building will be five stories along Hancock Street and six stories to the rear of the site. At its highest point, the building will be 67 feet, six inches tall. It will have an FAR of 2.9. There will be 47 units, at least 60% of which will be affordable at the 60% AMI level or below, and more than 70% of the units within the development will be family-sized units. We are very proud that this project was one of the first in the city to receive from the Mayor's Office of Housing an Affordable Housing Acceleration Certificate. Overall, the building will be approximately 48,000 square feet. We will be providing approximately 1,500 square feet of new landscape public green space. 
The project will have 18 on-site parking spaces and 57 on-site secured bicycle parking spaces. And this is part of a very deliberate strategy to take a really progressive approach to both transit and mobility. In addition, the project will incorporate numerous sustainability measures. It will be all electric and it will have solar equipment actually installed on the roof, not just solar ready. We've had a robust community process around this proposal that's included a number of meetings with the neighborhood and elected officials over the last year plus. We have provided to the board 29 letters of support. This includes letters from five abutters as well as the Hancock Street Civic Association. I understand we are short on time. I can at this point turn this over to Ruthie Coleman from Rody to walk through the plans or I can go straight into the zoning relief we need or we can just take questions from the board. Um, Madam Chair, I take my direction from you. Thank you. Let's let's go to questions and see if that leads us to any of your other uh, slides. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? So you have 29 or 62 percent of income restricted units. Are, are there subsidies attached to those? Uh, yes, there will be. And if I can ask Benji Mall, who's on the line with me, to provide a little bit more detail about the funding sources for the project. Sure. That'd be helpful. We're working in tandem right now with the mayor's office of housing. It's anticipated that, in, anticipated that this will be funded by a uh, low-income housing tax credit. So at a very bare minimum, the project will be 60% uh, affordable below 60% of AMI. Uh, we anticipate that those levels will increase as we continue to work through the mayor's office of housing and uh, the, uh, the state process uh, in terms of our tax credits. So. Um, we're, we're thrilled to provide the depth and, and breadth of affordability here. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm gonna go to pu uh, public testimony. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time, the Mayor's Office likes to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, as you heard previously, this went through a robust DPA community process. Uh, there were some concerns raised from some butters about uh, parking, uh, but there was also many voices that were excited about adding more housing to this part of Dorchester. Um, the applicant was in contact with the Meeting House Hill uh, Civic Group, as well as the Hancock Civic Association, which voted to support this proposal. Uh, with that, we defer to the board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Joe McEachran, City Councilor, Frank Baker's office, we'd like to go on record and support. Thank you. Madam Chair, it looks like I have no raised hands. All right then, with that, may I have a motion? Uh, make a motion to approve with BPTA design review. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Scumbridge? Yeah. Ms. Barraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you your love. We appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. And I'm going to ask Mr. Ross to do the same in the next case. <laughs> Getting to it then. Case BOA 1450131. Address being 1670 Geneva Avenue. Uh, another article 80 case uh, is the Avenue. The applicant, Mr. Roth, or someone else, but um, this is Salman Chaudhary. I'll be the, um, I'll, I'll be leading the team. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Honorable Board Members. Uh, my name is Salman Chaudhary. I live at 51 Hutching Street in Dorchester, which is uh, one block away from uh, the development that we are seeking approval. Uh, not only we uh, live in the neighborhood, we are also a big believer of investing in the neighbor in the community where we live. Um, you will see through our investment in Dudley Cafe and Shanti, Shanti Express in Nubian Square and multiple Shanti loca locations in Dorchester and Rosendale. Um, uh, we are a big believer also uh, creating home ownership opportunity that creates genera generational wealth in the community. Um, this is why um, uh, we are really passionate about creating um, uh, uh, units that uh, people from the community can buy in. With that, I, wanted to, I want to introduce my team. 
Uh, I'm the reporter who also lives in Dorchester, who's been helping me through the last two years of community process. Then I also have Alfonso Sierra, whose office is in Charlestown, that our uh, architect, uh, Andre, want to take over. Thank you. So just as a reminder, please be brief. This has gone through Article 80 review. I will be very brief. It's going to be Thank a quick walkthrough of the presentation, uh, give you the highlights as you can see. Uh, it's a 50 unit um, building being proposed, homeownership. What you see now is what is currently there, a single story brick building. The plan is to retain that, that building and build uh, four stories above, and the first floor will be used as on site parking. Next, please. Uh, this is the rear of the building. So the front is on Cuban Avenue. The rear fronts the rear fronts onto Oldsville Road, and there is an existing um, garage exit door there now. Next, please. Uh, this is the rendering. Uh, we also front um, an MBTA uh, bus stop. Part of community benefits is to improve and uh, make the bus stop. Um, seating more um, user friendly and just bring a, a more uh, aesthetic appeal to to what is now lacking uh, what we'll see um, next slide uh, what we're doing is uh, the building will be on the oldfield road side uh, one story it'll be the, the exit for the garage and entrance and then it will step up to five stories as you move to the front along Geneva avenue that, that way, the old road um, abutters will be looking down on the, the deck of the garage, and that will um, mitigate any light or any sun um, disruption. Next, please. Uh, we are uh, proposing 50 units. It will be a mixture. It will be uh, four studios, average size 500 square feet. Uh, 21 bedrooms ranging from 600 800 square feet, uh, 22 bedrooms on average 900 square feet. And at the request of elected officials, we've also added family slash units. We have six three bedrooms at roughly 1,200 square feet. And there will be 17 on site parking spaces. Next, please. Uh, just different renderings that show the building from, from different angles. Um, next, please. Uh, next. Just some of the landscaping we're going to do. Uh, we have had a few public meetings. Uh, we do want to have outdoor roof deck space. We have committed to not using any astroturf, but um, being very sensitive to the environment and, and health standards, and but overall provide uh, outside space on some of the roofs of the upper levels, as well as improving the frontage of the building along the avenue with the bus stop. I believe that's the last slide. Okay, thank you. This Are there questions? Sorry, I was going to see if there are questions from the board. And you speak to sustainability? Uh, some, I think, from previous meetings, we would, we are trying to, uh, we have talked about putting solar panels on the roof to um, help, particularly with the operating costs of the units and, and reducing utility costs. Um, so we can talk about anything other than that. Um, it, it will be a new new construction, so we'll, we'll uh, uh, meet all the energy efficiency requirement that's by the city or the state. And I, I see that big blank gray wall. Is, is that what the pedestrians will experience walking by this building? No, that's that, that's a side view. If you were to walk between the, the building proposed and the abutter to the right. So on the, yeah, on the left hand side of the building, there's the existing uh, one story car garage also that's a uh, that's, uh, separate owner and they are operating. On the right side of the building, um, there is uh, there is some landscaping, but uh, it is an existing building that just we are. Um, oh, 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 that gray that gray block is an existing building that you're depicting. Um, yes, but that that brick will continue all the way across. So I, I don't know how the gray wall got there, but that's that's not um, look that brick will continue all the way throughout the building. Okay. 
And the, the, the first floor is the existing 17,000 square foot building, single story building. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so. It, does it look like what's on top? What's on the uh, above? So, so, so the, the up top will be the new construction. Okay. And the gray wall will be there. It will be brick. It will be brick, yes. Yeah, can you go to the site plan? Just for reference. Yeah, that would be helpful. I don't think we have, other than the frontage, I don't think we have. If you look at this landscape plan, the, the picture that's on top of you, that's basically the existing footprint of the building, the, the, um, the marked area, and, and the green space that you see that, that will be uh, on top of the existing single story building that's there. So the elevation we're seeing is, is the, to the left, right? It's the west. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's abutting that red um, base is it seems like there's parking lots and then there's a building adjacent to it. Uh, that's, that's sprayed right. out. Right. That's okay. that continue as as brick. But it seems like from this site plan that there's an existing building to the left of that brick wall. Well, there's an existing building to to the left of of this site. You can see it in the um, front, the, go yeah. back to the um, second slide. Right, that is the existing one. One story building. Right, that's why I think it's grayed out because really right. you're oh, looking at that plant as a, almost like the party wall to the existing right. thing. Exactly. So if you, if you look to the far left, uh, that white symbol line. Right, that's the existing building. Right. right, so I'm just trying to help my colleague. I see, I see. Okay. I, it's, yeah. it's an, ex right. Thank you. Right. Okay, I think we got that clear. Any, All right, it's my, my fault, I apologize. Any new questions, any other questions? All right, hearing none, can we take public testimony? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. I should go into the Office of Neighborhood Services. Um, this project is go to, the, go to the BPDA community process. Um, our office was reached out by Mike Kozu from Project Right in the Roxbury Neighborhood Council with overwhelming opposition on this project. They feel that the process was fundamentally flawed from the start of this project. Um, they, st they state that the developer bypassed the existing neighborhood resident association who represents the butter residents to this project. Um, lastly, the developer only met once with these associations and the butters in this meeting did not address to the concerns on height and density of this project. Um, the Roxbury Naval Council is opposed to this project. With that, we defer to the board. Is the project manager on for this? Yes, um, my name is Scott Greenhall and I'm, filling, I'm a project manager at the BPDA. I'm filling in for Quinn Valsich on this project. The project was filed with the BPDA on June 29th, 2022 and successfully completed the Arctic Lady process. This process included two BPDA sponsored public meetings. The BPDA board approved the BPDA board approved the project on November 17th, 2022. The project received support from the Grove Hall Neighborhood Development Corporation, Dorchester Growing Together, and elected officials both in the public meeting and in our online comment period. Thank you. But I think what the reason why you were brought um, was to answer the community concern regarding not in, not including the Roxbury Neighborhood Council in that review process. Can you comment on that? This is for the project manager. For Scott. Understood. Um, I did. I do believe there was there was opposition from one particular member. Um, arguing that the project did not meet with the Civic Association before filing. Um, however, that, that participant did receive the project filing notification and public meeting announcement in time and was able to engage with the project uh, throughout the duration of the review. Um, and the project team did, did present to that Civic Association in August 2022. Okay. Let's keep going. I see some public officials. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Ayam Ngeo with the Office of City Council Brown Morrell. In regards to 1670 Geneva Avenue, um, like we said previously, there is one letter of opposition from the budding Civic Intervale in Normandy, um, mostly due to the design and the process. 
Um, the applicant has made several um, attempts to include housing and home ownership in his proposal. And with that, he also added a green roof. So with all that being said, the council would like to go in support of the, this proposal, but with the proviso of BPDA design review. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Georgia Frias here from Councilor Ricardo Arroyo's office. We too would like to go on record in support. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Slater, and I'm testifying on behalf of the office of Councilor Louis Jean, and I would like to go on the record in support. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any other public officials. I'll um, turn it over to public testimony. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few raised hands. Uh, Dennis, are you looking to give testimony here? No? Okay, I'll go to Mike. If we can. It's time to request on you, Mike. Hi, my name is Michael Colson, Project Right 320A, Blue Avenue. I just want to note that Hutchin Street is half a mile away from the site and not one block away, just for clarification. We also want to note that this development did not meet with the Roxbury Neighborhood Council as required by Article 50. We have a number of different issues on this. We do not think the garage should go out onto Oldsfield Road. Oldsfield is a one-way dead end. Uh, I mean, it's a narrow two-way dead end street with parking on both sides. It is very congested back there. If, if fire um, and emergency vehicles have to respond, they have to come in from Geneva Ave. And the address on this is anyway is Geneva Ave. So the main entrance and garage should be on Geneva Ave. Five stories. Uh, 50 units next to on the street on both Geneva Ave and Oldsfield is uh, 33 of the 37 residential buildings are two family houses. The two family houses next to the structure on both Oldsfield and um, Geneva Ave are going to be overwhelmed by this and then a potential similar type development on 88 Geneva Ave. They're going to be overshadowed and overwhelmed in, in terms of this process. We feel that there's a number of different things. Uh, Keisha Santana had offered to host another meeting for a fall discussion. We, uh, we, we agreed to it, but we never heard back from the developer. I think there's still a lot of impact, a lot of concerns from the budding neighbors um, in terms of how they're going to address uh, a number of these issues uh, that haven't been addressed. Thank you. So we're opposed to it. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, this, this is Dennis Patch. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, I. Um, I'm strongly in favor of the project. If you walk down around this building, it's um, a rather eyesore across the street from a beautiful library. I like the fact that it helps ownership. I like the fact that it's a, currently a black owned church that's been trying to sell this uh, for several years and been working with a developer. I'm glad, I like, glad that it's a black developer that lives in the area and has been in the area for almost 20 years. And I also like the fact that it's bike friendly and he has been uh, adding a green roof and other things to help the community uh, from the community input. And can you put your address into the record? Yes, my address, 15 Arbor Road in Boston. Thank you. Excellent, guys, and try to go ahead. Um, sorry, this is the, I'm Connie Forbes representing the Rockford Neighborhood Council. And to be clear, in the last meeting, um, public meeting with the BPDA, the proponents uh, said they would come before the Rockford Neighborhood Council, and that did not happen. Um, I'm hearing static, I'm so sorry. They agreed to come before the Rockford Neighborhood Council, that did not happen. And also, when listing this project, it is listed as 60 70 Geneva Avenue, and the BPDA have all the records indicating it's 66 Geneva Avenue. So there's a bit of mis a disconnect in what the project um, site is. So we would like to re request that you um, have this matter go back to the community for community um, input for questions that were never answered. So we're just hearing today that Ashley's turf has been removed, and that was a question that was. Um, posed before. We also had questions about the shadow study, which was put in after the last BPDA meeting. So we have to go back to the residents and say, these shadows are going to be cast over your building because they're exceeding the height by 20 feet for that area. And there is no identified hardship. So the BPDA um, has approved it, but the ZBA, when they get cases, there has to be a identified substantial hardship. And it cannot be financial because we're not responsible for making someone millionaires or billionaires, whatever it is, Thank there you. has to be a substantial hardship. Thank you. 
Any other raised hands, Jessica? I think we, Nevin, did we hear from you? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Nevin Lorden of 103 Wells Avenue in Dorchester. I'm speaking in support of this proposal, both as an individual and as a representative of the group Dorchester Grown Together. This proposal provides much needed housing in a location that is well suited for this increased unit density and lower off street parking ratio, as it is well connected by transit, located next to the commercial district along Blue Hill Ave in Grove Hall, and it provides easy access to green space at Franklin Park. I hope to see these variances granted by the board today. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like I have no additional raised hands. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything the applicant wishes to respond to before we vote? In terms of the community process, we did. We have done two years of community process. We have done 14 different meetings. Uh, we met with multiple neighborhood association. Um, the project right um, uh, that that's, we, we have reached out to many times with emails that we never got response back and Andre can um, uh, send those uh, proof that we, we reached out with multiple emails to come back and present to them. I live in the community. I have no, no problem doing as many neighborhood meetings as it's required. Uh, if the board likes to go ahead and approve the plan and want me to go present in front of the RNC, I don't have a problem with that. Um, in terms of, we, we followed the process that the BPDA took the lead on in terms of like uh, setting up some of the meetings and we basically followed the Article 80 process that was laid out in the, yeah. Andre, I don't know if you want to add anything else. I know, I think you said it was fine. Thank you. Okay, any final questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion for approval of BPDA design review. And I have a second. Second. Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Bedabraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panato. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. The motion carries. I hope you'll continue to dialogue with your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much. Next, next we have, excuse me, next we have case POA 1475349, the address of 361 Central Street. The applicant and or the representative uh, Ma'am Chair, I need to recuse myself from this yes. project. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Poggini, as you've heard me, brevity yes, I, will, I will be very brief, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Attorney John Poggini on behalf of the applicant. Um, uh, with me this afternoon is Rebecca Schofield and Charlie Adams from Penrose, together with uh, Philippe Saad from the Demella <clears throat> Schaefer Architects. 361 Center Street, Jay, you make a plain. It's a form of Blessed Sacrament Church. The lot size is just over three acres, 135,232 square feet. The zoning is in two different subdistricts, multifamily residential and neighborhood shopping. The proposal came as a result of the High, Ford, High Square Task Force putting on RFP to find affordable housing developer for the adaptive reuse of the Blessed Sacrament Church building as affordable rental housing. Penrose LLC was selected by the Hyde Square Task Force and they negotiated a memorandum of understanding wherein Penrose will purchase and redevelop the church and they will provide 55 units of affordable residential units, um, 12 parking spaces and a 6,500 square foot um, community space to be operated by Hyde Square Task Force. The pro as I stated, the project will provide 55 units of affordable housing five units at 80% AMI, 32 units at 60% AMI, six units at 50% AMI, and 12 units at 30% uh, AMI. Um, as you know, it went through an article 80 process. And at this point, I'm just gonna turn over quickly to Charlie Adams from Penrose, just to say a few words and leap aside from uh, Demella Schaefer. Thank you very sure. much. Sure, Madam Chair, I'll be very brief. I'll turn over to, De to Demilla Schaefer. Well, I just wanted to add in terms of the engagement process, we've worked very closely with Hyde Square Task Force. They are a co-owner with us in this uh, endeavor. We work with the Blessed Sacrament, uh, Friends of the Blessed Sacrament. One of the key things I wanted to uh, let the board know, we've gone through the BPDA process. We've also uh, worked with the Boston Landmarks Commission. So one of the things that we're really proud and excited about is that this building has, been, has is in, and is being designated a, a landmark, and it's also being able to be converted to, uh, to development. That they 
take up a building that sat vacant since 2004 and be converted to uh, housing and performance space, which was uh, ultimately the Hyatt Square Cash Force's dream to have this property be available for performance space. So I uh, wanted to just give those um, general overview and I'll turn it over to uh, Philippe from Danilo Schaefer to walk you through the actual buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And I'll be brief, understanding that we are short on time. The building represents two things, housing as well as community. So the big blue rectangle that you see in the previous slide is the community space that will be dedicated to Hyde Square Task Force. We'll have a separate entrance, will function separately, and to the left-hand side of the plan will be the residential entrance and the units and the amenities for the 55 units of affordable housing. Next, please. I think we could skip through the plans because they are they could be self-explanatory it's 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 units and then if we land on the top floor we have a community space on the top floor that occupies the dome space highlighted here in orange and uh, next please just in terms of a quick organization this is how the church itself which is one volume currently will be subdivided into serving as a community space on the ground floor and three and a half stories of residential uh, floors on the upper floors of the church itself next so the majority of the development will happen inside the existing building to the exception of some portions on the outside of the church which will the existing building will have two small additions on the right and on the left hand side to accommodate the 55 units uh, that are required by the program and that's a view of the church from the rear from the height square task force building and the condominium neighbors next that's a side elevation of the small addition to the rear of the church. Next. And an overall site plan of the site or explaining how access will happen and green space will be readjusted and, and added to the current uh, site of the building. And I think knowing how tight we are on time, I'll turn it back to Charlie. There's, there's something at the end of the presentation on affordable housing if you want to cover this term. Sure, you want to put that slide up if there's anything? Next. Uh, yeah, just um, as this, it, it will be 100% uh, of the units will be uh, be affordable with long term affordability restrictions. Um, you know, the build, the unit breakdown is really what the building will give you. It's a historic structure, so we have to kind of take what the building gives us with respect to where windows are. Um, but we were able to get uh, 13 two bedrooms in here as well as um, uh, with the studios and the ones. And there, the, the range of uh, affordability, as you can see on the left hand side, goes from 30% to 80% to very minimum income. And I think this is the end of our presentation. This is the end. Just uh, the final view from Center Street. We're open for questions. Thank you. And I just want to say, as a previously longtime resident of JP, including walking by this property for several years, uh, it's great to see it being redeveloped for this purpose. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank any you. questions from the board? You know, I echo the uh, addition of affordable housing and the uh, thoughtful um, renovation to this building. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to open it up yeah. to public testimony. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This is the Mayor's Office, I just refer to the judge of this board. Uh, as you heard, this went through an extensive community process uh, with the Hyde Square Task Force also doing a lot of extensive uh, outreach in the community. Uh, many voices were very supportive of the repurposing of this building to add affordability to the neighborhood. And we understand that it received full support from the JPNC. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, City Council at Live, Michael Flaherty, Council of the Council of the Board. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Caitlin Stapleton from Councilor Murphy's office. The applicant went through um, a thorough community process with support from direct letters and neighbors because of the 55 affordable units, 6,500 square feet of community space, and positive benefits for the community. The council would like to go on record and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Slater, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Office of Councilor Louis Jen, and I would like to go on record and support. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Hi, my name is Curtis Clavin. I'm a resident at, and owner of a condominium unit at 25 Creighton Street, number four. I'm on the uh, bus at Sacramento campus. Um, I was the first to move onto the campus in 2009 after uh, redevelopment uh, began. I want to uh, 
overall um, endorse uh, this proposal. I think it's great and it's overdue and it would be great for the community um, and the neighborhood. I have one concern that I raised at previous meetings, which is um, my understanding with the existing site plan is that, um, and some of the um, variances that are being sought are, um, there are two variances with regard to the rear yard addition and um, the side yard being insufficient. Um, there is a park in the center of the campus that has uh, been there um, and has been accessible to the community. It's the backyard for six of the other buildings that are on the campus and available publicly to um, people throughout the community for events. I do believe that the current um, proposal would um, allow the church building to take ownership of that um, in a way where they would be splitting the space, um, which is a contiguous green space, with paths for access to the church and would also um, put in additional landscaping that might um, basically guard the park from other entry. Um, and I would hope that this whole proposal could move forward, um, but potentially with the proviso that um, that space be made available with um, design revisions perhaps that would allow it to be to continue to be accessed as a backyard for the six other units and buildings on the property and uh, the members of the community. And the final thing is that um, I, do, I do believe that the structure of the condominium association, including that building and the other buildings on campus, um, puts us in a position where as the only uh, owner occupants that are living on the, on the campus, um, we really won't have the ability or, or recourse to, to stop or uh, change any redesignation of that um, green core. Um, so I would really hope that um, in this forum and, and others that there would be a proviso to try to encourage the developers, um, whom I hope will be great neighbors going forward, um, to uh, consider that and uh, keep the park accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other raised hands? Do you, um, no, nope, well, set with those teams. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to respond to that before we take a vote? Well, I mean, I can talk about John. John, is there any legal clarification, or should I just talk about the process and the plan? I think the yeah, question I, I that. That. the issue that he just raised with respect yes. to the park. Yeah, that's the only thing I, I if you could address that, that would be helpful. If we can put, Charlie, I can address parts of that as much as I know. Can yeah. we put this let me, let me just, just uh, to, yeah, yeah, this is a 10,000 foot level. Yes, this is a, this is an area that is you know owned by joined by the condominium. Our goal has always been to try to make it so it's more welcoming and more friendly to to, to the community. Um, and this is our our attempt to try to do that. We have heard uh, different pieces of feedback on trying to uh, alter it, and we're completely open and amenable to that. That's a that area still can be a work in progress and try to figure out what um, what works best for the community. So. Um, we've taken a shot at it, and um, and we've gotten some some feedback, and we'll keep refining it until we get it get it uh, get it where people are you know are all on board. So it's not it's not an impediment to the project, and it's something we'll keep working on with everybody. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, can I have a motion? Motion to approve with uh, BPTA design review. May I have a second? Second. Okay, Mrs. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Barraza. This is a really great project. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shepard. Yes. Ms. Panado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA. 1466320, with the address being 465 East 8th Street. Is the applicant and or the representative present? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark Lacasse, Lacasse Law 75 Arlington Street in Boston. Attorney for the applicant, which is the Rinaldi Pease Companies, and on the meeting as well as Joseph Rinaldi and Noah Pease, the principals of um, the company and this proposal. Before you is the zoning code refusal letter, and I promise to keep my presentation commensurate with the scope of this project, which is quite simple. Um, as you can see, there, uh, hold the uh, letter, please. There is only one uh, zoning issue, which is the roof structure restriction provision under Article 68, Section 29, which is a conditional use permit rather than a variance, which requires a conditional use for any additions on uh, roofs in South Boston. So this is an existing two-story building in a row of 
and a neighborhood of three-story buildings across the street, next door, up and down the street. They're all three-story buildings, but this building is only two stories, so essentially we're just filling in the missing tooth of that third story on this building with a proposal for a 624 square foot addition on top of the roof, which will connect to the lower floor unit to create a duplex unit and add 620 square, 624 square feet of living space. Um, if you go to slide 14 or 15, that shows the elevations that explains uh, everything quite clearly. Uh, nope. Here we go. So this is uh, front elevation on the left. Uh, the proposed addition is the third story on top of the existing two story. And on the right is a side elevation. And we um, brought the rooftop addition we pulled it in three feet from the edge of the roof line to comply with the side yard setback requirement. Um, next slide is another elevation which shows the other angles. Um, so on the left is the rear elevation. There's currently one unit in the lower level which is the full walkout basement apartment because of the slope of the land. Uh, the next floor above that is a uh, one, the second unit. And then the top two floors, the existing second and the top new third will be a duplex unit. And on the right elevation, you just see the side lower level unit next floor up and then the duplex with the addition on the top. And that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Any questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, can I have public testimony? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS hosted a butters meeting for 465 East 8th on June 8th, 2023. Multiple butters attended the meeting. The six who spoke all vocalized their support for the project. At this time, I'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Good afternoon, Madam Fisher, members of the board. Anna Calderon from Council President Queen's Office. The councilor would like to go on record in support based on a good community process and good faith compromises with the neighbors, including removal of the roof that from the proposal. The councilor will respectfully request that the team continue to work with neighbors on any quality of life issues during the construction phase. Thank you. Madam Chair, okay. members of the board, Paul Sol, the City Council at Large, Michael Clarity. Acknowledging the community effort that went into drafting Article 68, there are parties that do have merit, and Council believes that this is one of them. That being said, uh, he was impressed with the community process and the willingness to work with the uh, neighbors and the butters. That, and that being said, Council do have evidence support. Madam Chair, I have no raised hands. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with BPDA Design Review, paying special attention to the exterior detailing for the project. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Ms. Pedraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Next, we have case BOA 146. 3156, the address of 524 East 7th Street. Um, is, I believe Mr. Morant is present. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Stembridge. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is George Morant. I'm an attorney with the business address at 350 West Broadway in South Boston. My client is Rick Labrada, owner of the three family home, 524 East 7th Street. This is an MFR multifamily residential. Uh, zoning subdistrict. Um, Madam Chair, members, my client's backyard is uh, essentially uh, a bit of an island uh, in a sea of uh, residential parking surrounding uh, his property. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, this residential parking lot uh, was approved by this board. My uh, client did not oppose it. He, in fact, supported it uh, because, like just about everybody else, I think, in, in the area uh, recognized the need for creating some additional off-street parking uh, and um, supported the project moving forward. At this time, what he would like to do is take advantage of the two existing curb cuts and the, uh, the two travel lanes um, over which he would be granted an easement by the owner uh, to enable parking behind uh, uh, his house at 524 7th Street. Um, 
four spaces were proposed uh, that may have been uh, overshooting it a bit. I am aware of the uh, recommendation of the Boston Planning and Development Agency, and I have been in contact with Jeff Hampton before this hearing. Uh, I am aware of the additional comments um, in the BPA's recommendation of reducing the proposed number of spaces to three uh, and adding uh, adequate landscaping and uh, safe walkways uh, for the um, operators of the vehicles that will be parked in these spaces. I did speak with my client before uh, this hearing, and he uh, understands and fully agrees with those uh, recommendations of the BPDA and would absolutely accept them uh, as a proviso for uh, the board to approve this matter. With that, I'll pause and take any questions that, that any member may have. Great, thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, yes, Madam Chair. We do have comments from the BTD. Uh, okay. Maybe the proponent can respond to um, that the handicap handicap parking spaces should be uh, there should be two spaces for that purpose, and that there should be um, two electric changing spaces, charging spaces should have, should be at two. This is for this is for this project at East Seventh Street. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to respond? Um, I frankly, I'm, uh, I would pose the same question that you did, Madam Chair. I don't. This is an existing three family, and I guess at most we're looking to add three residential parking spaces for residents. So uh, I, I just. I don't know how to respond to the comments. I, I, I don't know that they're appropriate to this proposal. Uh, and that's, that's fine. <laughs> uh, any other questions from the board? Hearing none, let's take public testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS hosted a Butters meeting for 524 East 7th Street on May 30th, 2023. Noah Butters attended the meeting. We're unaware of any concerns about this project. At this time, we'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Michael Leron from Council President Queen's Office. The council would like to go on record in support due to the existing parking crisis in South Boston and the proposal working to create four of street parking spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, the City Council, Roger Michael Flaherty, acknowledging the communal effort that went into drafting Article 68, there are parties that do warrant merit. This is one of them. This will uh, increase the parking in South Boston and help alleviate uh, parking issues in the neighborhood. Thank you. I'd like to support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other raised hands? Um, uh, I'm sorry, Rick, you looking to get testimony here? Rick, can you hear us? Okay, I'm just confirm ES. Are you here to give testimony on this one or another? I'm sorry, my, my computer is awful today. No, I'm on for Darren I apologize. Okay. No, that's fine. That's okay. next. Okay. Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, I was trying to understand Bob DeMinkle's comments too, and I wonder if he was thinking about it in terms of the, um, the whole parking, parking lot. And it brought me to question, what would prevent um, those that are parking already in the other lot to not park in your space? Like what type of signage or how would they know since you're sharing the same easement. Sure. Well, the, um, uh, George Brancy, the, uh, the bases that are there in the existing lot are all obviously signed. Uh, so, you know, it would be the same that would prevent anybody from parking in a space in the lot that isn't his or her space. Okay, uh, so they're, words, they're already yeah. assigned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they, 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 they are assigned to neighborhood residents. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the board? Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with a proviso that there would be only three spaces and that, uh, and to also coordinate with BTD in terms of maneuverability. Okay, we have a second. Second. Mr. Stamperich? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? 
Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA 129-1960, the address of 1719 Barrett Avenue. Is the applicant and will their representative present? Is that Jennifer or Adam Burns? I think Peter Benko. Peter. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Can you hear me? This is Adam Burns, project proponent. Yes. Okay. Can you introduce yourself and what? Thank you for your case request? today. Um, I'd also like to request that John Beattie, who is the VP of development with us, um, also be on unit. He's going to be presenting the plans after I say a few words. Okay. Uh, business address for the both of us would be 599 East Broadway in South Boston. Um, I did just want to introduce the project and say a few things to address all pertinent points, but I'll try to be brief because I know we are over time. Uh, we're before you today with the proposal of two townhouse units that will be an extension of the existing row of four townhouses along the northern side of Barrett Avenue. The two units that we're proposing today are to be situated on lots of the exact same size, shape, dimension, and location as those where the existing four townhouses sit today. Those four existing townhouses were approved by this board in 2016. And in the board's own words, this proposal presents a reasonable use of the land that is consistent with other multifamily structures in the area. The proposed lot, while undersized for the subdistrict, is nonetheless comparable to many of the other developed lots in the area. We have undergone significant community process over the last year and a half, and throughout this time, we've made significant changes to our project with feedback from the neighborhood. Those changes have included, but are not limited to, reductions in height, reduction in density, reduction in bedroom count, added parking, increased setbacks, and increased open space. Although we have not been able to appease everyone, and I understand that we will have some comments in opposition this uh, afternoon, we do have support from several of the direct abutters for whom letters of support have been shared with this board. Uh, with that, I humbly submit our project to the discretion of the board, and I turn things over to John to take us through the plans. Sure. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is John Beattie with Boston Pinnacle Properties. I work with Adam. Uh, I can fly through this as fast as possible, um, as it's a relatively straightforward forward plan. Um, this is an extension of the existing row houses at 17 Barrett Avenue. Uh, previously, our building was three stories. We had since reduced it to two stories. We had two garage parking spaces um, in, in both units, and we since moved those spaces um, to the grade out front, as you can see on the, the bottom left of our outlined site plan. Um, these are three bed, three bath units, and I want to reiterate that these are condominium dwelling units, and these will not be rentals. Um, these are intended for young families and other families in the South Boston area. Uh, next slide, please. You can see our building highlighted in gray, uh, and this is just another representation of our site. You can see the three cars uh, at play in the bottom. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this was a quick shadow study we put together. Uh, the top rendering shows the shadow cast fire building during the winter solstice uh, as denoted by the blue line. And then our shadow study for the summer solstice in the bottom rendering um, again shows, shows the shadow cast fire building. Next slide, please. And the rest of the presentation shows some renderings. So here is the building head on uh, on the other side of Barrett Avenue. And then the bottom two images show the building from different perspectives. Here is the rear of the building. Our building is fully aligned with the existing row houses. So in the front and rear. Um, and the renderings in the bottom indicate what our building would look like from the small street uh, called Shepherd Terrace. And lastly, the last slide shows our elevations compared to the existing row houses on Barrett Avenue. Uh, with that, I'll pause for questions. Can we just go back to the previous slide? What is that? Uh, so what's what's on the other side of the alleyway? Is that, that's another house, is that correct? Uh, which image are you talking about? Uh, your no, top one. image with the two people in it. 
just on the right side, that little... Madam one. Chair, do you mean to the right-hand side where the brown fence is? Yeah. What, uh, what is it on that side? Shepton Terrace is on the other side of that. So okay. there's uh, two abutting brick. Um, you can actually see them. You look at the image in the middle bottom. Uh, yeah. There's a view from Shepton Terrace looking at the three-story townhouses that are existing along Barrett Avenue there. Okay. And in one of your earlier slides, you proposed three parking spaces. Can I understand where you're putting them? Because they look like they're right on the street or like right next to someone else's property. Uh, they are going to be on a section of our property. We're proposing an extension of Barrett Avenue, uh, which is a private way to accommodate the frontage for these two townhouse units. And the three on grade parking spaces are on uh, our property. Okay, what do you mean by extension of Barrett Avenue? Meaning to pave it further, or what do you mean? Meaning to pave the end of the street, yes. Okay. Uh, other questions from the board? Is that currently, what, what currently is in the front of that building? Is it green space? Is it already paved? What does it look like now? Um, up until a couple of days ago, the current owner was utilizing it as a gravel parking lot. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, through the chair. So on, on the slide that we're looking at now, uh, that's Shepton Terrace, or how close is the next, um, how, how wide is that, that um, alleyway, May? So the right-hand side is three feet from our property line. Shepton Terrace, uh, those buildings are set back about two to three feet from the property line. So total distance would be about five or six feet. Okay. Other questions from the board? I mean, I think it's, it's a unique siting of the property. Um, but what's interesting is that the three parking spaces is almost like front yard parking. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, would you be open to decreasing to two parking spaces? So to allow a, kind of a nicer entry for the two units and, you know, and to push the two parking spaces to the left or to the Absolutely. south? Absolutely, we would be more okay. than happy to. Yeah, because it feels like it's missing the front, right? Uh, and right now, the way that you're you're designing it is to having almost two rear. There's yeah. no front to your. Oh, that's a, that's a fair assessment, and okay. we would be open for that. Thank you. And uh, one more question, um, just because I can't get a clear view of heights. Compare. What would be the comparison from the height of yours? to the next tallest building on that small street. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, there was a bad connection. So there we go. You are to the right and there's an existing, no, you're to the left, right? We are okay. two stories to the left. And that existing building is to your right. Are you guys at the same height? Or no, we're, height? we're one story shorter than the building to the right. Which is your building, or no? We are understand? we are the two stories. We are on the sorry. left in this image. Okay, sorry. I thought you. It sounded like you also own the property next. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Shepard? Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the board? No, I guess my only concern would be green space. The whole, you know, we're going to cover up that front. That's gravel right now so i guess you're not losing much green space you know what is what's on that whole lot currently to the right or the double lot sorry the two lots on the right the two small ones that you're combining not the large one that's currently gravel it, it's all gravel right now it was all used as parking okay okay uh i think uh, public testimony would be helpful as i see a lot of uh, comments Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS has hosted multiple abutters meetings for 17 to 19 Barrett Avenue. The last two were held on January 5th and June 1st, 2023. Around a dozen residents attended each of those meetings. 
the proponents answered the questions raised at the abutters meetings and changed the project multiple times based on resident feedback. For example, they removed a story from the proposed structure and they increased rear yard uh, setback. No support was expressed for the project at these meetings. Abutters were concerned about noise, restricted sunlight, and the proximity to this structure of this structure to their properties. We have received two letters of support from direct abutters and 13 letters in opposition, including one from the City Point Neighborhood Association. Many people who sent in letters of opposition also signed a petition in opposition that had a total of 40 signatures against the project, saying it will create negative quality of life issues, green space, density, shadowing, and fire safety concerns. Many residents believe that 17 through 19 Barra Avenue is actually the backyard of 687 East 8th Street, and they are afraid that if this is approved, more structures located in backyards will be approved to be developed for housing purposes as well. At this time, we'd like to defer judgment to this board. Thank you very much. And Ms. Okay. White, can, sorry, can I just ask Ms. White, can you confirm the opposition? Are they mainly abutters as well? They're mainly, they're, the opposition, the people who uh, are listed on the side, most of them are direct abutters, yes. And most of the people that we've heard from all live in the City Point Neighborhood Association. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Calderon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam of the Chair, members of the board. Anna Calderon from Council President Flink's office. Please know Council President Flink and his fellows are Boston elected officials, Congressman Lynch, several colleagues, Representative David Will, and Councillor Alash Lahari sent a letter to the board yesterday on this case in opposition as this proposal has constantly received a strong opposition from nearly 60 abutters and neighbors, as well as the City Point Neighborhood Association throughout the entire two year community process. We hope that the zoning board will deny this application due to this feedback from the community and its duly elected officials, as well as the legitimate concerns on density and overcrowding, relevant public safety concerns, quality of life issues and a seeming lack of, lack of any hardship. Throughout this two years process, both neighbor, neighbors in the area and the City Point Neighborhood Association have constantly expressed concerns about the size and density of the proposal, but this project is simply too big for the lab, and, and, that, and that approval will set a worrying precedent for the neighborhood as it, as it is viewed by the community and is keen to over development in someone's backyard. Approval of this project will potentially serve as an encouragement and be viewed as a green light for other developers to do the same in other backyards throughout South Boston. Others concerns include, include negative impacts on reducing light and airflow for the property and gardens of a body residents privacy concerns to abutters due to the close proximity of the project to building next door, as well as environmental and quality of life issues with the removal of five nature trees to make way for this development. Moreover, there is no affordable units or additional dwelling units involved. It appears that the only overdue hardship will be once created by this project for many of the existing ta taxpaying neighbors in South Boston. In addition, and of a great importance to neighbors, there is genuine belief that the surrounding neighborhood, that such project would expose abutters to unnecessary public safety concerns. There have been worries expressed by residents that God forbid an emergency takes place, like the fire on Columbia Road in 2020, which burned several, seven buildings, displaced dozens of residents, and injured several Boston firefighters fighters that this project could potentially deprive future access to emergency services from our dedicated first respondents. Um, the counselor hoped that the zoning board of APIA will take these concerns of nearly 60 of our neighbors and the elected officials who represent this community seriously and vote to deny the relief of this zoning variance. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan from City Council at Large, Michael Flaherty, echoing the sentiments of Council President Flynn's office, as well as the council would also like to add that he does not agree with any variances being granted for this, for this proposal uh, because the proponent has been a, quote, lousy neighbor and has disrespected the abutters at every turn long before this proposal, which means 
will not be a conscientious developer and won't be sensitive or responsive to abutters' concerns during or after construction. That being said, there are, there are multiple violations here, violations under Article 68. Council Echo, Sentiment Council President Flynn, and go on record in opposition. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Caitlin Stapleton from Council Murphy's office. Um, over the past couple of years, there has been four community meetings for this project and it has received little to no support. Um, there is strong opposition from direct and surrounding abutters, along with the City Point Neighborhood Association. Most of the opposition comes from um, issues surrounding quality of life, sunlight, privacy, and loss of any green space. Um, the Council has sent over a letter of opposition, but would also like to go on record in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Ailey Dellen from Senator Nick Collins' office. Um, we echo all of our colleagues um, in opposition. Thank you. Can I hear from Ms. Galvin since it appears she's a direct abutter? Sure. Yep, uh, Ms. Galvin, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Galvin. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I own and live at 5 Stephen Terrace in South Boston. I am the direct abutter. I am very strongly opposed to this project. I feel like it would really negatively impact our quality of life. It would destroy our green space and it would actually put us at a uh, significant risk. Uh, we would lose access to emergency services if this uh, property is to be developed, um, which is very dangerous. The threat of fire is very real in South Boston because the homes are built so close together and overcrowding like this is extremely dangerous. In, re in regards to Mr. Burns' comments, I just want to note that the condos that Mr. Burns referenced earlier today that were approved by this board in the past, they replaced an existing single family home on F Street. They were not built in a backyard. And what this project proposes is to build a home in a, is to build a multifamily home in a small backyard. Um, this project has also ignored article, even though this project includes building an additional uh, home in a backyard, it has completely ignored Article 14, which um, governs the building of additional dwelling units. I think ignoring Article 14 in this case is very dangerous and that it would put our community at risk. Um, I also want to clarify in regards to the board's question regarding what's in the lot now. There is green space in the lot now. There are five mature trees. There used to be grass that the current owner has destroyed to build a parking lot, but there is still green space left that the residents here greatly appreciate and we pay to see it destroyed. Uh, my final comment is that there is no proof of hardship here, which would justify approval to this project and will provide absolutely no benefit to the community. The plan for these, these units is to be sold for profit at the highest price possible. The developer will benefit financially and it will be at everyone else's expense. Uh, thank you for your time and I hope you will deny this appeal with prejudice. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, ES, this is, yeah. Kristen? Hi everyone, uh, Kristen Foley. I am a direct butter at 685 East 8th Street, which is directly behind the project at 17 Barrett Ave. Um, I am asking you to reject this project given the current violations. The size and scale of this project does not fit in this space and would significantly impact the quality of life of the community. I also wanted to note uh, for the board's knowledge that the proponent is currently citing a 9.7 foot rear setback, but they are including a deeded four foot easement that runs behind the buildings on East A Street, making it only a 5.7 foot rear setback compared to the required 20. This has been raised to the proponent who has yet to address the discrepancy. Um, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. And I hope you consider our concerns when making your decision. Thank you. Luann? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, great. I'm not going to um, go over what the direct butters um, have just said. I want to look at this from a different uh, perspective. And I want to bring up that uh, those parcels in the backyard that he's trying to put together, um, Barrett Ave does not extend to his property, number one. And you can see that through the city of Boston maps. So that's number one. Number two, I question, does the city have the right to actually extend Barrett Ave, because what the proponent would then be doing is opening up his backyard 
to extend that or have. So now he's making it private, but then he's going to put it back to put the three parking spots in there. So I don't think you can have it both ways. Um, so I, I know private ways are very tricky. Um, they're governed under the easement law um, of the Code of Massachusetts. And I don't think that what he is proposing and asking the city to do to extend Barrett Ave um, is legal. The, there are 10 abutters on to Barrett Ave, and as far as I know, nine of them are against this. But the one that may support it is uh, one of the support letters, uh, which is the developer of 17 Barrett Ave. So it's a very tricky slope. We don't want to be building in backyards, and we don't want to be flipping um, private ways into public parking. So, and that's across the city of Boston, as well as on Barrett Ave. Uh, the zoning violations stand for themselves. We will have a wall three feet from five Shepton Terrace if this gets supported. It will kill our sunlight, it will kill our gardens. If you look at Shepton Terrace, it's a walk up off of East State Street. And in the back, there's five houses and we all have beautiful gardens and that's our outdoor space. So it's kind of our little bit of heaven here. So we're right. asking that you reject this. Thank you, ma'am. How many raised hands do we have? We just have one more, Carrie. Okay, let's take that last one. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Carrie Austin. I'm at 217 M Street. Uh, we've consulted a water resource engineer who works with public and private entities to ensure residents aren't negatively impacted by the bus. I'm sorry, are you, are you speaking in support or opposition? Opposition. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Based on our review of the plans, the lot will be 100% permeable, the 80% inefficient. The stage will have serious impact on our dwelling and other surrounding houses. We utilize 100% of our unit's basement. It contains a bedroom, a full bath, an office, a laundry, and two storage closets, all fully furnished. It also houses the common area for the other two units in the building, so all our mechanicals would be impacted by flooding. Our building elevation is at least 10% below grade of the proposed development. And we have heard nothing about uh, water mitigation. Any damage to our property from unmitigated runoff is a huge liability for the property producing the runoff, as well as the un engineer that might approve or stamp the plan. And it's a liability for the zoning board. We need to know what the water mitigation plan is. How's the board going to guarantee that the developers do not take shortcuts, which is a common practice with the mitigation plan? I think it's well known fact that the intensity is wrap up, ma'am. And I'd like to know how we're um, getting ready for this increase. In Thank rate. you. Thank you. Are there any other raised hands? We'll take one more. Yeah, um, Ed Austin. Uh, yes, uh, um, also on the butter, I wanted to just um, um, put in our thoughts on um, the uh, loss of the uh, shade trees, which, which are some of the uh, few few big trees that are right in the, the very local neighborhood there. Um, I think this would be a big loss to the uh, neighborhood as well. Um, and we'd like to have you um, um, so, uh, support our cause to uh, uh, not approve this, this property to go forward. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. There seems to be one more raised hand. We'll take that last one. Ms. Thomas, if you see it. Okay, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Uh, hi, Madam Chair and the board. I just wanted to add one comment to clarify from some initial comments that were made by the developer. So they mentioned the parking lot. The parking lot is an illegal parking lot, which we've reported to ISD on multiple occasions. The most recent resulted in the owner being served, which is why they finally, he mentioned as of a couple days ago, not a parking lot, because they finally stopped using it for parking because now they're trying to push their agenda with this development. Um, the other piece that is important to point out is that 
sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, excuse me. In terms of the documents that I previously submitted to the board, where they're talking about this continually as being a, a parking lot, it's only been a parking lot for several years. Recently, prior to that, it was advertised by the owner as a backyard space, and I also submitted multiple photos to the board showing that backyard space documented from 2013 to 20. So this is not a long-term thing. This is a, you know, a quick attempt by the owner to try to develop what is actually a backyard uh, and has been used as an illegal parking lot, which just substantiates, you know, wh what kind of uh, thank, thank you. Good, you know. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, any any response from the applicant before we make a motion? Yeah, I just I want to draw a very clear delineation between myself as a proponent and the current owner of the property. Uh, we are not one and the same. We are under contract to purchase the property from the current operator. Um, we've been a proponent for shutting down the parking lot for the entire time that we've been under contract and going through this process. And um, other than that, I just humbly submit to the discretion of this board and I don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, any last questions from the board? Madam Chair, can you read uh, VPDA's recommendation? I don't, hold on. Or if Ms. Mr. Hampton is here, do you want to read it yourself? Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just the of the Anthony PPA. Uh, we went on record as approval with the with this. Uh, our only file of four will be no building code. Okay. So, so I would. Um, right. I'm, right. I'm just going to put some observation for my colleagues and then. If it's okay, I'll put forward a motion. So um, there are three property um, for the app of the applicant, and zoning the three properties are zoned as multifamily residents. Um, the minimum lot is two thousand. Uh, the the lot where they're proposing parking it's approximately one thousand square feet, and then the two other lots are about seven hundred fifty square feet. So if you were to combine them, it would meet the minimum of the 2,000 square foot lot to build multifamily residence with a height of 40 feet. Um, looking now on, at the Google Earth, um, it would make sense if there was no parking um, in the space. Therefore, emergency vehicles can access all the way to the end of the proposal. And I would have made a recommendation that the proposal follows a very similar typology to the buildings that exist on the site next to it, which is similar townhouses. With that, I would like to put forward a motion of denial without prejudice. Second. <laughs> Mr. Stembridge. Yeah. Ms. Barraza. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Ms. Valencia. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Oh, you're get it. Wrong day, sorry. Yes. Mr. Cato. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair also votes yes. The motion carries. Next, we'll move on to case BOA 1761767. The address of 556 East Broadway is Mr. LaCoste or another representative. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark LaCoste, LaCoste Law, 75 Arlington Street in Boston, attorney for Nick Schiffer and Megan Schiffer and their family, who are the owners of 556 East Broadway and their proposal to create a little more living space for their four children and themselves because they want to stay in this house forever. We could stop right there in the, the picture of the front of the house. Um, so this is on East Broadway at the crest of the hill. They currently own the building and have lived here for some time. They occupy the top two floors and then the lower floor here seen at street level is a separate unit. And then much like in the south end, you see there's like some windows there below the sidewalk level. There's another unit down there. Um, because of the slope of the property um, down to H Street Place behind it, 
in the back of the building, it's it's a much you know different walkout condition for the lower level unit. Um, but the shippers are proposing a addition on the top of the building, set back from the street front, so you don't see it Whoa. when you're on East Broadway. Well, sorry, sorry, my door swung open in the rain. So. Oh yes, it's, suddenly there's a storm outside. Yeah. Um, and the proposal is to add 616 square feet to to the top. Um, if you could go to slides 9, 10, 11, 9, 9, 10, 11, we'll cut to the chase here. So these are elevations, existing elevations. On the left is the front of the building, the three stories as it reads on East Broadway. In the back of the building, um, the two red squares represent the Schiffer's current residence. The square that looks like a cinder block box is actually um, an existing addition that was added at some point. You can see it on the upper right hand picture there. It's not very attractive, but it provides an additional bedroom <coughs> for the unit on that level. And part of the proposal to gut renovate and substantially improve this property is to make that box look much better, which has drawn much support from the neighbors behind us who look at that thing. Um, and then there's some parking spaces underneath it. Next slide, please. So this is just an existing section of the building as it currently exists. The top two floors are the Schiffer unit. The next two floors are each of the two dwelling units. And the lowest level basement space is just storage and other non-living spaces. Next slide. So the proposal there is at the top, 616 square feet, um, set back from the front so that if you were standing on East Broadway across the street, little person there looking up across the street, um, those are the sight lines. So you can see that it's, it's, we're making it as minimally visible as possible. Uh, although this is not a historic district per se, um, there are a lot of beautiful historic homes on East Broadway and uh, Nick Schiffer's actually in the business of building and they wanted to do this as carefully and sensi sensitively as possible um, so that it's set back there to create just some additional living space. So as uh, completed, if this is approved, it would be the top three floors would be the Schiffer residence. Uh, the red circle on the left hand side represents an existing deck on top of that box that like, extends in the rear yard. So that would be their outdoor space. And then the next two levels are each of the, the smaller uh, apartments with the lower level storage office, and that would be controlled by the shippers. Uh, next slide. Or let's jump ahead to the last slide, 15, um, which shows the rear elevation. Uh, one of the other aspects of this proposal that the shippers are, are doing is to remove the masonry on the existing two levels and then make the uh, top level all glass in the back because from this perch location on East Broadway, the views of the seaport and the financial district are just unparalleled and spectacular. So they're going to make this sort of a glass curtain wall at rear to really pick up light and the, and the city views in the back with their outdoor space on top of that existing box. Um, and with that, uh, I'll say that the um, FAR is being increased by approximately 15% from the existing 3.3 to 3.8. Um, the, with the addition, the height is 41.6 in a sub-district that is 35, although that's probably an error because most of South Boston is 40, but when they rezoned the East Broadway stretch, it remained 35 in the table. Um, the other items cited in the zoning code refusal letter of insufficient side yard and insufficient rear yard are existing conditions that are not being exacerbated um, by this proposal. And then finally, Article 68-29, um, as discussed in the prior case, it's a conditional use anytime you put an addition on top of an existing building in South Boston. So we would seek a conditional use permit for that condition and the other dimensional variances as well. Um, and with that, I will conclude my presentation. We also have the Schiffers uh, online and Vincent Apple, our architect, um, if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Le Le any questions from the board? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna open it to public testimony. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS hosted a butters meeting for 555 East Broadway on April 24th, 2023. Three butters attended the meeting. Everyone expressed their support for the project. ONS is unaware of any concerns. At this time, we'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you very much. Good, after, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Anna Calderon from Council President Phoenix Office. The councilor would like to go on record in support based on a good community process as well as feedback from neighbors on the gate of Heaven Neighborhood Association of note. He also supports this proposal as the second floor deck is out here and X16 deck. Council President Flynn respectfully requests that the proponent continue to work closely with the neighbors and civic group on any quality of life issues during the construction phase. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Solomon, City Council at Large, Michael Flaherty, acknowledging the new off that went into drafting Article 68, that our project do have merit. Uh, this being one of them, the councilor uh, was impressed with the proposal and would like to go on um, record in support. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Yep, I have no reason. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Uh, with that, may I have a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve with BPTA design review. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Bonato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next, we have case BOA 1468765, address 251 to 255 West Third Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present? Madam Chair, members of the board, John Moran, Alpine Advisory Services, with the mailing address of 130 Beach Road, Orleans, Mass. Madam Chair, I would like to go through the violations and the architect is available to go through the plans. Uh, we are cited for, again, the roof structure restriction. The proposed roof deck and head house uh, create the need for a conditional use permit and also under section eight, a variance, the height of code restriction of 40 feet what is being proposed is 48.7 feet. Uh, we are suggesting a headhouse to be in compliance with the state building code rather than a hatch. Uh, also, it's important to note that West 3rd Street and E Street, the modality is zero. Neither street has a setback. We are cited under section 34 a special provision for setback requirements on a corner lot. I would respectfully suggest that the code requires that there be existing minimum front yard setbacks. In this case, there is no minimum setback where the modality is zero. FAR, the code is two. We are proposing 2.3 seeking relief. Uh, we decided for insufficient lot area, the code provides for 2,000 square feet. The combined lots are 2,732 square feet. Uh, however, under the code, under Section 8, each additional unit above the first requires 1,000 square feet. So we would need 4,000 square feet. What is being proposed is 2,000. 732 square feet. We decided for a front yard setback, suggest that that is not a violation because of the modality of uh, West Third Street. Also on East Street, where the property abuts a street, a uh, corner lot, the front rather than the side yard requirements are called into play. The side yard setback adjacent to 257 is compliant and will be heavily landscaped. And there is no violation with the setback on E Street since the modality is zero. 
uh, and respectfully suggest that there is no violation. The proposed roof decks are needed to meet the open space requirement of 2,000 square feet of readily accessible open space per unit. Uh, two decks would be two, 239 square feet, and one deck would be 205 square feet. The townhouses would have three bedrooms. The size of the units would be, two of them would be 2,092 square feet, and one would be 2,078 square feet. Uh, what we are doing is proposing a three unit, four story dwelling with garage parking, uh, with individual roof decks. The lot was, the combined lot was, was the result of demolishing a single family uh, property on E Street and combining it with a comma vacant lot at E and West Third Street. Uh, as shown on the plans files. Uh, if the board has questions, I would ask the architect to go through the plans or we would be willing to, to respond to any questions that the board may have. Um, I have a quick question. Um, there appear to be mature trees on the site right now. What would be the, what would be the plan for that? We would remove the, the trees, but what we're proposing to do is to do some planting uh, with the park department's approval on the way. And between the uh, proposed dwelling and 257, we would put a screening of trees uh, to beautify the property. Okay. Other questions before they keep going? Uh, through the chair. Uh, on the open space, on the open lot, building on that corner, does that like leave any type of blind spot for cars or pedestrians crossing that might not see in between East Street and West Third Street? The the code on the corner lot uh, provides a qualification, and if I may read it under. Uh, so the special provisions for corner lots, if a lot of butts more than one street, the requirement for, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong, with a traffic visibility corner lot, wherever a minimum front lot is required, in this case, there is no minimum front lot required. Uh, that section of the applicability of the traffic visibility con uh, design requirements do not apply. It is as blind as most of the intersections in South Boston. It is, I would suggest it, it's not a unique condition. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Did you, did the proponent want to continue? Yes, we had a, a site meeting that was very positive uh, by immediate abutters and there are letters of support submitted, five letters of support in, in relationship to approval of the necessary conditional use permit and variances. If you would like, I can go through the project. I would ask them. I assume the architect, Zach, are you on? Or did I lose him? No, I'm here, I'm here. If you would go through the, the project, please. Sure. Uh, we can go to the first floor plan. Scroll. Okay, so actually if you go up another page, yes, yeah, so we'll start here. So uh, each of these three units here off of E Street will have access um, into their own private garages. There'll be pedestrian access off of West Third Street. Each unit will have its own entrance recessed in off of that street. Um, common utilities for the building uh, will be in the back. Attic, like trash storage will be um, inside each unit. Um, again, like John said, I'll reiterate uh, between the properties, there'll be a heavy landscape uh, buffer between the two. Um, and you can go to the next floor. Uh, next floor, all the units are the same layout uh, kitchen, dining, living, bathroom. Um, nothing out of the ordinary here. Go down, next floor. Uh, so the primary bedroom floor, so the primary bedroom, closets, bathroom, study slash nursery. 
And then as we move up to the third floor, there'll be two secondary um, bedrooms on the third floor with a shared bathroom. Um, and then as we make our way to the roof deck, there'll be proposed headhouse access to each roof deck. Are you open to having roof hatch access to the roof because currently you're on the the zoning is 40 feet high and um you have 40 i think it's yes like with the penthouse but the penthouse is bringing you all the way to 48 point so yeah and the ownership yeah, yeah 48.7 a quarter to the yeah. to the head house yeah, so they're open to reducing the height house into okay. a they are uh, great. Thank you. Can we hear from Mr. Hampton on the BPDA recommendation? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and support of the BPDA. We recommend the denial of our prejudice. We'd like to see the mature uh, trees remain. Uh, that's a big thing playing uh, right now. So we're not in favor of the three kind of houses up there. Um, like I don't know if it's solid into one and access to my patch. So that's our recommendation. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Let's open it up to public testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Anna White with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. ONS hosted the voters meeting for 251 through 255 West 3rd Street on June 1st, 2023. Around 10 of voters attended. The proponents answered all the questions raised. The voters were really happy with how the proposal looked, but some concerns were raised about roof decks, the head house, and obstructed views. ONS has received three letters in support and one letter in opposition. At this time, I'd like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Official, members of the board, and a call from Council President Flink's office. The councilor would like to go on record in opposition based on feedback from neighbors and the St. Vincent's Lower End Neighborhood Association. Residents have called attention to the roof deck, concerns about a wet bar and existing quality of life issues. The developer has shown an unwillingness to compromise and remove the roof decks for the neighbors, and as a result, Council President Flynn remains opposed to, to his long standing policy against roof decks in the residential neighborhoods of South Boston. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Paul Sullivan, the City Council at large, Michael Flaherty. Uh, Council would like to go on record in opposition uh, due to the Article 68 violations listed uh, in their refusal letter. Um, as well as um, the butter's concerns regarding the roof decks. Thank you. Any other raised hands? I see no additional raised hands. Actually, I've raised, I've raised my hand um, in a I different I was going to come back to you. <laughs> Do you want to address some of those points? No, I'm sorry. I'm raising my hand in capacity as an abutter. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Mark. Um, uh, okay. Mark Lacasse, um, I reside at 250 West 3rd Street, which is a five unit condominium building diagonally across the street. And I am also the trustee of the five unit condo association. Um, all of my fellow unit owners and myself attended the abutter meeting and expressed our support for the project, um, noting the um, desire to convert the head houses to hatches for roof deck access, which I can say as a resident on the fourth floor of a four story building on this stretch of West Third, who has a roof deck, there are dozens and dozens of roof decks in the neighborhood um, that provide delightful outdoor space for those of us who are fortunate enough to have them. And um, access by hatch seems to be the solution as there are many, many such examples in the neighborhood. Um, we're also blessed with uh, very mature street trees between E and F Street on West 3rd. So there's a magnificent existing tree canopy that runs the length of the street um, from the existing city street trees. Um, so with that, I express my support. And on behalf of uh, fellow unit owners at 246-250 West 3rd Street, we also express our support. Thank you. OK. OK, I have no additional raised hands. OK, well, does Mr. LaCasse or anybody else want to address the 
BPDA response before we take a vote? Well, it wouldn't be Mr. Lacasse because he was in a butter. Yeah, that's true. Oh, good I, point. I have, I have <laughs> yeah, that's confusing. Good point. Have, Sorry, it's still around. His comments during the site meeting and more importantly tonight, uh, this afternoon, seems like it's tonight. Uh, yeah. The, as I would echo uh, Mark's comments, there are mature street canopies on the public way. The corner lot had been an eyesore, as noted by, I believe, one of the uh, letters filed in support. Uh, it does have a tree, uh, but I think overall, uh, providing, removing a single family home that suffered from a politely deferred maintenance in a corner lot that was, uh, uh, was not presentable to the community that providing three additional units, condominium units, which will be sold, not rented, uh, is an overall positive addition to the community. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with two proviso. One is that the project undergoes BPDA design review for the exterior and um, for the size of the roof deck. And then the second proviso is to provide access to the roof through a roof hatch. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Stembridge. Yeah. Ms. Betterbazo. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Panado. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA 144-9394. The address is 99 Blackstone Street. Applicant and with their representative. Can you raise your hand? If, can you raise your hand if you're on for this proposal? Oh, okay, I see that, Jason. Uh, I'm sending a request to make you um, a panelist. Uh, once you accept the pe panelist designation, can you unmute yourself, please? Good afternoon. I am Jason Perillo with Sterling Signs here today for uh, to allow uh, Gordon Ramsay Berger a second wall sign on the Hanover Street side of the building. Um, this sign um, is an internally illuminated sign that is tastefully designed. It is subtly illuminated so that only the lettering and the red section on the logo illuminates. The, the black is just an aluminum background. Uh, the hardship of this sign really comes down to visibility. Um, the, this, the restaurant was allowed um, a wall sign over the entrance on the uh, surface road and also a blade sign. But for the other two sides of the building, there is no signage. And because they are going to rely a lot on pedestrian uh, traffic and also vehicular traffic on the surface roads, a sign on Hanover Street would be really important uh, to identify uh, the restaurant. Um, we met with the Wharf District Council. Um, they are the closest jurisdiction for this uh, location. Uh, originally, we brought this sign to them, this 40-inch high sign that's 57.77 square feet. They felt that it was too large. So we reduced the sign down to um, a 33.33 square foot sign that is only 25 uh, inches, or sorry, 33 inches high. Um, and in order to meet their concerns about size, unfortunately, they still felt it was too large. Um, so we're here just to ask uh, for this second wall sign in order to give the uh, restaurant some sufficient visibility, which will be critical to their uh, success. 
But just, sorry, I'm, I might have missed this. What's the size of the other sign that you said is on the surface? Yeah, the, 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 sign, the, the signs that, that are over the entrance are is smaller. Um, I can get you that size. Hold on one second. Um, And then what's on the rendering, is that scale to the 33 inches, the smaller dimension? The, what's on, I can share my screen with the, the, size, no. the smaller size. No, no, what so we're seeing right now, is that the 40 inch? Yes, what you're okay. seeing right now is what we Thank originally you. proposed. And then like I said, we shrank it down right. to a 32 inch high by uh, 12 foot six inch sign, which is 33.33 square feet, where the, the proposed was 57. And sorry, did you have the dimensions of the current sign? Um, I'm going to have to look those up. Sorry. Um, okay. Are there other questions from the board? Okay. Does BPDA, does Jeff want to weigh in? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Jeff Hampton, BPDA. Uh, this is something that probably never should have gone to the Board of Appeal. Uh, this is governed by the development plan for PDA number 103, uh, which I can see outside my window. Um, and the operating procedures for any plans that need to be changed or any signage or any question about what is in the development plan, uh, ISD sends it to us for a letter of consistency. And what we do in situations like this is take in the plans, review them with, uh, review the proposal, and then we actually have a stamp that says that these plans are consistent. There is language within the PDA itself that all signs should be reviewed through the BPDA. They already have their zoning relief. It's just something that uh, we need to do design review on. So it's really strange how we're going to handle this. I just ask that we defer it and that. What about we do a motion approval with BPDA design review or the size of the graphic? I mean, we, we can do that. Something similar happened on Thursday night where there was something that should not have gone to the board, which was already allowed by the development plan. So it's just an extra step that didn't need to be taken because we already have procedures in place and a process in place for something like this to happen. If you want to do that, that's fine. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. It's just the last two hearings we've had issues where I think the appellant uh, has gone through a step that didn't need to be taken. Okay. I have um, information about the signs that were allowed by right if you need them. Okay. Yeah, the, so, so the signs that, that were allowed by right um, was a sign just over the entrance on the facing the surface road that's 20 inches by 120 inches. And then they were also allowed a uh, blade sign that sticks out on that same side that's 27 inches high by uh, 50 inches wide. That's, all right. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, let's go with public testimony. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, call on anyone with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Uh, at this time, the Mayor's Office just deferred to the judgment of this board. Uh, some back information in the community process. Um, we originally had an abutters meeting uh, for the proposal when the restaurant was planning on opening and uh, had them connect with the local civic association when they came back with the proposal regarding the signage, uh, as you heard from the, uh, the proponent. Um, most recently, I believe, um, the Wharf District Council voted to oppose uh, and send a letter in on June 9th uh, due to concerns about the size of the proposed sign. Um, I believe the board should have a record of that. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a raised hand, Damien? Are you looking at your testimony here? Uh, hi, yes. Damon Irby, 25 Solitaire Drive in Groton. Um, we uh, work with Gordon Ramsay North America Development Team, and, and uh, as far as this restaurant goes, it's really uh, difficult to see the restaurant from really, unless you're standing directly in front of it because of all of the trees on the, uh, on the uh, Rose Kennedy Parkway, and, and the sign that's above the door is recessed just above the revolving door that you can't even see it unless you're standing on the sidewalk in front of it. 
um, and there's a three-sided building, so they really, you know, respectfully request approval just to have something visible coming down the parkway and also from Hanover Street, and they don't have anything on the Blackstone Street elevation, which you can see from, um, from like coming up from Faneuil Hall. So the, the visibility is really not all that great here, and we did uh, make the sign smaller and uh you know the 32 inches that that canopy is i believe 50 or 52 inches tall and then uh you know the the second sign that we uh, showed to the uh neighborhood association was 32 inches tall by i believe 10 feet long which is small but i think it would really help with traffic and and having the public see uh identify the business and the restaurant prior to being right in front of it uh coming from different directions even if you're looking at it from the north end you can't even see the building so it's just uh it would be, be nice to have additional signage on that one elevation thank you thank you appreciate it and no additional raised hands for that may i have a motion Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval with um, a proviso that the project undergoes BPDA design review, uh, paying a special attention to the size of the exterior sign. May I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stumbridge? Yes. Ms. Bedabraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panato? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, almost there. Next, we have a reconsideration here for case BOA 142-1808. The address being one Mount Vernon. Is the applicant and with the representative present? Now, Paul, Paul, is that you? Let me just make you a panelist for a second. And once you become a panelist, you're going to mute yourself. No, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I've been here since one, so I appreciate how long the meeting has been for the board, and I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, this um, uh, request uh, was before the board. Um, uh, as you see from the reconsideration letter um, in, in May, and the board voted four to three in favor of the request of relief. Obviously, um, it needed five votes. And um, um, I conferred with Mr. Hampton afterwards. Apparently, there was some confusion about um, the ISD refusal letter because it referred to what was being proposed as a recreation cannabis establishment when this is solely a delivery operation. Um, and uh, the neighborhood is completely in support of it. Um, the impacts to the neighborhood are virtually you know, non-existent. The, the structure itself is currently a non-conforming food delivery service. We're, we're, we, we appreciate that if we were starting from scratch, this delivery service would be forbidden uh, in this district, but, it's, but we have a non-conforming delivery business that we're asking to continue as a non-conforming uh, delivery. Uh, we will need relief uh, because uh, we have uh, establishments within the proximity of one another when this is reconsidered for, for, the, for the board to take up. Uh, but as you can see in the record, we got a new ISD refusal letter, which makes it crystal clear that this is a delivery only operation, fully supported by the neighborhood, the residents, the property owner has looked at trying to uh, develop the property for multifamily use, which would be an allowed use, besides getting enormous neighborhood opposition. Um, the number of units that would be required to make it economically feasible would make this project really not fit on this particular street. So there's, an, uh, there's, a, there's a building there that would be perfect for this particular use with very benign impacts to the neighborhood that the neighborhood completely supports. There was confusion about uh, a, a cannabis establishment and, and I think concern about a retail establishment, which this is not. And so we would ask the board to vote in favor of reconsideration so we can come back and, and repeat.
presented um, with a correct, with a more accurate and correct refusal letter, and, and hopefully um, uh, would be in a position to get that last vote that we need uh, so that we can move forward. Uh, as, our, as our reconsideration letter indicates, um, the applicant is a, um, uh, both a, um, uh, an economic empowerment applicant under the state regulations for, the, for this kind of business, and it's also a city of Boston, Boston social equity applicant. Uh, Erica Kennedy, she presented to the board in May. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't remember, but uh, she would be available to present. We also have her, Erica, and, uh, and Joseph Rubin, the principal of DB Delivery, available if the board has any questions. Um, so we think there was a fair amount of confusion at May 9th because of the refusal letter. We cleared that confusion up. This is a fully supported project. No one is opposed to it. Benign impact on the neighborhood um, and, and really a perfect location because all of the parking of any delivery vehicles would take place inside the building. There would be no off street parking required for this delivery business. It would be totally contained on site. And it's just unique to be able to find a location like this that can accommodate, can that can accommodate this business so well, but considering that it was a food delivery business um, 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 uh, before, before this request. So with that, I'll leave it at that. I know it's been a long day, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, just a quick, uh, Mr. Hampton, do you want to weigh in? Because uh, I'm not, I don't think I was confused when I heard it the first time. I think I recall it being distribution, but you know, may, maybe there was some confusion, so. I, I think that, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Jeff Hampton, BPDA. I think there was a little bit of confusion, um, only because, uh, like Paul had said, they were doing delivery only, but when you looked at the application, the actual advertisement description on the agenda, it didn't mention that at all. It just says that it was gonna be a retail cannabis establishment. Now, that being said, I, I mean, it's up to the board whether or not it wants to be reconsidered. The BPDA weighed in on this case. Our recommendation is not going to change um, on this. We recommended denial the first time, um, and we're gonna stand by that recommendation. So. Um, even if there was only uh, delivery there because it's a cannabis establishment in a residential zoning district. I know the building's not conforming, but that doesn't change the zoning of the property. Um, so it's obviously up to the board on how they want to weigh in on this, uh, but our recommendation is going to remain the same. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions from the board? What's, what, what's within a half a mile? What, what's the existing cannabis use within a half a mile? It's a, it's a retail use within a half a mile. So that, and, 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 and so that is an, you know, that's an important distinction that this delivery use and the retail use are completely different forms of, of uh, uh, marijuana establishment. And so um, when we, we think that we're gonna be able to make the showing uh, to the board that, uh, that they're completely independent uh, uses. Um, and, and just in response to Mr. Hampton, who's been very helpful in, in, in terms of um, uh, explaining to us his position, the use is not um, required, we do not require a variance, we require a conditional use permit to change one non-conforming use to another. And that's the reason why I made the point, because I am sensitive to the BBDA's position here, that look, it's a forbidden use, we don't want to allow uh, an as of right use, uh, I, uh, you know, a forbidden use uh, in the zoning district, but we already have a non-conforming delivery use. And so we're not impacting so, it in any way. And I can quickly, in two seconds, go through section 6.3 of the zoning code where the board, in, in, in considering a conditional use permit for change of a non conforming use, it asks, is it more objectionable? It's, it's not been able to clearly said that. Will there be any adverse effects? There won't be. There'll be no uh, uh, off site in, uh, parking. We gave a traffic study the last time. Any serious hazard to vehicles or pedestrians? No. Is there a nuisance? No. Is the facility adequate? It's it's perfectly situated for this kind of re reuse. So, uh, 
I, I, answer the question. I think Ms. Panada was asking what's in proximity. Uh, any, yeah, any where, where is it? Yeah. It's Clapp on Clapp Street, Ms. Right. Panada. It's on yeah, Clapp Street. Street. Right down the street, right? It's like literally yeah. a block or two, um, yeah, like a block or two away, correct? Yeah. Right. And there's no, no plans for any kind of beautification of that existing building? Um, I, we, 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 I know there was a mural that was, we were going to um, interact with the community um, in connection with putting together a mural uh, to beautify the building. Uh, okay. and this was just a sample rendering, but that is something that uh, that that the applicant is is is, is considering. And, and and again, the delivery business is is not is not servicing this particular neighborhood. Um, that's what the recreational retail establishment is doing. The delivery business is, has a little broader. Uh, yeah. Okay. Broader. Thank you. Okay. Other questions from the board? Hearing none, can I have public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time, the Mayor's Office like to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, as we previously testified when this applicant was before the board, uh, we hosted a community meeting. Um, there were some concerns from some abutters regarding uh, the amount of traffic and maybe potential antisocial behavior that might come to the street um, if this site moved in. Other abutters spoke in support of this uh, proposal, uh, citing as an opportunity to add a new business to the area. Um, they also, the applicant went on to meet with the um, McCormick Civic Association, which voted to support this proposal. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Madam I have no raised hands. Okay. And Mr. Stembridge, do you have those letters? I, I don't know if I'm missing them from our emails. Um, do you have letters of support or opposition? Well, Madam Chair, this is a reconsideration. Um, most likely, probably, just to be heard, to re reconsider a new hearing, probably okay. has not been advertised to get new testimony from a butter or anyone else. Okay, well, I'm asking because he's talking about support, and I don't, I, you know. That, can, that I, can, can I remember the May 9th? I'm not sure. So I, I don't recall there being any at that time. So I'm just trying to. Yeah, there, there definitely was. I can give you the names of the people in support, but we will present that again, obviously. When uh, we, we do have at least four letters of support, uh, okay. and, and more afterwards, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, with that, uh, may, may I have a motion? And this is just a motion to reconsider, not to support or not support at this time. We have one more thing after this, so I need a motion. Um, I'd like to put forward a motion to deny. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, is there another motion? Motion to reconsider. Motion to reconsider. Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Better Barraza? No. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Are you on, Mr. Valencia? Yes. Yes, you're on, or yes, you're not? I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Panato? I, I vote no. Mr. Collins? Yes. The chair also votes no. The motion does not carry. Then uh, it would be denied, Madam Chair. Okay. Next. Uh, that is the last. Okay. Reconsider that. There's all the hearings. No. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, sorry. No. Open open meeting. Open meeting law. Okay. Uh, the board has received an open meeting law complaint regarding three related zoning appeals for the project at 1, 2, and 3 4th Street that was heard on July 11th, 2023. The open meeting law requires the chair to disseminate the complaint to members of the board. The open meeting law also requires that the board meet and discuss the complaint in an open session within 14 business days. 
After, after review, the board must respond to the complaint in writing and send a copy to the complainant and the attorney general's office. The board may delegate this responsibility to its counsel, but only after it has met to review the complaint. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion? Well, are we gonna, don't we have to discuss the complaint publicly before a motion is put forward? You can, I, uh, sorry, this is Javier, I did for you. The yep, so my, my, only, my, my only recommendation is um, to limit accidents of muting. Um, I'm just suggesting that we can request that director butters to raise their hands following the testimonies from public officials that we're be that we would be very clear um, to let our ambassador know direct abutters that are being impacted by a project to be heard first um, and then in terms of time we can always suggest let's just hear from three abutters or let's hear from uh, in, in opposition or let's hear from three in support uh, that way we can minimize accidents um, uh, of people feeling like they were muted I, I don't well I don't know Javier do you do you want to speak to this I mean it's just an open discussion based on what was presented to us so I think if no one else wants to comment then we can put forward a motion yeah, I, I think that it would be helpful if we could use the chat more. I realize some people are on their phones and it's harder to use the chat, but if we could try to use the chat function to identify abutters and those in support and opposition so we can try to hear from folks on all sides of the issue. So, I'm sorry, it's Jessica. Can I just say that if we do do that, we may want to think about adding another ambassador because um, sometimes looking at the chat, trying to elevate folks, trying to check emails and send people information can be, um, I mean, we could chat offline about it, but just think it, it can be tricky trying to navigate a couple of different things and then also look at the chat. But I'd be happy to do, you know, defer whatever works best. Mm -hmm. I think those are all fair points, uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, along with the fact that uh, it's really difficult to determine who's in a butter or who's not. Uh, as, as you know, although we ask for those most impacted, uh, we get folks from all across the city who raise their hands, and so that, that's the nature of, of the... So is there any okay. way to get proof of residency from, you know, people that are, that are voicing their opinions in them? Because, I mean, it could just be friends and family from, you know, three, four miles away that are voicing their opinions and taking up a bunch of time and pulling away from you know, the actual budget. I would strongly encourage folks, if you all have your emails, to also read those comments because some of them aren't, some of them are also on the hearing, but some of them cannot make the hearing. And so there are people who make the effort to put in, put in comments in writing. Comments are important. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We so see we, them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. Uh, so is there any other questions about this? If not, may I have a motion? I would, I would like to make a motion that we refer the complaint to ISD's counsel to, pre to prepare a written response on behalf of the board. May I have a second? Second. Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Ms. Bedebraza? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Panado? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. It also votes yes. The motion carries. All right. Good night. Madam Chair, I would like to I would like to also um, ask Javier. On um, the last time I was on the full board, I believe it was Tuesday, June twenty seventh. I asked Javier to put our administrative discussion on the agenda to discuss um, the duration and the amount of cases that the board should hear. And yeah. I just want to make it, I just want to also make a comment that after six hours of work, we, by law, we have to have a 30 minute um, rest. So- um, Recording can please, stopped. Can we please put this in the agenda to discuss? Yes. Those cases. 
Yeah, we can put that on the agenda next time. The reason why we didn't do it this time is you could tell there was a lot of things going on on this hearing. Um, unfortunately, that did pop up at the last last minute, essentially of last week, that are required to be on this hearing. As the open meeting law, as right, the call of the chair, those things were popping up ahead of it. Unfortunately, be on this, this scheduled hearing uh, and not a later one, right? Um, but we can put that on the agenda uh, for, I'm, I have the list, I can't remember the date, I'm sorry, for the next hearing date. Okay, I really no, appreciate it. I thought we were going to be looking for overtime soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, so let's